This is the free Google Shopping course by Key Commerce. In this course, you're going to learn everything you need to set up, optimize, and scale your Google Shopping campaigns for maximum profits. We're going to help you take your campaigns from this to this. Basically, let's turn Google Shopping into a sales generating machine for your e-commerce store. Here are the results we've achieved with the exact strategies you're going to learn in this free course. For this store here, we set up and optimized their Google Shopping campaign from scratch using the exact strategies you're learning in this course. Over a period of seven months, we grew their sales from zero to $62,000 per month, generating a total of $230,000 in sales so far. Here's another store that we scaled from scratch using the exact strategies you'll learn in this course. Zero dollars all the way up to 160k per month, generating over 300k in sales over four months at a very profitable ROAS. Here's an account that we took on when it had already been running Google Shopping campaigns for some time. It had all this existing data. We audited this account, applied our strategies, and took it from 115k per month to almost 8 800k per month in sales. This is an extreme level of growth at the top level, but it shows you the results that we can get when applying these simple strategies that you're going to learn in this course. I honestly wish I had this free course when I'd started with Google Shopping. It would have saved me a lot of time and wasted money. We've made this course easy to follow and understand even if you've never touched Google Shopping before. We'll show you exactly how we optimize shopping campaigns with real screen share videos where you can watch over our shoulder as we work on real accounts. You'll get access to the exact strategies and tactics that we've refined over years of scaling up Google Shopping campaigns for e-commerce stores. In this course, you're going to learn how Google Shopping works, the algorithm, and how to set it up without wasting time on unnecessary tasks or pulling your hair out. You'll learn how to make your website compliant to avoid getting suspended, which is the worst. You'll learn how to set up your product feed and Google Merchant Center account the right way. We'll walk you through setting up conversion tracking so you can track all the sales you're making in your Google Ads account. We'll then show you how to opt Optimize your campaigns to scale them up to make more and more profits every single month. We even give you a checklist and schedule for when to optimize your account and how to optimize your account. And to top it off, if your campaigns still aren't making money, we have a full section on troubleshooting your Google Shopping campaigns. You'll learn exactly what to do if you're not getting clicks, not getting sales, or if your campaigns are just not profitable. This course is jam-packed with bonuses. Below each lesson, we've added templates, checklists, and other downloads you can use to help optimize your campaigns. Under each video, we've also added a comment section. Here, you can ask us any question you like and we'll reply as soon as we can. Now, you may be asking, why is this free? What are you trying to sell me? Well, I'll be totally honest. We're a team of e-com experts that help stores scale from 20K to 500k plus per month, but we only work with stores that are already generating at least 20k per month, if not more. So we made this course to help you get there as quickly as possible. That's why it's jam packed with absolutely everything you need to set up and scale your Google Shopping campaigns. There's no upsell. There's no secret strategy left out. It's all here everything you need. This is hands down the best Google Shopping course on the web, better than any paid course out there. And if we help you get to 20K, 50K or 100K per month in sales from your Google Shopping campaigns, maybe you're going to run out of time to properly manage them. That's when you're welcome to get in touch with us and we can help you take it from there. So you can see it's in our best interest to help you as much as we possibly can. It's pure value. And if you do get value out of this, please share it with a friend. You can see that we've put so much time and energy into this free course to make it as good as it possibly can be for you guys. Ready to start learning? In this video, you're going to learn why you should run Google Shopping campaigns and what your store needs to have to make them most successful. The first reason to run Google Shopping campaigns is obviously the money. Properly run Google Shopping campaigns, which you're going to learn how to set up 
in these videos can deliver huge sales for your e-commerce store. Let me walk through some examples right now. For this first store here, we set up and optimized the Google Shopping campaigns using the exact strategies you're going to learn in this course. Over a period of seven months, we grew this campaign from zero to $62,000 in sales per month. So far, generating a total of $230,000 in sales. So how do we actually do this? We set up and optimized their product feed. We conducted manual bidding adjustments. We added negative keywords. We also further optimized their product feed over time while providing them feedback for improving their website to improve the conversion rate. This led to a huge amount of profits for this store and we created a sales generating machine. Here's another campaign that we scaled from scratch using the simple strategies in our videos. Zero dollars all the way up to 160K per month. Over a period of four months, generating over 300K in sales, all with a profitable ROAS. What would you do if you had the same for your e-commerce store? Now here's another store that we scaled up. We started with them when they'd already had their campaigns running for some time and collecting data, but they couldn't get past this mark of 100 to 150K per month in sales. So we got in, analyzed all the data, and in three months, scaled them to 800K per month, driven almost entirely by Google Shopping campaigns. This is an example of where a store can collect a lot of data over a period of time, and then we can come in with all the strategies from this course and 10 exit because of that valuable historic data. Here's a sheet that we use to track the financial performance of the stores that we work with. We have the metrics as columns and each row is a new month. We started working with this store right here. Within months, we had scaled it to 800K per month. Now, how could we do this? One, they were not optimizing their bids and they were paying far too much for the wrong clicks. Number two, they were generating irrelevant traffic because they hadn't added negative keywords. Number three, their product Product feed was not optimized. We fixed this up, which helped them target more relevant traffic for a cheaper cost per click. And four, they were focusing on the wrong products in their catalog. See how the average order value doubles when we start with them? They had some high ticket products in their catalog that had huge margins that were getting great results that they weren't focusing on. As we focused on these high profit products, we tripled their ROAS. We also 10X their net profit from 9K per month to 90K per month in net profits. This is pretty crazy, right? Now, don't worry if you don't understand everything that I've just said, because you're going to learn everything here in these videos. So let's keep going. The next reason we love running Google Shopping campaigns is that it's a great alternative to Facebook ads. So many of the stores we work with see great success because we use Google Shopping to drive high converting traffic straight through their store. This high converting traffic then seasons their Facebook pixel so they can run remarketing and lookalike audiences on Facebook ads. Instead of spending hundreds or thousands of dollars testing audiences on Facebook, we can skip this whole part by using the seasoned Facebook pixel after all the hard work on Google Shopping. This is why we recommend using Google and Facebook at the exact same time because they both help each other and generate better results overall. Plus, if your Facebook ad account gets banned, we can still keep running Google ads campaigns and generate revenue while you fix the Facebook issue. The next reason to run Google shopping campaigns is that they're extremely targeted. When set up and optimized properly, we're gonna show your products in front of people actually searching for your products. Our campaigns let us get right in front of our perfect customers, people that would otherwise never have found us. On top of this, Google Shopping is also very data driven. In my videos, you're going to learn exactly how we optimize these campaigns using data and analytics. We'll be analyzing performance, creating new strategies and making changes to keep moving the campaigns in the right direction. This means you don't need to have amazing creatives, imagery, and videos like you do with Facebook ads. You just need some time, the know-how, and the expertise to sit down and manage your campaigns. Finally, we love Google Shopping because we see a lot of consistency and scaling. When done right, we generally see consistent scaling and growth as we constantly make profit-driven optimizations. With the right approach, which you're going to learn in these videos, it just keeps growing over time. Now, I can't promise you it's always going to be up every single month, 
But over time, with these profit-driven optimizations, we see the compounding effect. This is why we find Google Shopping quite a reliable way to grow your e-commerce store compared to other forms of traffic. It's perfect for getting those sales, building up your customer base, building up your email list, seasoning your Facebook pixel. You may run into hiccups like a Google Merchant Center suspension, but it's generally consistent over time especially as you're optimizing it for the Google algorithm. This happens because we're leaning on Google's algorithm to show our products to more relevant people. We'll often find that Google shows us for more search queries and keywords that we never considered when setting up our campaigns. As we'll learn in the coming lessons, Google has a mountain of data on who our potential customers could be. And as we run our campaigns for longer and longer, they get better and better at showing them for the right people. If we can successfully guide the algorithm in the right direction, this can be incredibly profitable for our e-commerce store. And this is how we get results like these here. We're able to just keep growing their sales over time it's awesome. So now that we know why Google Shopping is so good for our e-commerce stores, how do we make sure we have the best chance at getting these results? In our videos, we're going to show you how to set up, optimize, and scale your Google Shopping ads. But here are some clear markers that we see that lead to much higher success. One, products with a clear buying intent. People are going to Google to search for exactly what they want. If your products are the type of products someone would go to Google to look for, you've got the makings of success with Google Shopping. An example of a great product would be stand-up paddle boards. You can imagine that people are going directly to Google to search for this sort of product. An example of a bad product would be this lamp here that looks like a soy sauce packet. Now, I'll admit it looks pretty cool and arty, but not many people are going to Google to search for a soy sauce lamp. The reason is they just have no idea a product like this could exist. This product would be better suited for Facebook ads or public relations campaigns. Number two, optimized and quality websites. You can have the best product in the world, but if it's not trustworthy and not optimized for sales, it's going to be very hard to sell on Google Shopping. You need to have a strong base of a website first. This means making it look professional, adding the right information, and really understanding your customers. Your store needs to really sell the products and show their value. You can't just have a description, a title, and the image. Focus on building a brand and website that looks 10x better than any competitors. This is important because it improves the conversion rate. We're going to learn more about this in these later videos, but the more traffic you can convert, the higher your return on ad spend. It's going to make it much easier to scale your campaigns and make more profits because we're making more sales from the same amount of clicks. Number three, competitive value proposition. Every time a potential customer looks at your product page, they're deciding if the price that you're charging for your product is lower than the perceived value that they get from purchasing it. This is how any purchase works in our reality. I'll leave a link below to some more resources so you can learn more about this concept. Basically, you need to demonstrate that the perceived value of your product is greater than the price that you're charging for the product and compared to competitors. Your potential customers will be looking at how you present your product with things like quality of the product, features and benefits, how it solves their problems, your reviews and testimonials, videos and content to demonstrate the product, the trustworthiness of the site and brand, and of course, the pricing of the product. If you're trying to sell a product for $1,000, but you have a competitor that's also on Google Shopping, selling the exact same product for $500, it's going to be very hard to make Google Shopping work. Number four, customer lifetime value and profit margin. Now there are many ways to define customer lifetime value. So here I'm just going to say that it's the amount of profit you generate per customer over the lifetime of their relationship with your store. Say you're selling on Google Shopping and it costs you $30 to convert a customer and you're selling a product for $100 with a gross margin of 40%, then you're going to make $10 on that first order. But if you can then remarket to that customer so they buy from you two, three, or even four times, you can see that suddenly you're making much more money, a total of $400 in revenue with a profit of $130. This is the power of repeat purchases and can turn your barely profitable shopping campaign into a money-making powerhouse. Stores that kill it with Google Shopping often have a long-term view. They're trying to make money on the front end, but they're also building a customer base that buys from them again 
and again. This is how you really win with e-commerce and how many stores scale very quickly with Google Shopping campaigns. Why? Because they know that over the next three to six months, they're going to make a lot of money from this customer that they're acquiring right now. This means they know that they can invest much more to acquire each new customer. With this mindset, we can come into Google Ads price out the competition because we know that we're going to make a lot of money over the long term. This is the sort of thinking that takes you from a beginner e-com store owner to a store owner that builds an e-commerce empire over years and years. So there you have it, the huge potential and effectiveness of Google Shopping, as well as what makes a winning store for Google Shopping campaigns. In this video, you're going to learn how Google Shopping works. By understanding how Google Shopping works, you're going to learn how to game the system and play it to your advantage. You'll understand why the optimizations we make improve your campaigns and make more profits. This is an edge that most people don't have. So when you run your campaigns next to your competition, we can win. So in this video, we're going to cover what is Google Shopping? The Google Auction, the Google Shopping Algorithm, and finally, the setup of Google Shopping. Firstly, what is Google Shopping? Here you have the Google search results. At the bottom, you have the regular search ads, also called text ads. At the top here, you have Google Shopping ads. Shopping ads show the name of the product, an image, the price, and sometimes even reviews as well. Once someone clicks a shopping ad, it takes them to the product page where that customer can then purchase the product. The way that shopping ads are designed, a customer clicking on it has a pretty good idea of what the product is, which means there's a higher chance they're going to buy it. This is why we see that the conversion rates for Google Shopping campaigns are generally higher than the conversion rates for search campaigns. Let's now learn about the Google auction. Every time someone searches on Google, Google runs an auction to decide who gets what position in the search results and how much each person would pay for that click. The higher the position in the results, the more traffic you're generally going to get. This is because people generally click the top ads over the lower ads. But to get that higher position, you generally need to pay more to get it. This is why we want to balance how much we actually pay per click. If we bid too low, we're going to get a lower position and not many clicks, which means not many sales. If we bid too high, we'll get a lot of clicks and a lot of sales, but we won't make many profits because our ad costs are going to be too high. You can see here that this creates a tug of war between the total volume of traffic you're getting and total sales and the cost of that traffic leading to the profitability of those sales. Google decides what position each advertiser gets by using this formula. Ad rank equals max bid multiplied by quality score. Everyone in that auction gets an ad rank. The highest ad rank gets position one. The next gets position two, and so on and so forth. Your ad rank equals your max CPC multiplied by your quality score. Your max bid or your max CPC is the amount that you've told Google that you're willing to pay for the click in that auction. Your quality score is a grade that Google gives you for that auction. It's based on how relevant your ad is, the experience of your landing page, and the expected click-through rate of your ad. The quality score is Google's way of rewarding us for improving and optimizing our account. They want advertisers like us to deliver a better user experience for the people on Google so people keep going back to Google and continue using it as a search engine. If we optimize our account and quality score, we can actually get a higher position than our competitor and still pay less per click than them. This is the benefit of optimizing our account. Even though Google doesn't show us our exact quality score for our Google shopping campaigns, they have indicated that it does exist. We optimize our account by improving our ads and our landing page while also managing our bids. This is how we find a balance between total volume of sales and profitability. The next thing we're going to learn about is the Google Shopping algorithm. The Google Shopping algorithm is one of the most powerful parts of Google Shopping. People often know about the Facebook pixel and how powerful it is for your Facebook ads, especially once you've seasoned it with converting data. Well, most people don't know this, but Google Shopping operates in a very similar way. When you start your Google Shopping campaigns, Google starts showing your products to different people, seeing who views the ad, clicks the ad, and converts on the ad. Google is trying to figure out 
who your best customers are. Similar to Facebook tracking people everywhere, Google also has Google Analytics installed on over 30 million websites. So they're able to build up customer profiles of the people visiting your store through Google Shopping. This helps them to show your products to people more likely to buy from you. And this improves over time. While this is happening, we can speed it up by optimizing our account and guiding the algorithm in the right direction. The better we do this, the cheaper our clicks and the more sales and profits we're going to make. So how does Google know who to show our products to? Well, if you've ever run regular search campaigns on Google Ads, you'll know that they look like this. You'll also know that when you set them up, you get to choose which keywords you want to show your ads for, which gives you the control of who to show your ads to in the search results. With Google Shopping, it's very different. There are no keywords. Google uses your product feed to figure out who to show your ads to. Google will crawl your product feed. It will try to figure out what you're selling, start showing it to people and watching how they interact with your products. This is why at the start, it takes some time to get views and clicks on your ad. But Google learns and they learn very well. Within a week of starting your Google shopping campaigns, Google will start figuring out who to show your products to. While this is happening, our job is to guide the algorithm in the right direction by managing the bids, improving the product feed, and adding negative keywords to our campaign. This guides the algorithm in the right direction by feeding it with higher quality data and helping it keep chugging away in the right direction. We're gonna learn a lot more about this in the optimization section of our free Google Shopping course. If you're watching this video right here on YouTube, it's actually part of this free Google Shopping course. I'll leave a link below, you can go check it out. Okay, now we know what Google Shopping ads are and how they work, how do we actually set them up? Here are the parts involved. In our free Google Shopping course, we're going to learn everything from setting up the product feed to actually showing our products in the search results. First, we have your website. This is your e-commerce store. You should have this right now. It's usually on Shopify, WooCommerce, Magento, or a custom platform. Then we need to set up our product feed. Our product feed is basically a table that has all our product information. It's arranged in such a way that Google can read it, understand it, and use it to create our shopping ads. In our videos, you're going to learn how to create this product feed and how to create it well. The next part of the process is creating our Google Merchant Center account. The Google Merchant Center account is used to check and verify our feed so it matches Google's requirements to run Google Shopping ads. It's kind of like a gatekeeper for Google to check your ads to make sure it meets the standard for Google Shopping. Okay, we then have our Google Ads account. Yes, this is a little bit confusing for some people. You have your Google Ads account and you have a Google Merchant Center account. Like I said, Google Merchant Center is the gatekeeper that basically checks your feed to make sure it matches what Google wants. But then we have Google Ads to actually create our shopping ads. We'll also need to make sure we link Google Merchant Center with Google Ads so the product data can travel from Google Merchant Center to Google Ads to create our shopping campaigns. After this, our products are going to show in the Google search results as Google Shopping ads. This means people will see them, click them, and visit our e-commerce store. As you can see, there are many parts with getting your Google Shopping campaigns live. Let's get into the next video. In this video, you're going to learn everything you need about the metrics to scale and optimize your Google Shopping campaigns. Metrics are what we use to track and measure the performance of our campaigns. Now we need to learn what these metrics are and how to use them so that we know that when we optimize our campaigns, we're focusing on the data and the performance that really matters. Here are the main metrics we're going to learn about in this video. I'll also add a link below this video to our metric handbook. Our metric handbook is a deeper guide to all the metrics you need for Google Shopping and an explanation of each one. First, let's talk about impressions. An impression occurs when your ad is served on a page like the Google search results. Basically, someone seeing your ad is an impression. If it's served to 10 different people, it's counted as 10 impressions. If it's served 10 times to the same person, that's still 10 impressions. Unfortunately, an impression occurs when the ad is shown on the page. 
even if the visitor didn't even see it because it's below the fold. This is good to know in case you're getting a lot of impressions, but not many clicks. You may just have a poor ad position on the page, such as all the way down the bottom where no one is really seeing it. Number two, clicks. A click is counted when someone actually clicks your ad. Keep in mind that they just need to click the ad, not actually fully load the page. They can click your ad and immediately hit the back button or shut the window down. However, Google promises that they take care of any suspicious traffic like this, where it could be a competitor trying to cost you money. If you're worried about invalid clicks like these, I'll leave a link to some resources below where you can go and read more about this topic. Next, we have the click-through rate. Your click-through rate is a measure of how many of your impressions actually became clicks. For example, if you had 50 impressions and five clicks, your click-through rate is 10%. Sometimes you'll see a click-through rate of above 100%, like two clicks and one impression. So what is happening here? Well, it means that a shopper clicked on your ad twice to get to your store, even though they only saw your ad once. This is possible because a served ad can get cached by a browser and doesn't get served again. It can happen, but don't worry about it too much. Google hasn't messed up the math on you, and yes, they'll still charge you for both clicks. Next, we have cost or ad spend. This is the running total of what Google will be charging you for those clicks. Note that the words spend, ad spend, and cost are used interchangeably. Also, your cost can change if Google determines that there were invalid clicks. Next, we have conversions. Conversions are an action or event that gets recorded. In this course, we're gonna focus on one type of conversion, which is the completed action of a purchase on your website. We'll go into far more detail about this later, but just know that orders, purchases, and conversions are used interchangeably throughout this course. Now, conversions are recorded from the date of the click. This means that if a shopper clicks your ad on Tuesday, but only converts on a Wednesday for whatever reason, the conversion is going to show up on Tuesday's data. You do have the option for viewing your conversions when they actually occurred by setting up the conversions by conversion time value column if you prefer. Next, we have the conversion rate. The conversion rate is simply the proportion of clicks that turned into conversions. For example, if 100 shoppers clicked on your ad and two turned into conversions, your conversion rate is 2%. You'll spend a lot of time obsessing over this metric because improving it has a huge impact on the performance and profitability of your campaigns. It's a metric that provides a good indication of the quality of your traffic and how well your store converts this traffic into customers. Next, we have conversion value. This is basically your total sales. It's the total revenue generated from the orders. Whenever I talk about sales or revenue, I'm talking about conversion value. Lastly, we have ROAS, return on ad spend. It's also known and seen in your Google Ads account as conversion value divided by cost. ROAS or conversion value over cost is the total sales divided by the total ad spend or total cost. This metric tells you some very important information. For every $1 you put into your ads, how much in sales do you get back? This tells you about the profitability of your ads. Google calls it conversion value over cost to make it easier. I usually call it ROAS, which means return on ad spend. ROAS and conversion value are the two most important metrics in your Google Ads account because it tells you how much actual profit you're generating. Okay guys, they are the main metrics we'll need to optimize and scale our Google Shopping campaigns. Let's get into the next video. Having a profitable Google Shopping campaign is one of the best things you can have for your e-commerce store. Seeing the traffic coming in every day, making you money, and seeing your bank account grow is a pretty good feeling. In this video, we're going to learn all about profits and profitability for Google Shopping. Overall, to make money with Google Shopping, you need to spend less on your ad costs than the gross profit you generate from your campaigns. Now, doing this requires a lot of work, but we teach you everything in this free course. In this video, we're going to learn the foundations of profits and everything you need to get there. So in this video, you're going to learn how to calculate the profits for your e-commerce store, how to know if your ads are actually profitable or not. And then finally, what are the next steps to actually optimize your campaigns based on this profitability? So before we jump into calculating our profits, 
What is profitability? I like to define profit simply as the total amount remaining after you get your sales and pay for your expenses. For example, if you sold your products and made $1,000 in sales, but it cost you $600 for the products and your other expenses, your net profit would be $400. We then divide $400 by our original $1,000 in sales to get a net profit margin of 40%. This is what we really care about here. These net profits are the amount of money you would have in your bank account at the end of the month. Now that we know what profits are, it's important to know what ROAS is. ROAS is your return on advertising, R-O-A-S. You calculate it by getting your total sales revenue divided divided by your ad spend. This tells you for every $1 you put into your marketing, how much do you get back in sales? For example, if I put $1 into my marketing and I got $5 in sales back, my ROAS would be five. In the same way, if you put $10,000 into your marketing this month and you got $50,000 in sales, your ROAS would still be five. Now, that's your actual ROAS. Another important metric is your break-even ROAS. Your break-even ROAS is the minimum ROAS you need to break even or at least start making profits on your sales. Basically, knowing that if you spend $1 on your ads, how much in sales do you need to not be losing money? We want to learn this so we can keep a close eye on our campaign's profitability. For example, if I know that my break-even ROAS is 3.4, and then this month I get a ROAS of 3.1, this campaign is not profitable and we're losing money. On the inverse, if I got a ROAS of 5.2, then this campaign was profitable because 5.2 is higher than 3.4. Knowing your breakeven ROAS informs how you actually optimize your Google Ads account all the way down to the single product ads. It keeps you data driven, always pointing towards profits as your ultimate goal. So how do you calculate your breakeven ROAS and your profit margin? Well, I'm going to show you that right now. You calculate your net profit margin by getting your total sales, taking away the cost of your products and the cost of your expenses. If you have a new store, you're generally going to be making a few guesses here. But if you have at least six months of data, that's going to give you a good average net profit that we can use to inform our campaigns. Here's what we're gonna to do together. Go below this video, I've left a link to a special spreadsheet that we're going to use to calculate our net profit margin as well as our break even ROAS. Let's go right now, open this up and fill this out together. Once you have the sheet open, add in your sales in this first section here. Let's say $100,000 over the last 12 months. The next box is for what's called cost of goods sold. This is how much your products cost from your supplier. Say I have two different types of products here. For the inventory of the first one, I spent $20,000. The inventory of the second one, I spent $30,000. Now, this is important. The amounts I put in here directly relate to the sales above. The $100,000 above should be the $100,000 in sales for the cost of the product you bought here. This will then show us the total cost of goods sold, in our case, $50,000. The next section calculates our gross profit. This is our total sales minus the total cost of goods sold. There we have our gross profit of 50% too. Scrolling down, we'll next enter in our expenses. First, we have our fixed expenses. These are expenses you need to pay for your store even if you sell zero products. Things like Shopify app subscriptions or anything like that. I've made it so that you can put the cost per month, the number of months, and it calculates the total cost for that expense. Make sure the number of months is the length of period for which you sold your products in the first box. For example, if it took you three months to sell that amount of products, then put three months. Next, we have our variable expenses. These are expenses that increase as we sell more products. A good example is any payment processing fees. We have to pay a fee on these for each credit card transaction, so these go up with each sale. Another one is shipping, so they're in there too. This then gives our total expenses at the bottom, which then allows us to calculate our net profit net profit margin, and finally, our break-even ROAS. This is all done for you with the formulas in our sheet. We now know that we need each $1 of advertising spend to make us at least $2.26 in sales for us to break even. Anything above, we make profits. Anything below, we lose money and we make a loss. So the next point is, 
how do we actually know that our Google Shopping campaigns are profitable? With this breakeven ROAS right here, we know that we need to get above this breakeven ROAS for the actual ROAS for our campaigns in order to be profitable. What I love about this is it's an easy metric that we can check anytime we want. Just open up your Google Ads account and show the column conversion value over cost. You'll find this metric viewable through all of your Google Ads account. You can see if certain campaigns, certain ads, certain search queries are profitable for your store. So now that we know if we're profitable or not, how do we actually make our account profitable? This is where the optimizations and strategies come through. There's a lot to cover, which is why we have a lot of videos on the topic in our free Google Shopping course. So if you're watching this video on YouTube, it's actually part of this free course and you can access the course totally free, no sign up required by clicking the link down below. The optimization process takes time. This is how it works. Imagine that we have a huge group of traffic that we're showing our ads to, but only a small percentage of those would actually buy our products. How do we carve away all this traffic that's not converting and focus on these customers here that are profitable. This is exactly what we learn in the optimization section of our free Google Shopping course. We're also going to learn how to guide the algorithm so that we show more to people just like these people here that are more likely to buy from us. It requires regular work, collecting the data, analyzing that data and making smart profit-driven decisions. That's it guys, that's how we calculate the break-even ROAS and profitability for our e-commerce store. In this video, you're going to learn how to make your website compliant before running your Google Shopping campaigns. This is crucial to avoid getting a nasty Google Merchant Center suspension, which can take weeks to fix. So we're going to learn what is Google's risk meter and what are Google Merchant Center suspensions, as well as how to make your website compliant, such as your refunds and returns page, your contact us page, your shipping policy page, your terms and conditions page, your privacy policy page, your product page and what to put on your footer. Below this video, you'll also find a link to download our full compliance pack. This includes all the templates that you need for each of these pages, along with a checklist so you can make sure that you're doing the right things for each of these pages to avoid getting suspended. So download that now before we go through the rest of the video. Let's go. Getting suspended is the worst. You spend all the time to set up and optimize your Google Shopping campaigns, you're getting profitable sales, and then boom, you've been suspended. Your ads stop running, and you have to go through a tedious process of fixing your Google Merchant Center suspension. So why does Google suspend accounts? First, in 2011, the FTC fined Google half a billion dollars for letting advertisers use Google to promote their scams. This was a wake up call for Google to actively find and ban these fraudsters before they racked up more fines. Secondly, and even more important for Google, they need to keep their reputation as the world's best search engine. So to borrow a term used by Google's own policy specialists, they give what's called a risk meter to each advertiser. This is about the risk that you pose to the visitor, to Google's reputation, and to Google legally. Google evaluates these risks based on your transparency of your business to Google and to the public. The rest of this video, we're going to talk through all your different pages and what to do to lower your risk meter and avoid getting suspended. First, let's go through one of the most important pages for lowering your risk meter, your refunds and returns page. This is the page that stipulates what happens when someone wants to return a product or get a refund. There are five things you must have on your returns and refunds policy page. What is your policy for returns? How is someone eligible to get a return or a refund? How do they initiate a return? The timeline for getting a return or a refund and how the refund will be given to them. Of course, check below this video for a full template that you can use to create your own returns and refunds page. One, what is your policy for returns? Meaning, do you accept returns or not? A lot of people don't know this, but you don't have to accept returns. This in itself is a returns policy, 
but you need to state that. Your policy must be applied across your entire catalog with the exception of a clearance sale and this must be stipulated when you run that promotion. You should also include here where the shipping costs are refunded to as well as any restocking fees. Second, how is someone eligible for a return or a refund? Meaning, in what situations do you accept returns and refunds? You can say that you only accept returns under special circumstances, such as a mistake on your end or if a product is defective. Or you can say only if they initiate the return within a limited time. Again, clearly spell this out so there's no question regarding the user's eligibility of the return. Third, how do they initiate a return? Make it clear how someone will contact you to initiate a return and provide at least two means of contact to initiate it. An example you could put would be contact us at returns at domainname.com or call us on 1-800-123 Four, five, six, seven. Please include your order number and reason for return. Fourth, the timeline for a return or getting a refund. How long does it take for the customer to receive an exchanged item or their refund? Some examples that you could put here are when they first contact you to initiate the return, when they send you the tracking number of their return shipment, or when the product is received by you and inspected. And fifth, how the refund will be given. How does the customer receive their money back? Here, you might just send it back to their credit card or via PayPal. Just like with all these policies, it's really up to you. Just make it clear. Your contact us page is just as important as your refunds and returns page for lowering your risk meter and avoiding getting a Google Merchant Center suspension. Google looks at it simply. Legitimate businesses are easy to contact. In this section, we're going to learn the six things you need to have on your contact us page to show Google that you're a legitimate business that's easy to contact. Like with our other pages, we've created a full template and checklist that you can download below and build out this page for yourself. First, your business name. Google wants to know what business entity is behind the website and if you don't provide this, they're less likely to trust you. So if your legal business name is XYZ LLC, then make sure you put this on your Contact Us page. You can also put your doing business as name on the Contact Us page if you have a legally registered trade name. Use the same name across all your Google accounts so Google never sees any variation in this data. Next. Add your business address. This must be a physical location from which you operate your business. Some people try to use a PO box or a rented mailbox. Since you can't work out of a mailbox, Google instantly sees this as a red flag and they won't accept it. If Google ever suspects that you have a false physical location, you'll get an instant suspension. Next, add your business phone number. This is the phone number where customers can call your business and be serviced. What is critical is that when people call, they feel like they're reaching whoever is operating the website. This means they hear the business name when answered and they can leave a voicemail if no one answers. Just like with your business name and address, I recommend you keep this consistent across all Google services. Next, here are the three things that you should have on your contact us page to avoid getting a suspension. First is your business email. Your business support email should use a custom domain not a service like Google, Yahoo, or Outlook. Next, add your hours of operation. This is where you let your customers know when you're available to answer their calls and reply to their emails. Something simple, such as, we operate between the hours of 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday to Friday, EST. Lastly, we have our contact expectations. Clearly state what will happen and when the user can expect for you to respond to their email or their message. Will you reply within one business day? That's okay, just be upfront and let them know that they can expect an answer within that time frame. If you prefer to receive phone calls during operating hours and receive messages after operating hours, let them know. That's it for our Contact Us page. Let's now look at our shipping policy page. Your shipping policy page is the page that outlines how you ship your products to your customers. Here are the three critical elements for your shipping policy page. Delivery zones, shipping costs, and shipping timing. Of course, check out the template below to build out your own shipping policy page, of course, editing it to match how you operate your e-commerce store. First, delivery zones. Your delivery zones are simple. Where do you and where don't you ship to? This can be entire countries or even broken down to individual states. Next, we have shipping costs. This is simply how much does it cost the customer for shipping? Examples include a flat rate for all orders, shipping based on rates provided at the checkout by the carriers themselves, shipping based on a percentage of the order cost, shipping based on product dimensions or weight, 
date. And finally, the crowd-pleasing favorite, free shipping. Just make it crystal clear what the customer can expect in terms of shipping costs. Also make sure to include any custom duties or taxes the customer may incur if they ship across borders. Lastly, we have shipping timing. This is simply how long it takes to ship the product to your customer. You should include the handling time, the transit time, and the cutoff time. The handling time is the number of days it takes to process the order before it ships. The transit time is the amount of time the product will be in transit before it arrives with the customer. The cutoff time is the time of day that the customer needs to complete their order in order to start the clock on their transit time. That's our shipping page. Let's move on to the next one. We're now looking at our privacy policy page. This tells your customers that you're going to handle their information with care. For this page, you can generally use a template, so we'll include ours down below, download it, and apply it to your own store. In summary, Google cares about these seven factors on your privacy policy page. What information is collected from your customers? Why is this information collected? Who that information is shared with? How the information is kept secure and for how long? Which methods you use to collect it? How do people opt out or delete information gathered about them? And finally, does this all adhere to the country of sale? That's it for the privacy policy page. Let's move on to the next one. Now we have our terms and conditions page. We have a template for this page below. I recommend you go through it and apply it to your own store. Here's what Google really cares about on your terms and conditions page. One, defining the acceptance of the agreement. Two, limitation of liability or disclaimers. Three, intellectual property rights. Four, termination. Five, notification of changes. And six, contact information. Let's now jump into the product page. Our product page is where we send our Google Shopping traffic. It's crucial we make sure it's compliant to stop any suspensions that could stop our traffic or our sales. Your product page receives extra scrutiny because Google wants transparency on the product itself. We've developed a 10 point checklist that covers the mandatory elements for compliance for your product page. Here it is, you can find the checklist down below to make sure you apply this to your own page, but let's go through it right now. First, we have the title. This needs to be highly relevant to the product. Don't include promotional copy in the title, such as free shipping or buy it now. And don't include emojis or random characters to try and draw attention. Next, we have our description. While it is hard for Google to know exactly what your descriptions mean, it does know when they're too short. Make sure to thoroughly describe your products as best you can. Then we'll look at the image. The image can't be of poor resolution quality. It must be at least 250 by 250 pixels in size. It shouldn't have a file size larger than 16 megabytes. It shouldn't include overlaid text. And ideally, it should only show the product itself on a white background. Okay, next, let's look at the price. Your price must be clearly shown and precisely match what's in your product feed. Any mismatch could result in an immediate disapproval of your product. Then we have our sale price. If you have a sale going on, make sure it also matches what's in your product feed. If there's a date that the sale ends, this should be clearly stated. Then we have our availability. This means whether your product is in or out of stock. Make this clear. Next, methods of payment. Somewhere on your product page, you need to outline the ways that your products can be purchased. This means what credit cards you accept and any other payment methods. Placing that information on the footer is fine as long as it's somewhere on the page. Then, an obvious one our add to cart button. Simply, there must be a way for shoppers to complete their purchase from the product page. Next, we have our important links. Make sure on the page, there are links to returns and refunds page, contact us page, shipping policy page, privacy policy page, and your terms and conditions page. We'll cover the footer in the next section, which is where we're going to add all these links. I also like to add a tab in the description that has our shipping policy and our returns and refunds policy. Lastly, on our product page, we add any pertinent information. This is anything else specific to the product that could be considered necessary to know for the customer to purchase. This includes information such as the shipping weight, if you charge by weight for your shipping, or if your product is not available for express shipping, even if other products are. If customization options add to the handling time. If your product has any legal warnings. And if there are any disclaimers required for product specific claims you're making, such as durability or function. There's our 10 point checklist for ensuring compliance on our product page. Lastly, we have our footer. 
Let's get into it. We want to use our footer to the max in terms of compliance. Your perfect footer includes links to your about us, your contact us page, your returns and refunds policy page, your shipping policy, your privacy policy, and your terms and conditions. It also includes your methods of accepted payment, as well as your business name and address. <laughs> That's a thorough summary of what we need to do for our store to make sure it's compliant to avoid getting a Google Merchant Center suspension. If you want to dive into each of these pages, we've got guides on each one and I'll leave a link down below to those guides. Of course, below this video, you'll also find the template pack that has all the templates and checklists for all these pages. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video. In this video, you're going to learn how to create your account in Google Ads. We're going to walk through this step by step and at the end, you're going to have a Google Ads account ready to start running ads on the Google Ads network. First, we'll go to ads.google.com. You can also find this page by just searching for Google Ads in Google. You'll see this page, just click get started. If you're not already logged in, it's going to ask you to sign in with your Gmail or G Suite account. Ideally, we want to use the same email for all the accounts we're going to use. This means Google Ads, Google Analytics, Google Search Console, Google Merchant Center, and Google Tag Manager. Don't worry about setting up the other ones now. We'll do that in another video. Let's just focus on Google Ads. Once you are logged in, you will see a screen like this that has the goals. Google is trying to take us through a recommended setup. We don't recommend doing this at all. Scroll down and find a link on the page that says, switch to expert mode. Click this link. We want to click this link to skip the basic setup because we know exactly what we're gonna do here. The reason we do this is because Google will try and put us through a basic setup, which might give you a basic Google Ads account on easy mode. This doesn't have access to all the features we need for our Google Ads account, so it's better to make the switch now, so we don't have to do it later. It's then going to show a page like this that has all the goals. Click create an account without a campaign. We can create an account later. For now, we just want to get our account created. Now we enter in our business information. The billing country is where our bank or credit card is located. The time zone will be for our own time zone. This is for reporting. The currency, make sure this is the same currency as the main currency of your store. All your reporting should be in the same currency, whether that's your own currency or if you have a store that's selling to another country, you should use the currency of that store. Analytics and Google Ads will be. Try to keep the currencies of all the accounts the same because if you're trying to register conversions in Shopify in USD, but you've got your Google Ads account in British pounds, it's not going to work really well. Once you've added these in, click submit. Sometimes it's going to ask you if you have a promo code. I recommend Googling Google Ads promo code because you'll often find a code that'll give you $100 in credits for your first ad spend. Once that's created, sometimes it asks for your billing information, your credit card details, and sometimes not. If it does, you can also set up your billing later by clicking create an account without setting up billing. You'll then see this page and you can click explore your account to reach the Google Ads dashboard. There you go, you now have a set up Google Ads account. The next thing you need to do now is set up your conversion tracking. If you're running an e-commerce store, I have a full video showing you how to set up your conversion tracking for your store. Thanks for watching guys, I'll see you in the next video. In this video, you're going to learn how to set up conversion tracking for Google Ads and Google Analytics for your Shopify store. This allows you to track the actual sales amounts from your Google Ads campaigns right there in your Google Ads account. This is our favorite method for tracking conversions with Google Ads as it shows the sales values right there in your analytics account and in your Google Ads account. Here's an overview of how it all works before we jump in to do it step by step. You're running Google Ads to drive traffic to your e-commerce store. We'll set up a Google Analytics account and then install a tracking code on our Shopify store. This is so that all traffic, demographics of those users, and the data on the sales we're making will show up in our Google Analytics account. We'll then link our Google Analytics account to our Google Ads account. This is so the conversion data will show up in Google Ads and on our Google Shopping campaigns. Showing up in our Google Ads account is going to show us what actually helped to get that sale or conversion. This means we'll see which campaign is getting conversions, which products, which ads, and everything in between. 
This is important for us to know what's working and how to optimize our account further with Google Ads and Google Shopping. First, let's create our Google Analytics account and link it into Shopify. If you don't have a Google Analytics account, we're going to create one right now. If you do, just skip this part here and go straight to the part where we link it into Shopify. Go to analytics.google.com. If you're not yet logged in with your Gmail account, make sure you do that. Click start measuring. We're going to add in our account name. This is just going to be the name of our store. It's then going to ask us our account data sharing settings. You can just leave this as it is and click next. It's then going to ask us our property name. You can put this the same as your store name. Put in your actual time zone and your currency as well. It's then going to ask you about your business information. Just fill this in. You're going to have to read and accept the terms and conditions. Once finished, it's then gonna ask you about your email communications. So here we're gonna put in what emails do we wanna see from Google. I like to just check the first one. Next, we'll need to create a new Google Analytics 4 property. So click admin down the bottom and then click GA4 setup assistant. We're then going to click, I want to create a new Google Analytics 4 property, get started. Click create property. We're now going to click see your GA4 property. Now we need to link our Google Analytics account to our Shopify store you should see this page right here. If you don't, you can always access it here by clicking data streams while in the admin menu. Click web, add in your website URL, and I'm gonna name it with my brand name. Make sure enhanced measurement is turned on. Click create stream. You should now see this window here. To install the tracking code, click the global site tag and click copy. Now let's go over to our Shopify dashboard and we'll install it on our website. Here we're in our Shopify dashboard. On the left-hand menu, we're gonna click on online store we're going to click on themes, click on actions, edit code. Make sure to select theme.liquid in the left-hand menu. Confirm that you're in theme.liquid by seeing the title of the page above. Scroll down to the section that says head. Type enter and make sure to create some space and then paste the code you copied from Google Analytics. Click save. It will say asset saved down the bottom to confirm. Now we need to confirm that it's been installed correctly. To do this, go back to our Shopify store front end and click through a few different pages. This will trigger the analytics code and send information to Google Analytics for us to confirm that it's been installed properly. Keep this window open and click back to Google Analytics on a different tab. Exit out of the stream details. On the left-hand menu, go to Reports, Real Time. This page shows you who's on your website right now in real time. If you're not seeing anything here yet, that's okay. It just takes a few minutes to start working. I'll wait about three to five minutes here and then go back to my store. Click around a little bit to make sure I'm sending data and then I'll check again. Okay, you can now see that it's sending information. It has all the data I checked when I was clicking around. What do you do if you're not seeing the data come through? One, try refreshing the Google Analytics page here. That can sometimes work. Two, open up your store in an incognito, private window, or even on your mobile device. Then click around a few pages and check back in Google Analytics in a few minutes to see if that helped. If it's still not working, we need to double check that we've installed our tag correctly. Here's how to do that. Go to your website, right click and go to view page source. You'll see the code for your site. Go where the head tag is and see if you can find the Google Analytics name there. You can also press Control plus F or Command plus F to show the search bar and search for analytics. See that on this store, we can see it right here. If you can't see it on your site, go back to Shopify and check a few things. Make sure that you clicked save on the window. Also make sure that you're in theme.liquid when making these changes. Then if it's still not working, try clearing the cache for your browser and store. Once you get that working, you'll start seeing the data for all the people visiting your store showing up in Google Analytics. Keep in mind that apart from the real-time window, it takes 24 to 48 hours for data to show in these other tabs. We now need to make sure that conversion data, like sales revenue, shows up in our analytics account when people purchase. In your Shopify dashboard, navigate to settings, checkout, and scroll down to the additional scripts section underneath order processing. This is where we're going to add another analytics code that will send the conversion values over to Google Analytics. Go down below this video and find the full code. It should look like this. We will need to edit something in this code, but for now, copy this and paste it in the box of additional scripts here. Let me show you what this code does really quickly and then show you what you need to change. You'll see here that it has things like transaction ID, value, currency, tax, shipping, items, etc. 
Next to this, you'll see these bits of code here. These are variables. Here, when someone buys from your store and checks out through Shopify, Shopify fires this code and fills all that info with the actual unique info for the customer and their order. Basically, it sends the sales value and everything over to Google Analytics so you can track the conversion value for our store in the Google Analytics dashboard. Pretty cool, huh? So what do we have to change? Just find the variable that says key commerce and change this to your Google Analytics measurement ID. We do this by going over to Google Analytics and copying our measurement ID and then returning and deleting key commerce and pasting it in. There, that's how we do it. We can now save. Next, we just have to quickly exclude Shopify as a referral in GA4. Basically what this means is that because of the way the Shopify checkout works, if we don't add Shopify as an excluded referral, then the Shopify checkout pages will show up in our reports, which is not something we want. To do this, go back to admin in Google Analytics. Click on our data stream here. Scroll down to more tagging settings. Click list unwanted referrals. Add checkout.shopify.com as an exclusion and click save. We also want to exclude payment gateways such as stripe.com, paypal.com, and pay.google.com. I've added links to resources about excluding unwanted referrals in the description box below. Lastly, before we link Google Ads to Google Analytics, we do want to add the old version of Analytics to our store just in case. To do this, go to online store, then go to preferences. Now we want to go back to Google Analytics and go to the admin page. We're going to click create property. Now here, we're going to scroll down and click show advanced options. We're gonna select this. Then we're going to select the second one and we're going to add in our website URL. Change the name to the name of your website. Make sure you set the time zone and the currency. Scroll down and click next. Fill out the business information as you wish. Click create. It's then going to create our Google Analytics property. This is the old Google Analytics. We're just gonna copy the global site tag here. Go back to our e-commerce store and paste it in the Google Analytics account box. Click save. Now we're going to click use enhanced e-commerce. Click save. Click admin and navigate to the view for which you want to turn on enhanced e-commerce. In the view column, click on e-commerce settings. Here, we want to enable e-commerce by clicking this button. Make sure you also turn on enhanced e-commerce reporting. Now we just click save. The next thing we need to do is link our Google Analytics account to our Google Ads account. To do this, log into your Google Ads account that you've already set up. Go to ads.google.com. If you haven't set it up, you'll need to do so. I'll leave a link to a video I made showing you how to set up your Google Ads account below this video. Click tools and settings at the top. Under setup, click linked accounts. You'll then see Google Analytics GA4. Click on details. If you are logged into Google Ads with the same email address you use to create a Google Analytics account, you should see your Google Analytics property below. Under the actions column, click link. Turn on import audiences and click link. It will then link and show linked. Also make sure to turn on auto tagging in the toggle above. And that's how you link your Google Ads account to your Google Analytics 4 account. The final thing we need to do is set up conversion tracking in Google Ads. In your Google Ads account, go to tools and settings at the top. Under measurement, click conversions. You'll see a page like this, just click plus conversions. Click import to import conversions from Google Analytics. Click Google Analytics 4 properties. Select web, click continue. It's then going to show the linked account we linked earlier. Select the event and click import and continue. It then says it's been imported, click done. I'm now just going to edit the attribution settings. So click into the conversion action you just created, click edit settings, and I'm gonna change the attribution model to linear. Basically by changing the attribution model to linear, we're going to be able to see what clicks contributed to the sales for our store. That's everything we need to do, so just click done. That's it guys, we're finally set up conversion tracking with Google Ads using Google Analytics on our Shopify store. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. In this video, you're going to learn what Google Merchant Center is and how it works. Knowing this information is going to better set you up for setting up your product feed and shopping campaigns to make more profits for your e-commerce store. First, we're going to learn what Google Merchant Center is. Then we're going to learn how to set up our account together. 
Then I'm going to give you a tour of the Merchant Center dashboard so you know where everything is and how it all works. Okay, what is Google Merchant Center? Google Merchant Center is a platform by Google that houses all the information about your products. Everything about your product information, your reviews, your inventory and promotions are located here. Your Google Shopping ads can't run without a Google Merchant Center account or this information here. And when there are issues with that information, and there often are at the start, this is where you're going to come to diagnose and fix those problems. You can think of Google Merchant Center as the ultimate gatekeeper for your Google Shopping ads. You can't run Google Shopping ads unless your products are approved in Google Merchant Center along with your business information too. Google needs to verify your product titles, your descriptions, your images, your pricing, and every other part of your products before they'll show your products in Google Shopping. So how do we set up our Google Merchant Center account? Let's do that right now. Note, you will need to have a Gmail or a Google-based email account for this. It's a good idea to use the same email you've used for your Google Ads and Google Analytics accounts where possible. Go to merchants.google.com and click the Get Started button. You'll see this page here, scroll down and enter in your business name. You'll want to enter your trade name, meaning the name you do business as. You don't need to put in your legal business name here. Then put in your country and time zone. This is where your business is registered. Don't worry, you're not locking yourself into selling to just that one country. Then you select the option for checking out on your website. For most stores, this is just going to be on my website. You can always change this at a later time. After that, you're given the option of selecting tools that you use. Currently, there are two tools, Shopify and PayPal. This just makes integration with these platforms easier. I'm gonna select Shopify for this store. Then it's going to ask us about email notifications. You can keep this as it is. Then it's going to ask us about the terms and conditions. Normally, we tend to not read these because life's too short. So let me summarize what you're agreeing to. It ties what you do here to the core Google terms and conditions, which are actually pretty easy to read to their credit. You agree not to sell prohibited content, generally illegal things such as counterfeit goods, sell restricted content, generally legal but controlled, such as things like alcohol. Misrepresent yourself or your product or try to abuse the ad network and any of the other million little gimmicks and tricks that Google has already seen and will simply ban you for. You agree to let Google crawl your site and you authorize Google to use your trademarks in your advertising. I'm going to accept and click create account. If you selected Shopify, it's gonna show you this page, but we just wanna go through to Merchant Center. Now that we've created our account, let's take a look at the interface here. I'm gonna show you with a real account. The first section you see when logging into Merchant Center is the overview. It shows the status of your products across each of their destinations. Here we see enhanced free listings, shopping ads, dynamic remarketing, and their performance in clicks. Honestly, it's not a very useful section. Though, if you see a lot of red in these graphs, then you know there's an issue. Google also includes policy announcements here if you wanna keep up on them. The next section, products, is the most useful for actually reviewing issues and getting the information you need to fix them. Here in diagnostics, we see the same type of graph showing you the products supplied in your feed. Active items are those currently being displayed in one or more of your destinations without issue. Expiring items are those that will be removed within three days if their information is not renewed. All products expire 30 days after they're uploaded unless renewed. Usually this isn't an issue because most people opt to renew their products every day. Pending items are those products that have been uploaded but not yet reviewed and approved by Google to show. And disapproved items are not eligible to show for a reason that Google will detail below in the issues table. Here you'll see the warnings and disapprovals for your items broken down by issue. Warnings shown with the yellow triangle icon are just that, a warning that doesn't actually block your product's eligibility. Only disapprovals do, which are shown with the red circle icon. When you click view examples, you'll see the affected items in a list. Here we see that these products have been disapproved by Google because there's an invalid value in the sale price feed for these products in our feed. Clicking the product title itself will show you all the information that Google has gotten from your feeds and website. It will highlight any of the issues. For example, here we see that there's an issue with the sale price. This is likely because the sale price should be below the actual price. In this case, it's above, so it's been flagged as a disapproval. The diagnostics page is probably the most useful and used page for me and my team on a day-to-day -day basis. Be sure to check it often. Next in the products section, we have the all products page. It lists all the products compiled from your feeds into one place for your review. You can see some traffic metrics such as clicks and unpaid paid clicks. Clicks are those that you paid for in Google Ads and unpaid clicks come from your free listings, which we'll talk about in another video. 
This can be a useful page for monitoring the status of your catalog as a product list view. However, it's not terribly useful for checking in on performance. Note that you have a few available columns that you can add to the table here. Finally, in the product section, we have the feeds page. At the top here, we have the primary feeds. This is where you add your feed. And once it's added, where you'll review it. Click the feed title to review when it was last processed and then reprocess the feed if you've made changes to it. In the settings tab, you can control the countries of sale for the feed, rename the feed itself, adjust the encoding and delimiter settings. I suggest you don't unless you're advanced enough to know what you're doing here. Set the schedule frequency for fetching the file, set a default currency for the feed and set an ID rule. Speaking of rules, the final tab is for setting up feed rules. It's not necessary to know what feed rules are at the start, but we'll leave some links to some resources below so you can learn more about them if you'd like. Going back to the feeds page, below primary feeds, we have supplemental feeds. These include supplemental feeds, which again, we'll cover in another video and we'll leave some links below this one. And a product inventory feed. This is for local inventory. If you have multiple stores and need to supply different product information for each. The next section in this side navigation is for performance reporting. We open up here a dashboard page to see a graph showing simple traffic metrics for our free listings. While this may be of use to someone somewhere, I've yet to meet that person so we'll be very brief here. You can segment this report by product, brand or category here. And you can further create your own reports and dashboards in this section. Again, this is not an area I've seen put to great use by anyone. So I've elected to not spend too much time here as part of Merchant Center, as I don't believe it's a critical part of what you need to learn, grow and profit. Let's now take a look at the marketing section. First, we see the promotions page. This is where you add new promotions that will apply to the products in your feed. Promotions can either be added as feeds or added as structured promotions starting here with this plus button. Promotions are an important part of a successful Google shopping campaign, so we'll keep this page in mind for the future. Google's own data shows that not only do promotions lead to more clicks overall for your ads, but they tend to improve click-through rates an average of 28%. We have a full video guide for setting up promotions for your Google shopping campaigns. I'll leave a link to that guide down below and you can go access it right after this video. This shopping ads page is relatively new to Merchant Center. It lets you start a new shopping campaign straight from Merchant Center. I do not recommend doing this. You still need a Google Ads account no matter what because that's where you pay Google its invoices. So the only thing you'd be doing on this page is launching a shopping campaign without the additional settings and options available to you if you did it from Google Ads. It just doesn't make sense to do it this way as this leaves too much to Google and they can just waste your budget. Let's now look at the growth section. In the growth section, Google tries to offer you information to help you optimize. For many stores that we work with, I don't see great value in most of these pages. So if you don't see anything useful here, don't worry, you're not the only one. The first page we're looking at here is the opportunities page. If Google wants to make recommendations for your account and campaigns, it'll post them here. For the price competitiveness page, you'll need to agree to Google's market insights policy before getting access. Once you do, you'll see how Google believes your product prices stand against similar product benchmarks. I urge caution when looking at this data as Google can terribly miscategorize products sometimes. However, if you are selling commonly available products that have GTIN numbers, then you may get some great information here. For the best sellers page, again, you'll have to agree to the market insights policy to view this data. Here, Google displays the top selling products according to country and category category, which you can adjust using these filters. This can be useful information if you're in a heavily competitive category and need to know what's currently popular. Finally, we have the manage programs page. It lists all the available programs that you can enlist for your marketing, including free product listings, shopping ads, dynamic remarketing, customer reviews, free local product listings, local inventory ads, promotions, product ratings, and market insights. We'll be discussing these in other videos. Just know that this is the page where you can access and learn more about them. I would suggest you make sure that shopping ads, free product listings, and dynamic remarketing are enabled. Do this by clicking on the gear icon and following the steps outlined to you. That wraps up our navigation walkthrough of Google Merchant Center. With the familiarity you now have, you're ready to explore its settings and optimize it for your own store. Anyways, thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next video. In this video, we're going to learn how to add our business information settings in Google Merchant Center. We're now in the Google Merchant Center dashboard. If you need to get here, just go to merchants.google.com. At the top, go
go to tools and settings and go to business information. We'll then see this first tab here about your business. Make sure your display name is the brand name of your store. This doesn't have to be your actual company name. It just needs to be what customers are going to see. You then need to add in your business address. This is where your business headquarters are located. Next, we add in our phone number for verification. So put in your country and then type in your phone number. Click verify number. You're then going to receive a verification code, either voice or text. Once done, it'll then say verified. Next, we're gonna put in our customer service contact. So put in the URL I recommend of your contact us page, your email contact, so how customer service could actually contact you and your actual phone number to reach you as well. Once you've done that, you now have the website tab. Now I have a full video that actually takes you through doing this, but if you have analytics already installed with the same email that you're using for Merchant Center, it should automatically verify. If not, just check a link down below and I have a link to a video that shows you how to verify it the manual way. Next, we have the branding tab. This is where we add in the actual colors of our store brand. For my one, I'm gonna put in black and then white for the accent. Next, it asks us to add in our logo. So put in a square version of your logo here and then a rectangular logo as well. Google has their requirements on the right hand side here. And that's how we add our business information settings in Google Merchant Center. Thanks for watching guys, I'll see you in the next video. In this video here, you're going to learn how to verify and claim your website on Google Merchant Center for your Shopify store. First, log into your Google Merchant Center account by going to merchants.google.com. Click the gear icon at the top and go to business information. Now we're going to go to the website tab at the top. Paste in your website URL for your store. Click continue. It now shows us that it's been unverified and unclaimed, which is what we're going to do right now. If you've already set up Google Analytics, linked it to Google Ads and linked Google Ads to Google Merchant Center, it might actually show here that you're already verified. This is because we use the same email across all Google services and Google quickly matched up our accounts for verification. But if you see this and it says unverified and unclaimed, we have to do it manually. So let's do it now. We have these three options here for verification. The easiest one is going to be the first one here. Here, we're going to add this HTML code to our website. We're gonna walk through it right now. First, just copy the code by clicking this button here. Now we log into our Shopify dashboard. If you're using a different platform, you just need to put this code into the header of your website. In Shopify, we go to online store and it's going to show this page here with the themes. Click actions, edit code. This opens a new page where we can see all the files as part of our website theme on the left here. We want to click theme.liquid. You can confirm that you've opened theme.liquid because this tab here will say theme.liquid. Now we need to find the right place to put our tag. Search for this line here that says head. You can also press control F or command F to open up the search function and just search for head. Once you find the head tag, paste in the code you copied from Google Merchant Center. Now click save and it will say asset saved. We're now going to go back to Google Merchant Center. Click on verify website. If it says the meta site on your tag is incorrect, it may take a few minutes to verify. So just wait three to five minutes and we'll try again. Now that we've done that, it now says it's been verified. To claim it, just click the claim button. With that, your website is now verified and claimed in Google Merchant Center. And that's how we verify and claim our website in Google Merchant Center. In this video here, we're going to learn how to set up our shipping and return settings in Google Merchant Center. First, let's start with our shipping settings. Open your Google Merchant Center account by going to merchants.google.com. Go to tools and settings, shipping and returns. Click add shipping service. It's going to ask you your shipping service name. You can name it whatever you like. It won't be seen by shoppers. Select the countries that this service will apply to. You can add as many as you like here. Select the currency that your rates are in, click next. It's now going to ask us for our order cutoff time. This is the time where you stop processing orders for the day. We then add in our handling time. This is the period following the cutoff time until the order is actually ready for shipping. The transit time is how long it takes generally to ship the product to the customer. Click next. Next, it's going to provide us all these different options for how we actually handle shipping with our website. You need to select the correct option for your store and what matches your shipping page and how you actually ship your products. You can also switch the advanced settings to see things like size and weight. Firstly, you can do free shipping over a certain amount. So if someone spends $100, they could get free shipping. So if someone spends $100, 
you may still charge $15 for shipping. You can select free shipping to ship all your items for free. You can do range based, which means the shipping rate is gonna be based on the actual order value. You can also click this button here to have several ranges. So you have tiers for how much your shipping costs, depending on the order value. You can also just do flat rate shipping. So every order is shipped for say $20. You can do based on the carrier. So depending on your location, it's gonna pull in the carrier services and the pricing for each. Make sure to put in your origin zip code, any percentage adjustments or flat adjustments too. If you need to add a shipping service based on the size or weight of your products, you can click this button here. This allows you to use the advanced settings in the shipping settings. You can then create different shipping rates based on a multitude of factors based on order price, order weight, number of items, destination. I won't go into too much detail here, but you can play around this for yourself. Honestly, from a business perspective, I do recommend you look into doing free shipping. Once you've chosen your shipping, click save. I want to offer some advice from a marketing perspective. If you can offer free shipping for your customers, do it. Nine out of 10 shoppers say free shipping is their biggest incentive to shop online. And orders with free shipping have 30% higher average order values. It's becoming a stronger expectation for people as time goes on, with 61% of people saying they're somewhat likely to abandon their cart if free shipping isn't offered. There's no getting around how powerful free shipping can be for your sales. Now let's set up our returns policy in Google Merchant Center. Next, we need to set up our return policy information, but to start this, we need to make sure we enable the shopping ads in Google Merchant Center. So go to growth, manage programs, and then click get started under shopping ads. Once you've done this, you now see this page right here, but we can add in our returns information now. Go to tools and settings at the top, go back to shipping and returns, and you'll now be able to see return policies at the top. Notice here that Google shows an example of how they plan to show your return policy information in Google Ads. Here are the steps to enter when adding your policy. Click add policy to start. Add your country. You can add any of the 120 countries listed here to be covered by the policy. Click next. Add your policy URL. Go to your website and get the URL of your returns and refunds page. Paste it into this box. It's going to ask you, do you accept returns from these countries? If you do, click yes. If you don't, click no. It's going to ask how customers can return your products. You can say in store, at a kiosk or by mail. I'm gonna put by mail. Here we just add in the actual options for how we actually operate as an e-commerce store. I'm gonna put download and print and download and print. Click next. It's going to ask us how many days do customers have to return the product. You can have a lifetime guarantee or put in a set number of days. I'm gonna put in 90 days. You can also extend the return window during certain times of year like the holidays. It's really up to you. I'm gonna click next. It's gonna ask you what product conditions that you allow for returns. I'm gonna select all in this case, click next. It's going to ask what currency applies to this policy. This is for if you're selling to multiple countries with multiple currencies. I would just put in your main currency here. If there's a restocking fee, you can add that in here. There's none for us. It's then going to ask you how much customers will have to pay for return shipping. You can add in your own policy details here. In my case, I'm gonna make it free. Click next. It now shows a summary of what was added and we can click done. If you have multiple policies for multiple countries, you can continue adding them in here. A common problem that I see people making is they'll set up their returns policies in Google Merchant Center and forget to update it once they've updated their actual policies on their website. So keep Merchant Center in mind as the platform where you're officially stating your policies to Google and to remember to always keep it updated with your business. I'll end this lesson by echoing my earlier advice regarding free shipping. Your shipping and returns policies should be regarded as part of your marketing. It may be expensive to offer perks such as free shipping or a 90 days no questions asked refund policy. But this is how many businesses have found enormous success. Two famous examples are one, Zappos, a shoe retailer that offers free shipping and free returns. And two, LL Bean, an apparel outlet that had lifetime guarantees on its entire catalog. Stores that we work with tend to have greater success with these customer friendly approaches by far. Shoppers are incredibly attracted to stores that minimize the risk of a bad experience. And Google knows this. That's why they're asking for this information and putting it on your Google Shopping ads. So guys, that's how we set up our shipping and returns in Google Merchant Center. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next video. In this video, you're going to learn how to set up your tax settings in Google Merchant Center. Google has different tax requirements depending on where your business is located. Keep in mind that the taxes that you actually have to pay are based on many different factors. That's outside the scope of this video, so make sure to speak to a professional tax advisor. But we're gonna talk about Merchant Center and setting up our taxes there. 
Google sees the world as three separate regions, the United States, Canada, and the rest of the world. We can cover Canada and the rest of the world because there's very little to change there. For Canada, you don't have to set anything up but you can't include taxes as part of the purchase price. The taxes must be visible as a separate charge on the checkout page. That's it. For the rest of the world, it's even easier. Simply confirm that you're not in the US and Google will assume that any taxes you're required to pay are included in the final product price. Now, let's cover the United States. The tax requirements for the US are a bit more complicated because of the differing state tax regulations. It can also change depending on your business and your products. So this is where a professional tax advisor is essential. You can set up the tax rates you need to collect at the account level, which is what we're going to do here, or at the product level in your product feed. The tax rates the shopper is shown here must match or exceed what the shopper is actually charged at checkout. This is a strictly enforced rule of Google that you don't want to be on the wrong side of. There are three taxation scenarios available for US businesses. One, standard tax rate by state. This is a common scenario where you might be selling products to all states, but you're only charged for taxes to customers in your state. For example, if you're in Florida and you're selling to New York, you might not have to collect the sales taxes. But if you have customers in Florida, you do need to collect that sales tax. In this case, simply go to the sales tax link in the tools menu, then select Florida, and then you can let Google determine the sales tax since Google keeps it up to date when it changes, or you can manually set it. Next, we have flat rate. This is applicable to businesses operating in origin-based states. This means that the tax is collected based on the seller's state, not the buyers. In this case, you'll simply want to choose all the states and apply your required sales tax rate to each state. Next, we have custom tax rate. This is where you're selling a product that comes under a different tax rate than the regular state sales tax. Simply apply the rate in the manual setup field. Be sure to save. That's how you set up your account level tax information in Google Merchant Center. If you have special tax rates based per product or per state, you can handle those by creating special tax categories and adding them to your product feed. I'll leave some resources below this video showing you how to do this. If this video was helpful, please give it a like. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next video. In this video, you're going to learn how to link your Google Merchant Center account with Google Ads. You need to do this before you can run your Google Shopping campaigns. It's really easy. Let's do it right now. First, make sure you have the same email address with admin access on both your Google Merchant Center and Google Ads accounts. You can check by going to the users section of each platform. On Google Ads, go to tools and settings at the top and underneath setup, go to access and security. Here, you can see the individual users on your account. You can also go to managers to see the managers associated with your account. And you can see their email addresses too, if they exist. Now let's make sure we have the same email on our Google Merchant Center account. On Google Merchant Center, go to the tools and settings cog at the top and click on account access. It may ask you to log in. You'll then see this screen, which shows all the users for the account and confirm that the same email is on the Google Ads and Google Merchant Center account. Once you've confirmed this, we're now ready to link our accounts. On Google Merchant Center, go to the top again and click on Tools and Settings. Underneath Settings, click on Linked Accounts. You should now see your Google account listed on the screen. Underneath the Actions column, let's click Link. It's then going to send a request to our Google Ads account and we'll just need to accept this. Go back to your Google Ads account. At the top, click on Tools and Settings and under Setup, click on Linked Accounts. Scroll down and find Google Merchant Center. Click on manage and link. We can now see this request from our Google Merchant Center account. Click on view request and make sure it's the same Merchant Center ID as our account. Yes, that's the same. Click on approve. It now says status linked. Boom, our accounts are now linked and we can continue setting up our product feed and our Google Shopping campaigns. Product Feed is a file that contains all the data that Google uses to categorize your products and show them in the Google Shopping ads. It's a file or bridge between the products shown on your website and what actually gets shown 
in the shopping ads. The product feed contains all the information about your products. It's like a giant table of data, all in a file that Google can understand. Okay, let's take a look at what your product feed can look like. You can imagine that your product feed is like a giant table with all your product information. Here's a simplified example right here. You can see that we have the columns, ID, title, description, price, and link. Under this first row, we can see that we have two different products with their information under each column heading. This is a simplified version. The feed that we're actually gonna build out with our videos is a bit more complex, but this gives you an idea of what it looks like. These columns are each called product fields, and some are mandatory and some are optional. It's our job to fill in these product fields. Some will get pulled from our Shopify store automatically, and some we will have to enter in manually. Let's go through the mandatory fields for your product feed right now. Number one, ID. This is the unique identifier for your product. You can use your SKU or a random number. It doesn't matter too much. Next, we have the title. This is one of the most important fields for your product feed. Google gives your title the most weight when it's deciding who to show your products to. We'll learn how to optimize this in a later video. Next, we have the description. This describes your product and you can often have the same description as what you have on your product page. Next, we have the link. This is your link to the product page for that product. With Google Shopping Campaigns, you have to send traffic to the product page for that product, not the homepage or another page, the product page. Next, we have image link. This is a direct link to the image of that product. It doesn't need to be the image that we already have on our product page. We can adjust this to an image of our choosing if we want to optimize our click-through rates. Next, we have the price. Obviously, this is the price of our product. It must match what's on our product page and what people pay when they check out with our products. If you're not using a product feed, this is one of the things that can cause disapprovals. This is because people forget to update their product feed when they update their price on their website. Next, we have availability. Availability is the last mandatory field. This is whether your product is in stock or not. If your feed says the product is in stock, but your website says it's not in stock, then you're going to have a problem and Google will probably disapprove your product. Make sure to keep this updated or use a dynamic feed, which we'll learn about in the next few videos. There are also some other fields that are mandatory, but only in specific scenarios. One, brand. This is the brand of the product. Product. You can put your brand or the actual brand of the product. This is mandatory for every store that is not selling movies, books, and musical recording equipment. In most cases, you will need to add the brand. Next, we have condition. This is whether your product is new, used or renewed. You only need to add this if you're selling a used or renewed product. Next, we have the color. This is the color of the product and is mandatory for apparel. It's used in Brazil, France, Germany, Japan, the UK, and the US. Next, we have the size. This is the size of the product, like small, medium, large. It's used for all products under the categories of clothing and shoes in Brazil, Germany, France, UK, Japan, and the US. Next, we have age group. If you're selling apparel, then you'll need to put this in for your products. Same as the others, this is required for Brazil, Japan, France, Germany, the US, and the UK. Next, we have gender. This is also for apparel, and you'll need to put in the gender of your product if you're selling to Brazil, France, the US, UK, and Japan. Okay, next we have the shipping weight. This is the actual weight of your product. Google Merchant Center uses this to provide accurate pricing based on your shipping settings. It's mandatory for products where the weight of the product is going to influence the shipping price that the customer pays. Next we have Adult. This is just mandatory for products that are only appropriate for mature audiences. Most stores don't have to include this. And lastly, multi-pack. This is mandatory when you bundle products together and you're selling to Australia, Brazil, Czechia, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland, the UK, and the US. They're the mandatory fields for product feeds. There are a lot of optional fields too. We'll go through the optional fields that we'll need when we actually set up our feeds in the next videos. Just to know, ideally, you want to add as much product information as you can to your feed. Don't just add the bare minimum and what you need for the mandatory fields. We want to add as much as we can to inform Google about what our products are so they know who to show them to. 
In this video, you're going to learn the three main methods for setting up the product feed for your Shopify store. Choosing the right product feed method is going to save you a lot of time and money and help you get more sales from your campaigns in the long run. I'm going to talk through each method and tell you which one I recommend depending on your situation. And this is gonna help you choose the best method for your store. Once you choose the right method for you, I then have a video on how to set up each exact method. You'll find a link to each of those three methods below this video. So once you choose your method, just go down below, click the link to the method that you chose, and you're gonna go through the full guide on how to set it up for your store. Here are the three methods. One, set up your product feed with a Shopify app. Two, directly upload into Google Merchant Center. And three, set up your feed with Google Sheets. Let's look at setting up with the Shopify app First, This means installing an app on our Shopify store that automatically creates the feed using our product information. We can then edit this feed, optimize it, and connect it to Google Merchant Center. So what are the benefits of using a Shopify app for your feed? First, it's straightforward and easy to set up. We'll do it together in the video linked below, step by step. It also creates what's called a dynamic feed. This means when you update your pricing on your website, it's going to update the feed and update in Merchant Center. Okay, but what are the issues with this method? Firstly, it doesn't provide a huge amount of customization in your feed. For example, changing the images. It also becomes a problem when you have a lot of products and you want to edit them easily. It's not super easy to edit products in bulk. So if you have more than a couple of hundred products, I recommend looking into using the Google Sheets method or using some third-party software like Data Feedwatch. I'll leave a link to Data Feedwatch below as well. For most people starting out that have less than one to 200 products, this is the method that I recommend. Like I said, I've got a full video on using this method. I'll leave a link down below. The next method we're going to talk about is directly uploading our product information straight into Google Merchant Center. That's right, there's no Shopify app, there's no Google Sheets, you just log straight into Google Merchant Center, go to products and start adding your products one by one. Sounds pretty easy, right? Yes, but there's a big problem. If you have more than say 15 products, this takes a lot of time. It's great for those people that want to get started quickly and don't have a lot of products. The problem is it's also not dynamic. If your product details change, like your description or your pricing on your website, you need to go back into Merchant Center and remember to update your feed. It's also not easy to edit your products in bulk. So if you want to make a lot of changes or you've got a lot of products you need to make changes to, you're going to be sitting there all day doing it. Okay, so who should actually use this method? If you only have a few products, say 10 to 15, this is the method for you. It allows you to quickly set up your feed without needing extra templates or apps or anything like that. It's also for you if you're okay with remembering to update your feed when you make changes to your products on your website. Just like with the other method, I've got a full guide on how to do this. I'll leave a link down below. Lastly, we have the Google Sheets method. This is where we use Google Sheets to provide the information about our products into Google Merchant Center. The advantage of this is that it's much faster if we have a lot of products and we download Load them from Shopify, put them into Google Sheets, and then send them to Google Merchant Center. You can see all your products in one place and it makes it much easier to bulk edit fields. I also like it because I get a good overview of all my products so I can scroll through and find problems such as inconsistencies or anomalies with my product information. The disadvantage here is that it can be a little bit daunting if you've never used Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel before. It's also not dynamic. So just like with uploading directly into Merchant Center, if your pricing on your website changes, it's not going to update in your feed unless you manually change that in the Google Sheet. So the big issue here is most people forget to keep them synced. This can result in product disapprovals, which means your ads stop running, which means you lose clicks and lose sales. I recommend using this method if you have a lot of products to manage and you're going to remember to update your feed. Just like with the other two methods, I've created a full guide on how to set up with Google Sheets. I'll leave a link to that down below. Now, if you're already making money from your Google Shopping campaigns, I recommend exploring some third-party software for setting up your feed. We like to use Data Feedwatch. I'll leave a link down below. Keep in mind that third-party software can be much more powerful with managing your feed, but it does cost. Okay guys, they're the three methods we recommend using for setting up your product feed for the first time. Choose one of them and then go through the guides linked down below to set yours up. And I hope to see you in the next video.
In this video, you're going to learn how to set up your product feed for Google Shopping with the Google Shopping app for your Shopify store. This allows us to quickly set up our product feed so we can start running our Google Shopping campaigns and make sales and profits for our store. We've used this method to generate a lot of sales for our stores like this one, this one, and this one. Now, what is required to set up your feed with this method today? The first thing you need is to set up your Google Merchant Center account. This means going to merchants.google.com, setting up your account and adding in all your settings and business information. You then need to claim and verify your website, add your shipping information and your returns and refund information. This process is quite straightforward and I have videos on every single thing you need to do here. I'll leave a link to those videos down below. I walk you through the process step by step. These videos are actually all part of our free Google Shopping course that shows you how to set up, optimize and scale your campaigns. I'll leave a link down below. Go and check that out and then keep going through this video right here. Once complete, your Google Merchant Center account is ready for us to go and we're going to open up our Shopify dashboard and make sure we're logged in. You can also access this Shopify app by going to apps, customize your store, searching for Google Shopping Shopify. Then go below this video and find the link to the Google Shopping Channel app. You should see this page. Make sure you only use this app here called Google Channel by Shopify. We we'll use this app because it's free and easy to use and I want to save you guys the pain and money. You need to make sure you're logged into Shopify before we can install it. So make sure at the top it says log out to know that you're logged in. Just click the button that says add app. It's then going to show you this confirmation page. Scroll down and click add sales channel. Now you should see this page here. Just click connect Google account. It's going to ask you to log in, click allow. Great, it's now connected. We then want to go through this checklist section here and make sure to check these off. This means having the valid payment method on your store, making sure your store is public, adding a refunds returns policy and terms of service, and making sure you add your contact information onto your store as well. I'm going to confirm that I've added contact information to my store. Click confirm. It's then going to ask me to verify my contact number. It's then going to confirm my product feed settings. If you're not sure about this, just go through the free Google Shopping course and go through the website compliance video. I'll leave a link to that exact lesson below. It teaches everything you need to make sure you're compliant. If you don't make sure you're compliant, as soon as you try running your ads, your account might get banned and then it's even harder to fix. So I recommend getting this right the first time to save yourself a world of pain later. Next, we wanna accept the terms and conditions and click complete setup. Next, we'll see this page here. We'll now make sure that our feed is set up. Click manage availability. It's then going to show us all the products in our store and we will now optimize our feed so that we can get more clicks and more sales. This is an important step. Don't skip it. Optimizing our feed means editing each product field in this table. Now for some of these fields, this is actually editing what's on your website, but I'm also gonna show you how to edit the titles and descriptions so it shows up differently in your Google Shopping campaigns. Optimizing the fields like this is a key part of scaling your campaigns, generating more sales and more profits. We'll go through all the edits we need to make right now to optimize our feed here. First, we need to unhide the columns that we're going to be editing. Make sure at the top here, we have the following columns unhidden. Title, available to Google, Google product category, MPN, page title, and meta description. Once you see these columns, we're now going to go through one by one and make sure the product information is correct as well as optimize it. First, we're going to start with the product title. Your title is the most important product field for Google. Your Google Shopping campaigns will perform much better if you spend the time to craft and optimize title. These titles here in the title column are actually what's on our e-commerce store. But honestly, you don't always wanna have the same title in your shopping ads as what's on your store. Look at this example. This brand is selling a backpack called Lita, but how would Google know what the heck a Lita is? A better title would be Sling Backpack in Gray 40L. See how that's much more descriptive and also optimized towards what a customer might search? The question I often get asked here is, is there some sort of formula for a good product title? The answer is yes. We have a full guide on optimizing your titles using formula structures. It also includes these templates of the structures that you can use for your own titles. And I'm gonna leave a link below this video. Now, something to note is that this title here means that you will be editing your website title, which is probably not what you want. That's why we unhid this column, page title. This means that instead of editing the title on the actual page, we're editing what's called the SEO title. 
This means what Google is gonna show in the search results for organic listings, as well as affect what's going to show in your shopping ads. Now, let's edit our first title here. Snooze Go is not a very descriptive title for what we're actually selling here, which is a white noise machine. So I'm gonna change the title to something a bit more relevant. I've put here white noise machine with fan, Bluetooth enabled. This is just an example, but you can imagine that people are going to be searching for a white noise machine with Bluetooth, maybe with a fan, and this is gonna better target those search queries. This is going to allow Google to better understand what we're selling here to show to the right customers and get us more clicks for less. Now that we've optimized our title, we can now optimize our description. Similar to the title, Google does give the description weight in how to show your products to the customers. What I like to do here is just pull in the actual description on our page and then edit it to make sure we clean it up for any HTML or anything like that. Think about what sort of description someone that's searching for your type of products is going to want to see in the search results before clicking on your page. Keep in mind that you don't have a lot of space here, so keep it as descriptive as possible while sticking to the main points. Now that we've done that, let's adjust our Google product category. This column is for us to put in the Google product category for each product. Google has their own big list of categories that help them figure out what your product is. We need to check this list for the most relevant category for our product and then paste in the code into this cell for each of our products. To find this list of all the Google product categories, check below this video. I'll leave a link to it there. Search through until you find whatever is best related to your product. For example, we're selling white noise machines, so I just searched for white noise and it's pulled up 4056 as the Google product category. This may take a little bit of searching, trying out some different sort of keywords until you find what is most relevant. You do want to spend the time to get this right because it's going to really help Google find out what you're selling and show it to the right people. I'm going to copy our Google product category number. I'm going to go back and paste it into that cell. Next, we have the MPN. This is the manufacturer part number and is assigned by the manufacturer and is unique to every product. This is so that someone searching for a Toyota air filter can search for a specific MPN that's tied to their specific make and model. It is a good idea to provide this MPN. Maybe you'd ask this. What if your product doesn't have an MPN? Well, if you don't have a GTIN, it's mandatory to have a brand and MPN for your products. You can't make up a GTIN if it doesn't exist, but you can make up an NPN. Just make sure it's unique to every product in your feed. If you have to, just add in the SKU in the NPN field. If you don't have a GTIN, this is an optional field. Though I do recommend adding it if you know it or you can find it for your product. Otherwise, leave it blank. I'm going to add in the SKU for my products here as the NPN. The next thing I wanna show you is editing other fields for your Google Shopping products here in Shopify. You can click the link here underneath the product status and it's going to show you this page here with your products. Now here you can actually click edit Google fields and it's going to show you this window here which allows you to directly edit the MPN as well. You can scroll down and change the Google product category here. It also provides a link to all the Google product categories too. Here you can edit other fields that are important depending on your product category. For example, if you're selling apparel, you do need to put in the age, the gender, the color, material, and sizing details. So keep this in mind depending on your product category. You also have custom labels here, which is for future use. Don't worry about that now. We'll cover that in a future video. Once you've made the required changes, you can then go back to the Google channel and wait until your product status goes to approved for all the products. It usually takes three to five business days to get these approved. Once it's done, you'll be able to confirm that your feed has been set up by going to Google Merchant Center, go to products and then feeds, and then confirm that your feed is now listed here. Once it's set up, you'll often see these sort of product disapprovals, warnings or errors in your Google Merchant Center account under this tab, products, diagnostics. That's normal for your first time. We're gonna spend some time fixing these up. If you don't fix these up, your ads just won't show. It's as simple as that. How do we fix errors and disapprovals? This is the process of reading the error, finding out what caused it, and then fixing it. Now, this is a tedious process, and it takes a little bit of time, and we're not able to cover it in this video. But I've created a full video guide on how we fix our errors and disapprovals. I'll leave a link to that right below. After fixing our disapprovals, we're then ready to create our Google Shopping campaigns in our account. As you can imagine, I also have a full guide on doing that too. I'll leave a link to that right below and I'll see you in the next video. In this video, you're going to learn how to set up your product feed for your Google Shopping campaigns by directly uploading your products into Google Merchant Center. This is by far the quickest and easiest way to set up your product feed and get your campaigns going if you have 
10 products or less. To do this, we log into our Google Merchant Center account by going to merchants.google.com. On the left-hand menu, we're going to click on products. If you haven't tried creating a feed at all yet, it will show you this screen. Just click on add product. If you do already have a feed set up, but you wanna set up with our method today, just go to products and then all products on the left-hand menu and click the plus sign. We'll start by setting our country of sale and language. This is where you're going to be selling to, of course. Make sure you check both boxes for free listings and shopping ads. If you don't see free listings here, it means you have to enable it in Merchant Center programs. I have a video on how to set up your free Google shopping ads. I'll leave a link to that video down below this one. The first section here is the product identifier section. Your product identifier is usually a unique number in a database, depending on your region, that identifies your product in the marketplace. It's also called the GTIN. If you create your own products or you don't have a GTIN, you do have to provide a brand and MPN, a manufacturer part number, instead of a GTIN. We'll go over those in a bit. You can usually get the GTIN from your supplier or by looking at the barcode that's on the product. It's a vital signal to Google and they use this to compare it with other products that have been submitted by other advertisers. You will still have to optimize the feed, but the GTIN does make life easier. And you can see here that there are different types of GTINs, which are the UPC in North America, the EAN in Europe, the JAN in Japan, ISBN for books, ITF14 for multi-packs. You can often search Google too and find someone else selling the same product and check if they have the correct identifier too and use theirs. Like I said, if you don't have the GTIN, you can add in the MPN and the brand. If you want to add the MPN, just click advanced to see the NPN field and you can add it there too. This MPN is the manufacturer part number. It's assigned by the manufacturer and it's unique to every product. Someone searching for a Toyota air filter can search for a specific MPN that's tied to their specific make and model. So it is a good idea to provide it if you can. What if your product doesn't have an MPN? If you don't have a GTIN, it's mandatory to provide a brand and MPN. With the GTIN, you can't make it up if it doesn't exist but you can with the MPN. I recommend just adding in the SKU number if you don't have the MPN. Just be sure to make it unique to every product in your feed. Next, we have the product data. Let's go through these one by one. The ID is the unique identifier for our product in our catalog. Don't reuse the same ID for different products and stay consistent with it. The ID will be the link between the primary and supplemental feed. So it's an important and required product attribute. You don't have to fill in the ID with SEO keywords or anything like that. It's just used as a key identifier for our products. It's often our SKU, but it can honestly be anything. This is going to be helpful for finding your products in your campaigns when you want to edit your bids manually. So I do recommend having it as the product name or something that allows you to easily differentiate between products. Keep in mind that when you have variants, each variant should have a unique ID. Just add that in and let's move on to the next fields. Next, we have the title of our product. The title is the most important product field for Google. Your Google shopping campaigns will perform much better if you spend the time to craft an optimized title. What makes a good title for our product? You don't necessarily want to have the same title that's on your e-commerce store. A lot of stores do this and it's a big mistake. Look at this example here. They're selling this backpack called Lita, but how would Google know what is a Lita? A better title would be a sling backpack in gray, 40 liters. See how that's much more descriptive and also optimized towards what a customer might search. So first we want to do some keyword research and see what your shoppers are searching for when you want to show your product. If you're selling laptops, think about what your potential customer will type in to find the laptop he needs. All right, laptop is probably gonna be in that query. Searching for branded laptops is highly likely so we'll put the brand and the model in that title too. The hard drive capacity is probably pretty important, so we'll cram that in as well. Does it have an external graphics card? Great, we'll put that in too. How about RAM? That's important. The processor type isn't unimportant as well. Wait, screen size, that's important too. One completely made up title might go something like Dell XSP 19 9978 laptop, 13 inches, FHD, Intel i1, 128 gigabytes, SSD, 32 gigabytes of RAM. Do note, Google Shopping won't display the whole title, but the first 35 to 70 characters, depending on the shopping ad layout. So fit the most important things in the first part. The limit for the title is 150 characters. We want to use most of the the characters, not because it might show up to customers, but to let Google know as much information as possible about the product. Even if the 32 gigabytes of RAM doesn't show up in the title that the shopper sees, it's still taken into account by Google. So your laptop might still show up when someone is searching for Dell laptops that have 32 gigabytes of RAM. There isn't a universal formula for the best title, but there are some best practices depending on the niche and the products. With generic products, you wanna put in the brand plus product type plus color plus material plus size. 
So let's say 3M adhesive tape, black, 60 inches by one inch. If you're selling jewelry, one title might be consisted of the brand plus weight, plus shape, plus style, plus material. An example might be something like your brand, 14 carats, yellow, gold, pendant, classic. For apparel, you might use gender plus keyword one, keyword two, plus brand, plus color, plus product type. For anything related to sports, you'd go with brand plus sport plus product type plus color. As you can see, there isn't a universal formula and it will be highly dependent on your niche, what your competitors are using and what shoppers are expecting. There isn't an easy way to A-B test changes, but you can change a single product title, take note when you changed it, monitor impressions, clicks and conversions and compare it to the previous period. It's not a perfect method because you have to take into account a few more things like seasonality, but until Google gives us something better, we can only do it like this. Optimizing titles is so important and we have a blog post just on this. You can check that out with a link that I'll leave below this video. Next, we'll add in the brand of our products. If you're selling branded products, you definitely want to input the correct brand here. If you created your own brand, don't fret. You can just put in your own brand name here. It's a mandatory field and especially important if you're listing a new product on the marketplace. Let's now look at the description. Since you can't show your product in person and let the customer see, feel and wear the product, you have to describe it to them. Arguably, the description product attribute isn't that important for the customer unless you're showing up in the free listings. But Google does take into account what's written here and it helps with properly categorizing and making Google better with understanding what your product is and what problem it solves. The character limit is 5,000 characters. You can see here for this white noise machine, we've kept it pretty simple, descriptive of the product. Of course, you can go into much more detail when you create your description too. Next, we have the landing page link. When someone clicks on the ad, you have to send them somewhere, right? This one is pretty straightforward and this product attribute should contain a link to the product page. Just go to your store, copy the URL, make sure the URL is clean and paste it into this box. Next, we have the image URL, which is one of the most important parts of your ad because it gets the most real estate. Look how much space they take up. Plus look how eye-catching they are. You know that humans are visual creatures and react well to anything that's visual. That's why you need to have impeccable images of your products. Like I said already, people can't feel your product. So be sure to have high quality images ready for them to look at. Keep in mind that you can't have any promotional elements on the image, so no logo, no offers like free shipping or anything like that on the image. Your product should be visible with a white background. You'll see images with models and images that aren't on a white background, but Google seems to be fairly lax about that. As long as the image isn't offensive, doesn't have borders, promotional elements, it will show up. But keep in mind that you can always get a disapproved product if Google wants to enforce their rules. My suggestion would be to check out your competition and niche and see how they're using the main images. For this example here, I'd have a model with the t-shirt on, but have a ready image of the t-shirt alone on a white background, just in case Google decides to disapprove our model image. To add in your image, you can paste a link to your image, which you can get by going to your product page, right clicking, and getting the image link. But I prefer to actually direct upload my image so I can make sure it's of the highest quality. I also recommend adding in additional images as this allows your shopping ads to become a slider like this. Click the advanced button and upload extra images in this section below. Let's now look at price. In some niches, the most important thing here is the price. Pretty straightforward, provide the price and make sure it's the same as what's on your landing page. Shoppers can be drawn by sale prices, but we have a few other product attributes that can take care of this. Make sure to also include the currency right here. This will usually be the currency of the country that you're selling to. If your product is on sale, you can click the advanced button to unhide these fields and add in the sale price here. Always make sure that whatever pricing you put in this section matches exactly what's on your website. If Google crawls your store and finds a discrepancy, they'll just disapprove the product. Your ads will stop for that product and you'll have to fix it before being able to start them all over again. The next thing we'll add is availability. Here we're telling Google our product is in stock or not. If your product is in stock, then just add in stock here. If it's not in stock, then you can set it as out of stock. You can also click the advanced settings here and tell Google what date it will be in stock so that it automatically lists your products in your campaign once they are. Next, we have the detailed product description. You're gonna add in the condition here, whether it's a new, refurbished, or used product. If you have an apparel product or a product with lots of variants, you can also select this toggle here and add in the details for those products. Next, we have our shipping. If you have your shipping settings already set up in Google Merchant Center, then you won't have to add in additional settings here. If you haven't set that up yet in Merchant Center, check out our full video guide on setting that up. I'll leave a link down below. If you do wanna set up individual shipping settings for each individual product, this is where you'd actually add that. Click the advanced button and you'll see 
you all the additional options to go through how you're gonna ship this product. Lastly, I recommend selecting this option called additional product data. Here, you can add a promotion ID. Don't worry about this right now. This is for running promotions in Merchant Center. We'll cover that in another video. You also have custom labels here. We won't use these right now, but keep in mind that they do exist. Underneath that, you then have the product category. This is important. Google uses numbered categories to categorize your products so they can better understand what it is you're selling. Here, we need to go and find the actual product category number for our product. I'm going to leave a link below to this big list of all the Google product categories. Go down below, click that link, open up this list. We now need to search through this list and find the most relevant category for our product. In our example, we're selling white noise machines. So I'm going to search for white noise and there you have it. 4056, it says white noise machines. Depending on your products, you might have to search for a few different keywords until you narrow down exactly what you're selling. Try to get as close as you can. We copy this and then go back and add it into this box. We're now going to click save. We now see this page that says our product is being reviewed by Google. We can then go to all products and our product has now been added and it's going to be reviewed by Google. It will take some time to process and get approved. While this is happening, we'll go ahead and repeat the same process again for our other products. You can see that this gets a little tedious if you have a lot of products. So this method is best if you have less than 10 to 15 products. We have videos on setting up your product feed if you have more products than this. I'll leave a link to those videos and guides down below. In this video, you're going to learn how to set up your product feed for Google Shopping campaigns using the Google Sheets method. Now, before setting up your feed in this way, you're going to need to set up your Google Merchant Center account. This means creating your account, verifying your business, adding your business information, and adding your shipping settings, and your returns and refund settings. Now, I have videos on every single one of these things you need to do to set up your account, I'll leave a link to those videos down below. We have all these videos because we actually made a full free Google Shopping course on our website. These videos are just part of that before this one right here you're watching right now. These videos teach you everything about setting up, optimizing and scaling your Google Shopping campaigns. I'll leave a link to that down below, but go and set that up and then keep going through this video. Let's set up our Google Shopping feed with the Google Sheets method. Let's go. First, log into your Google Merchant Center account by going to merchants.google.com. On the left-hand side, click on products and then click on feeds. If you don't see the feeds in the menu item, just click on create new feed. Click on the plus sign here to create your feed. Change the country of sale to the country you're selling to. Make sure the language is that of the content of the feed. We'll put English here. If you're selling to multiple countries, you can click add to add in the other countries you're also selling to with the same feed. Finally, we'll select our destinations here. This is where our ads are going to show. We have shopping ads, but we also can have free listings as long as they're enabled in Merchant Center programs. I'll leave a link below to a video where we show you how to get your free listing set up. Once done, you'll then see the option to add the new destination here for the free Google shopping listings. Then click continue. Feed name. This doesn't have to be perfect, but good enough for us to reference later on. I like to add in the country code and then Google Sheets feed. So AU Google Sheets feed. Make sure that Google Sheets is selected and click continue. It's then going to ask you to sign in, click allow. It then asks you to either use an existing Google spreadsheet or create a new one. Usually you just use the first one. Generate a new Google spreadsheet from a template. Click create feed, click allow. In this case, my browser actually blocked the pop-up. Make sure to allow pop-ups. I'm gonna try again. It'll then take you to this page here or it'll take you to the feeds page. We can then get back to this page by clicking on the feed and then click access Google Sheet. This is the template that Google provides and where we add our product information. Now it has some columns already there because it's a template and that's great, but we're now going to import our product information and assign it to each column. Getting our product information is gonna be different depending on what e-commerce platform you're using. I'll show you how to do it with Shopify, but you'll have the same process with WooCommerce, Magento, or whatever you're using. Open up your Shopify dashboard, go to products on the left-hand side, click on all products and click export. Click all products, and we want a plain CSV file. Click export products. It's then going to send our product information download to our email address. It may take a short while depending on the size of your product's catalog. Once you receive this email, just click the link. You'll then be able to download and then you wanna open up that file. You'll then download a CSV file. You can open this CSV file in Microsoft Excel but you can also just drag this into Google Drive and Google will convert it to a Google Sheet and let you access it right there. Pretty neat. So I'm going to go to drive.google.com and then drag in the CSV file into Google Drive. I can then right click it and open with Google Sheets. So now we have our product information 
If you're not using Shopify, there's definitely a way to download this information in the same way, depending on what e-commerce platform you're using. You can now follow along with the next steps as we organize this data. First, let's go back to our product feed Google Sheet. We're going to create a new tab and we're going to rename it product info. Go back to the product information download, select everything, copy and paste into your sheet. It now looks something like this. I like to do this to keep it as a separate tab so we have a saved copy of the product information if we ever need to reference it later. I'm I'm just gonna adjust the columns so they're smaller so they don't wrap around. Now we need to match this product info into the columns that Google provided us in the template on the first tab. We need to do this because Google only reads these columns. They don't understand Shopify's columns. So we're going to copy and paste columns over and match them up. It's a bit of a manual process, but it shouldn't take long. Let's first open up the tab, our original template, and delete these first rows here. Now we're going to go back to the information downloaded from Shopify, select the products, and paste them into our sheet. Now what I like to do is select all the rows at the top and change their color to yellow. This is because I want to make sure we can keep track of which ones are required by Google so they don't get mixed up with the Shopify columns. This will make sense in a moment. Now, one by one, we're going to cut and paste these yellow column headings over onto our Shopify column headings, replacing each one. Basically, just follow what I do here. I'm using Command or Control plus X as a shortcut. You can just right click and cut and right click and paste. It's up to you. First, let's replace the ID over the top of the handle over here. Cut and paste. Then title over title, cut and paste. Then description over description, cut and paste. For the link, we're going to click on the next column, right click and insert a new column to the right. We're then going to cut link and paste it at the top. We now need to add in the actual information for our product links. This is the link to the actual product page for these products. Of course, you can go and fetch the product page URLs for your products one by one manually, but I'm also going to show you a formula to speed up this process. Do what I do here, it's gonna save you a lot of time. In the link column, in the first cell, we're gonna add this formula here. You'll find this formula down below this video. Just go and copy it and paste it in, and then we're going to edit a few things. Firstly, Make sure that when you click this bar here, it highlights the ID. If it doesn't, just delete the A8. Make sure the comma is there and then select that cell. Hit enter to save. Then you want to replace the domain name with your actual domain. In my case, it's Sleepy Machines. Of course, if your store is on a different subdomain or you have a different .com, .net, .io, make sure to edit that as well. You now see that this actually creates a link using your domain and the ID. Let's test this out. There we go, it sends us to the product page, so this is working. You can now copy this cell by hitting Command C or Control C, selecting all the other products in your feed, and then pasting. It's now gonna paste that formula so it works for all your products. You see how this is much faster than adding them in manually? It should save you a little bit of time. Next, we'll now add in the condition. Same as before, we're gonna select a column, right click and select insert one column to the left. We're now going to cut and paste our condition into that cell. Now, we just need to go down and add the actual condition of our products. This is very easy. There are only three options here, new, refurbished, or used. So you just go down and paste in what makes sense for your products. All my products are new and yours are probably the same. So just add in new and copy and paste them for all your products. In 99% of cases, you'll have all new products. So you can just type in new and then copy that cell, select the ones below and paste it in to set it for all the products in your feed. Next, let's deal with price. We're going to cut the price column header and paste that over the top of the variant price. You're going to have to scroll to find this cell. Let's do it now. There it is, variant price paste that in. I also wanna move this column to the start of our feed. So just select the whole column, click the top box over the letter, drag all the way to the left. Let's put it after condition. I also wanna go back and find the variant compare at price column and drag that over too. You can hit Command F and search for compare and it's gonna find that price for you. Let's drag that over. We're gonna change the title of that column to sale price. We'll come back to this later, but for now, let's move on. Let's make a new fresh column to the right of sale price. Let's cut and paste availability and put it into that cell there. Availability is a field that tells Google if our product is in stock or not. There are several different values that we could add in here. In stock, out of stock, pre-order, or back order. 
In stock is for when your product is in stock and ready to be sold, people can buy it on your site and you're gonna ship it to them. Out of stock means exactly what it says. You have no inventory for that product. Pre-order is for new products that are not yet released that someone can pre-order. Back order is when your product is out of stock but people can back order to get it when it comes in. Note that if you add back order, you also have to add in a new column here in your feed called availability date and add in the date that it will be in stock. What we'll do now is go down our products and add in the availability. Like with condition, we have to type this in manually. So I'm gonna type in in underscore stock and then copy and paste that down for all my products. You see here, I've only dragged it down for these four products here. There's no pricing for these products here. They're not actual products in our store. This product here does have a price, but it doesn't have a title. That's because it's a variant. So I'm actually gonna just paste down the title. I'm gonna adjust that to something about the variant, which is going to be the color. I'll also drag down the vendor and the description. Next, we have the image link. This is the image that Google will show on our ads. You can use one of the same images that are on your product page, or you can even use a totally different image that's not shown here. In this case, I'm just gonna save time by using our current main image. So I'm going to cut the image link column and paste it over the image source column here. I'll then take that column by clicking this top box here where the letter is and dragging it over with the rest of my columns. Okay, now we have four columns left. Let's right click above the image link column and add in four columns to the right. I'll then cut and paste in these columns into the new columns we've just created. Fantastic. Now we can see that there are no more columns to be added from the template given to us by Google. So let's now select these top rows here and delete them. Okay, now we have all the columns we need. It's now time for us to start optimizing our feed and adding in some of the missing column information. We want to optimize our feed because Google wants to see much better information here than what we copied over from our store. If we want to create the best shopping campaigns possible and make a lot of money, we need to put this time in and set it up right. The first thing we have is the ID. Now, the ID is used as Google's way to track each product. When we do our manual bidding strategy later, it's what we can use to know which products are which, which are important if our profit margins vary between products. I recommend keeping it either as the handle, like we have here, or changing it to something that you can easily and quickly identify. In this case, I'm going to leave it the same here, but you will see for these two variants that the ID is the same. We can't have this. We need to add some sort of differentiator to the end. So I'm gonna change this to white and this one to charcoal. Let's now optimize our product title. Your title is the most important product field for Google. Your Google shopping campaigns will perform much better if you spend the time to craft and optimize title. So what makes a good title for your product? You don't wanna just have the same title as what's on your e-commerce store. A lot of stores do this and it's a big mistake. Look at this example. They're selling a backpack that says Lita, but how does Google know what the heck Lita is? A better title would be Sling Backpack in Gray 40 Liters. See how that's much more descriptive and also optimized towards what a customer might actually search. So first we wanna do some keyword research, see what our shoppers are searching for when you wanna show your product. If you're selling laptops, think about what your potential customer will type in to find the laptop he needs. All right, laptops is probably gonna be in that query. Searching for branded laptops is highly likely, so we'll put in the brand and model in that title too. The hard drive capacity is pretty important, so we'll put that in as well. Plus, does it have an external graphics card? Great, add that in. How about RAM? That's important too. What about the processor type? What about the screen size? One title for a laptop, completely made up and optimized, might be Dell XSP199978, laptop 30 inches, FHD, Intel i1, 128 gigabytes SSD, 32 gigabytes of RAM. Do note, Google won't display the whole title, but the first 35 to 70 characters, depending on the shopping ad layout. So fit the most important things in the first part. The limit for the title is 150 characters. We want to use up most of the characters, not because it might show up to customers, but to let Google know as much information as possible about the product. Even if the 32 gigabytes of RAM doesn't show up in the title that the shoppers see, it's still taken into account and your laptop ad might show up when someone is searching for Dell laptops that have 32 gigabytes of RAM. This isn't a universal formula for the best title, but there are some best practices depending on your niche and products. With generic products, you might want to put in the brand, product type, color, material, and size. So let's say 3M adhesive tape, black, 60 inches by one inch. If you're selling jewelry, one title might be consisted of brand plus weight, plus shape, plus style, plus material. An example might be something like your brand, 14 carats, yellow gold, pendant, classic. For apparel, you might use gender plus keyword plus keyword two plus brand plus color plus product type. For anything related to sports, you'd go with brand, 
plus sport, plus product type, plus color. As you can see, there isn't a universal formula and it will highly depend on your niche, what your competitors are using and what shoppers are expecting. There isn't an easy way to A-B test changes, but you can change a single product title, take note of when you changed it and monitor impressions, clicks and conversions to compare it to the previous period. It's not a perfect method because you have to take into account a few more things like seasonality, but until Google gives us something better, we can do it like this. Optimizing titles is so important and we have a whole blog post just on this. You can check it out with a link I'll leave below this video. For this title here, I'm going to add in something different than a snooze go baby. Of course, this is actually a white noise machine. So let's make that clear. This is an example I've just created for this white noise machine. I've got the brand, what people are actually searching, which is white noise machine. People are often searching for a white noise machine that uses a real fan and not an audio recording. So I've added that in here to the title. Sometimes people are looking for Bluetooth as well as being travel friendly. So I'm targeting these keywords by putting that in my title. You need to do this for each of your individual products. Next, let's optimize our description. What we'll do now is clean out our description of any HTML code that might be there. This is what this is right here. Even though Google says they'll clean it up, I don't take chances. I'll clean it myself using a tool like HTML Cleaner. I'll leave a link below to this tool. We're just going to paste in the description for the product and then copy the clean part on the left. Paste that back in and press enter. In terms of the content of the description, usually I'll just have this as just what's on the website as long as it's well descriptive. I do have a video that goes deeper into writing descriptions for your website and product page. I'll leave a link to that below. The next thing I'm going to optimize is the GTIN. This is your product identifier and it's a unique number in a database, depending on your region that identifies your products in the marketplace. If you create your own products and don't have a GTIN, you can provide a brand and manufacturer part number, MPN, instead of a GTIN. We'll go over those in a bit. You can often get the GTIN from your supplier or by looking at the barcode that's on the product. It's a vital signal to Google since they will know exactly which product is provided. You'll still have to optimize your feed, but it's gonna make it a bit easier. I don't know the GTIN for this product, so I'm gonna leave it blank. This does mean that I need to make sure the NPN and the brand are filled in. Let's look at the NPN right now. The NPN is the manufacturer part number and it's assigned by the manufacturer and it's unique to every product. Someone that's searching for a Toyota air filter can search for a specific NPN that's tied to their specific make and model. So it is a good idea to provide it if you can. Maybe you'll ask, but what if my product doesn't have an NPN? If you don't have a GTIN, it's mandatory to provide a brand and NPN. But if you don't have a GTIN and you don't know an official NPN, you can make it up. Just be sure to make it unique to every product in your feed. Though if you do have a GTIN, the NPN is an optional field. I do recommend adding it if you can, otherwise leave it blank. Because I don't have a GTIN, let's add in one now. I don't know the actual NPN number, so I'm just gonna copy over the SKU or the ID and use that instead. I'm gonna paste that down for all my products. Next, we'll add in the brand of our products. This is going to be the actual brand brand of the product. For example, if you're selling Nike sneakers, it would be Nike. If you're selling your own products and you are the brand, add in your brand name here instead. I'm going to add in Snooze because that's the brand of the products I'm selling. Next, we have the Google product category. This column is for us to put in the Google product category number for each product. Google has their own big list of categories that can help them figure out what your product is. We need to check the list for the most relevant product category for our product and then paste in the code into the cell for each of the products. To find this list here, I'll leave a link down below this video, so go check that out. What you need to do is go through this list and search for the most relevant product category for your products. Of course, don't go through it one by one. Hit Command F or Control F and search through with a few keywords to find what's most relevant. We're selling a white noise machine, so let's search for that. Once I search for white noise, it comes up with white noise machines as a sleeping aid 4056. I'm going to copy this number here, go back to my feed and paste that into the Google products category column. Copy and paste that down because all the products are from the same product category. Lastly, I wanna talk about our price and the sale price for our products. Price is the original price of the product and sale price is for when we are selling the product at a discount. It looks like this in our actual shopping ads. Your price needs to be in the format like this, with the price first and then the currency afterwards. If you don't do this, your product will just get disapproved and you'll just have to fix it later anyway. To find a list of all the currency labels, check below this video. I'm going to add the currency to all the prices of my products in my feed. Of course, if you're selling in US dollars, you put USD. The sale price is optional, but if you have the product marked down like this on your site, you need to fix up this price in your feed too. This is how you do it. Make sure you keep the price as the original price so it will always be the higher of the two. If you don't have a sale on, just keep it as the price. But if you do have a sale on, 
change sale price to the new sale price. So if I sell this one for $39.99, I would change the sale price to $39.99 with the currency. If you have any products on sale, make sure to update them in this same manner. Now, there can be some other fields that you might need to add in depending on what products you're selling. For example, if you're selling apparel, you need to add in things like the size and gender of your products. I'll leave a link below to a guide on adding in these extra compulsory fields and you'll need to tailor your feed for your own store if you're in one of these other categories. It's not hard, but it just takes a little bit of extra time. Once that's now complete, we can delete these other unused columns here to the right and finish our feed. It should look like this. We now go back to Google Merchant Center, go to products, feeds, and click on the fetch now button. Here we see our Google Sheets feed, click fetch now. Google is then going to crawl our feed and check if we did everything right. Almost always we'll see some products get disapprovals, warnings, or errors. Don't worry, this is normal. We now need to go through the process of fixing these disapprovals. To learn exactly how we do this, I'm gonna share a video down below showing you how we fix disapprovals in Google Merchant Center. So go check below to link to that lesson. In this video, you're going to learn how to fix product disapprovals in Google Merchant Center. You log into your Google Merchant Center account and you see this. Now, there are dozens and dozens of reasons why your products could have been disapproved as it depends on your store and your setup. This means that your disapprovals are going to be unique. I'm going to show you our process for fixing disapprovals and if you have a unique disapproval, how to go and figure out how you can fix your one. First, what are disapprovals and why can't Google just approve our products? Well, Google requires that anyone that wants to run Google Shopping campaigns meets a certain standard in their feed, their store, and their Google Merchant Center account. If they didn't have a way to verify and maintain this standard in your product feed and Google Merchant Center account, then we'd start seeing shopping results that look like this. So Google created Google Merchant Center, which is kind of like the gatekeeper for your products before they go onto Google Shopping. This means that every single store owner has to go through what you're going through now, fixing up the product disapprovals to make sure they're of a high quality to show on Google Shopping results. So all these disapprovals mean in your account is that Google isn't approving of something you're doing in your feed. So what's the process of fixing a disapproval? One, identify what the disapproval is. Two, learn what specific cause this disapproval and how you would fix it. Three, make changes to your feed and your store, refetch your feed and see if Google approves it. You can refetch your feed at any time by going to products, feed, and then reprocess or refetch feed. Four, if it's still disapproved, repeat. This is a troubleshooting process and I know it can be really frustrating. So we're going to go over the most common disapprovals in this video and how to fix them, but we have a full guide that goes into great detail for every single disapproval that exists. Here's what that looks like. It's our ultimate resource for fixing disapprovals. For now, I'm going to go over the most common disapprovals and how to fix them. Number one, not having your website claimed and verified. This disapproval is when you haven't actually claimed or verified your website in the Google Merchant Center business settings. This is a very easy fix. Just go to your business settings and complete the verification process. Now, I have a video that shows you exactly how to complete this process in less than five minutes. I'll leave a link to that down below. The next common error is not having your shipping settings set up correctly. This error occurs when you haven't added your shipping settings in the Google Merchant Center shipping settings section or in your product feed. This is an easy fix. Just make sure that your shipping settings match how you actually ship to your customers and what's on your website and then refetch the feed. I have a full video on how to set up your shipping settings. I'll leave a link to that down below. The next error you might get is one that says pending initial review. You'll sometimes see this error when you first submit your products into Google Merchant Center. This means that Google is still crawling your feed and your store to make sure that everything is okay. There's nothing you can do here except wait. I usually check the feed every single day and usually this disapproval is cleared up within about three days. If not, try re fetching the feed. Next, we have a more generic violation of the Google Shopping Ads policies. This is a generic disapproval that Google gives you when you're violating one of Google's policies. We might see this when working with sensitive niches like supplements or things like that. This is a tough one. You'll need to go through all of Google's policies and see if any of your products violate them. I'll usually go through and comb the policies to see if I can find what's causing it 
If not, I'll get in touch with Google to see if they can tell me more about what's causing this disapproval. You can contact Google support by going to the help button in Google Merchant Center. We also have a page on our website that has all the Google Ads support numbers. You can often call and speak to someone to get more information about your disapproval. I'll leave a link to that page down below. Next, we have an error for an unavailable mobile or desktop landing page. This error occurs when Google tries to crawl your website and they can't access a page. Maybe there was some sort of weird redirect error with your site, or maybe your website isn't live yet. Make sure that you can access your store from anywhere in the world and you don't need to be logged into your Shopify dashboard. Google's disapproving you here because they think you're not providing a great user experience. Sometimes we'll see this error and we'll just refetch the feed and then it goes away. Maybe because Google's crawlers thought it wasn't working, but with the second fetch of the feed, they realized it was, so it cleared up that disapproval. Next, we have promotional overlay on the image. This error occurs when Google thinks you've got some sort of promotional text or branding on your product image. Google wants your product images to just be the product on a simple background. Now, as you may have also found, being creative with your product images can actually lead to a better click-through rates. So when you test out adding branding or promotional text, it can get these disapproved. There are a few ways to fix this error. I've got a full video guide on how to do this. I'll leave a link to that down below. Next, we have the product disapproval of the invalid value availability. This error happens when there's a mismatch between what's in your feed and what's in your store in terms of availability of your products. For example, the product feed says the products are in stock, but a customer goes to the website and it says out of stock. Google sees this as a poor user experience, so they'll disapprove your product until you fix this. Just make sure that your feed's always up to date. They're the top disapprovals we see and how to fix them. As you can see, each one requires a unique approach depending on the error and also how you've set up your feed and your Google Merchant Center account. If you're watching this and you have a disapproval that's completely different from the ones I've spoken about, that's okay. We've created this full ultimate disapproval guide that goes through each error possible and shows you how to fix them. I'll leave a link to that down below so you can start working through fixing all your disapprovals and get your Google Shopping campaigns up and running. I'll see you guys in the next video. What's the difference between a standard shopping campaign and a smart shopping campaign? When you set up a new shopping campaign, Google gives you an option on its type. Smart shopping or standard shopping? And Google really wants you to pick smart shopping. They make it the default first choice and describe it with enticing terms such as maximizing your conversion value, effortless optimization, broader presence, it then seems to describe standard shopping as mundanely as possible. What's going on here? Is smart shopping the intelligent choice used by hip PPC managers that understand and embrace the future? Is standard shopping the run of the mill choice used by unimaginative business owners still clinging to ancient technologies? Well, for better or for worse, Google has been driving its platform towards more and more automation for years now. It strongly and openly believes that machine learning is superior to humans in almost every area. And they've steadily removed the strict controls and access to data that people have had for years. There are many examples of this over the past five years, including hiding about a third of all search query data, making it much more difficult to know what people are searching before finding our ads, radically loosening how keyword match types work, favoring their algorithms over your strict control over search query targeting, removing ad positions and reported data, making it impossible to know how you're positioning your ads on the page. In 2016, Google's CEO announced we would soon be living in an AI first world and that Google was going to become an AI first company. We've certainly seen this rolled out in Google Ads. While this lesson isn't about the broader subject of AI and machine learning on ads, I bring up the concept because nowhere else is it more highlighted than the difference between standard shopping campaigns and smart shopping campaigns. For the advertiser, in a nutshell, it's control and access to data over no control and no access to data. Let's look at standard shopping first. When you set up a standard shopping campaign, you control the bids you want to set per product, the locations you want to advertise in, the devices you want to appear on, 
the audiences you want to observe and target, and which networks you want to show on. Google search page and the partner networks, YouTube, Gmail, and Discover. You can also review the search queries that are triggering your ads, a crucial part of your optimization process. With smart shopping, you control locations. And Google reluctantly only made that allowance for advertisers recently. Smart shopping is Google's trust us option. Don't worry about the audience or network. Don't worry about the bids or scheduling. Don't worry about all that data you use to depend on for optimizations and growth for your business. We don't wanna share that with you because you're going to ask too many questions. Google's got it from here. Just make sure that your credit card is up to date. The ads may appear anywhere Google feels they should. On Google's main page, Google's shopping page, YouTube, Gmail, various search partners. So that's the difference between standard shopping and smart shopping from an advertiser's perspective. But what about from a business perspective? Well, in the two years or more that smart shopping has been available, my team and I have been testing it extensively. And what we've found is that it works brilliantly sometimes. Other times it wastes your crucial budget and never finds a way to deliver. What we've discovered is that generally standard shopping campaigns work better when your products are more unique or when the search terms to find your products are more unique. It's better for brand advertising, something we'll talk about in a future video. And it's better when your goals are more complex than simple ROAS numbers. Inversely, smart shopping campaigns generally tend to work better when your products are commonly found in the marketplace. You're not concerned about separating brand traffic from non-brand traffic. And you simply want Google's machine learning to target a specific ROAS. That's a simplified and general way we've used to approach smart shopping and standard shopping campaigns. And generally for a fresh account that doesn't have any conversion data at all, you'll want to start with standard shopping campaigns. That's because you're likely to make more informed decisions than the machine learning early on. However, once your account has built up a decent amount of conversion data, you'll want to test out smart shopping to see how it performs for your store. Keep in mind that smart shopping campaigns always get priority in your Google account. So traffic to the standard shopping campaign will dry up immediately. Unfortunately, you can't test them side by side. We'll wrap this up with a quote from Frederick Valais, an ex-Google employee who wrote the book, Digital Marketing in an AI World. It's for you to figure out if a smart campaign is really the way to go in a specific situation. And the answer is sometimes no. Well-managed but more manual campaign types built on long-standing optimization principles frequently still work more effectively. In this video, you're going to learn about the structure of Google Shopping campaigns. Knowing how Google Shopping campaigns work and their structure is going to better help you set them up optimize them and scale them. Having an organized and well set up campaign structure gives you a strong foundation for optimization and growth. It also saves you time in the long run by having everything organized. Let's start with how campaign structures look starting at the account level. This is the hierarchy that you will grow familiar with over time. Your account contains multiple shopping campaigns and within those shopping campaigns, you have ad groups. Ad groups then contain product groups, which are comprised of your individual products. This structure allows you to organize your products into themes and groups, which is far easier to manage. It also allows you to see which of your products or categories are performing well or not. For example, if you sell games, your structure could look like this. Here we see the hierarchical structure of your catalog with campaigns divided by top categories, video games and board games. And within the board games campaign, the ad groups are divided between card, trivia and strategy. And within strategy, we have our product groups of chess, backgammon and the classics. Finally, you have the products themselves. Setting up a structure like this lets you more easily set finer goals. It allows you to quickly see performance patterns as it relates to stock. For example, if you happen to make less money on Monopoly than Risk, 
then you can bid less on Monopoly. Or if the backgammon ad group is seeing a lower conversion rate than the rest of your ad groups, you can take a deep dive into your funnel to see what's causing the issue. Or if the video games campaign is seeing a higher bounce rate than the board games campaign, perhaps your site has poor navigation for that section. The point I'm illustrating here is that a well thought out campaign structure better helps you identify problems and opportunities. In this video here, you're going to learn how to set up your Google Shopping campaign in your Google Ads account. Before doing what's in this video, you're going to need to have set up your product feed and your Google Merchant Center account. If you haven't done this or you have no idea what I'm talking about, go to the description. I'll leave a link to the videos on how to set up your product feed and your Google Merchant Center account. They'll teach you everything you need to know before going through the rest of this video. Okay, first open up our Google Ads account. If you haven't created a Google Ads account yet, make sure to go to ads.google.com and go through the steps of creating an account. I do have a video that shows you how to create a Google Ads account. I'll leave a link to that down below. Once we're looking at the Google Ads dashboard, I wanna to go to all campaigns, campaigns, and be viewing all my campaigns here. I'm then going to click this button here and go new campaign. On this page, you'll be asked for the objective of your campaign. This is Google's method of providing a guided setup to make it easier for people that don't know very much. At this point and with my videos, you should know a whole lot more than other advertisers out there. So we're going to set up our campaign without a goal and I'm gonna show you exactly what we're gonna do. It's going to ask for our campaign type. I'm going to click on shopping. It's then going to ask us about our conversion goals. If you haven't yet set up your conversion tracking for Google Ads, I recommend doing that right now. I've got a whole video on how to set this up with analytics for your Shopify store. Check the link down below. Next, we'll see that Google Merchant Center is connected to Google Ads and our feed is coming through. Select the country where you're gonna be selling these products. If you wanna create this shopping campaign for the US, then make sure the US is there. Here, we see the options for a smart shopping campaign or a standard campaign. We're going to be setting up a standard campaign. This is exactly what I recommend. If you go through our free Google Shopping course, I show you how to set this up, optimize and scale these campaigns. So check out those videos too, but let's click this for now and then click continue. You're now going to be asked to name your campaign. Honestly, you can't go wrong with a name as long as it's as descriptive enough for you to remember what the campaign is. In this example, I want to set up a campaign for men's wallets. So I like to put my initials at the start, then add the campaign type, then finish with what products are being sold. There are reasons that I do this. My initials are to indicate that I created it, which can be useful if you have multiple people accessing the account. The campaign type is so that I know what it is quickly and I can reference it in some advanced scripts that we'll go over in a future video. And of course, it's always good to know the products that are being sold from the campaign, but there really is no right or wrong way to name your campaigns as long as it works for you. Moving on, we now have additional settings. I don't see these options used very often, but let's take a look at them. The inventory filter allows you to limit which products are accessible to the campaign. For example, I could select custom label zero because I know I've applied my product categories to this field when I set up the feed. And then I can select wallets. I can further expand the filter by clicking and here and then select custom label one to which I've applied my product colors. So I can make sure that this campaign only has black wallets in it. This is just one example. It's much more advanced, but if it's your first time setting up a shopping campaign, I don't recommend doing this at all. Just keep this in mind for future use. Next, we'll see local products. If you have a local product feed that you want to include in the campaign, then this is where you do it. For most of you guys watching this right now, this isn't gonna be very relevant. Next, we have campaign URL options, which is an advanced topic related to tracking. If you need to apply settings to your campaign, you can always do it after the campaign is set up. So let's skip this. It's much more advanced and not necessary for most of you guys out there. Okay, next we have bidding. You're shown here different options for your bidding strategy one manual and two automated. The manual CPC option tells Google that you will set and adjust your own bids. You can also complement the manual CPC with Google's enticingly named enhanced CPC, also known as eCPC. What this means is that if you bid say $1, but Google thinks that your ad has a good chance of leading to a sale, then it might raise the bid to $2. However, if Google thinks the likelihood of the sale is relatively poor, then it might lower the bid to say, 
10 cents. Overall, Google will try to average out to your manually input bid of $1 over time though. You can choose for Google to optimize for conversions, simply mean to getting as many orders as possible regardless of the revenue, or you can select optimize for conversion value, meaning to get as much revenue as possible. If you have products that vary greatly in price, then this does make a difference. Looking at the automated bidding strategies, first we have target ROAS. This setting asks Google to shoot for a return on ad spend that you set. If you calculated your breakeven ROAS in one of the previous videos that I've made, you'll have an idea of what to put here. It can be a balancing act. If you shoot too high, Google's algorithms will bring very little activity as it doesn't think the traffic is likely going to lead to the goal. And of course, you don't want to shoot too low and lose money. It's a case by case basis and you'll have to decide for yourself and don't worry, you can adjust it later. Finally, we have the maximize clicks option. The explanation is the name here. You're simply asking Google to send you as much traffic as possible. This often isn't a great choice because you really do want to have quality traffic for your store. But where it can be useful is if you're seeking exposure for your site and your products. Perhaps you're looking to show your brand to as many people as as possible. Now, in the rest of the videos in my free course, which this video is a part of, we show you how to do everything on a manual basis. We recommend setting it with manual CPC, with enhanced CPC, optimizing your campaign until you have 50 to 100 conversions, and then testing out a target ROAS strategy. So let's keep this as manual CPC for now with the enhanced CPC enabled. I'm also going to adjust this to optimize for conversion value. Next, we have the budget. I'm going to start here with about $50 per day. This really depends on your goals. At the start of your campaign, I recommend setting it to between $30 to $50 per day. Depending on how much you pay for clicks, this is going to limit the volume of clicks you get per day. If you set it for something like two to 500, you're going to get a lot of clicks. And as you're learning how to optimize your campaigns, there's just going to be too much data for you to optimize and you're going to actually waste a lot of money. I recommend capping your budgets $30 to $50 per day, get your campaigns profitable, and then increase your budgets. Now we see campaign priority. You only want to use this when you have multiple campaigns showing the same products in the same locations. Now, this is an advanced strategy that I only suggest when you're feeling more comfortable and familiar with shopping ads. A big mistake that beginners make is they try and do a multi-campaign structure from the start. This spreads out your traffic across multiple campaigns, so you have to spend a lot more money to actually optimize. I recommend starting with one campaign on manual, follow my videos, optimize from there, and then only explore other strategies once you dial in that first campaign. Keep this as default right now. If you only have one shopping campaign, this setting does nothing. So keep it on default. Moving on to the targeting section, we see the additional networks that Google has us appearing in by default. While there's no one size fits all advice to give here, I will tell you that most professionals choose to uncheck both of these boxes. The performance and return are often quite low relative to simply showing your ads on Google. The caveat here is that if you're thinking of this campaign as branding and simply want to be seen for as many people as possible. I've done hundreds of audits on campaigns showing on other networks and only once have I ever seen a network outperform Google. So at the start, when you're just trying to get profitable, turn these off. Next, we have this section for devices. For some reason, Google doesn't allow us to change anything here. However, if you decide to adjust your bids or completely exclude a device such as mobile phone, tablets, or computers, you can do that after the campaign setup. We have a full video on doing bidding adjustments. I'll leave a link to that video down below. Next, we have locations, and we see the country we selected at the start here as the default. Opening up the location options, there are target and exclude settings. Something you absolutely want to remember is not to use the default here. Change your target setting to presence, people in or regularly in your target locations. This restricts Google to only showing your ads in the country you're actually targeting. Moving on, you can set the start and end dates for your campaign. If you only want to let the campaign run for a selected period, this is where you set it up. Next, Google wants you to insert your first ad group name to get started. Since I want to start with my most popular wallet first, I'm going to call this Billford Wallets. Keep in mind that at the beginning, all the products that are accessible to this campaign will automatically be live in this ad group and you'll be able to narrow them down as you like after creating the campaign itself. We're gonna be doing this in the next video anyway, link is gonna be below. And finally, we have the cost per click bid that you want to set. A typical starting point is $1, but you'll soon learn best what bid is right for you. This is setting the default bid that will be applied to your products at the start. You can then adjust those bids in the campaign. We have a full video on optimizing the bidding for your manual shopping campaign. That's gonna be below, and it's one of the next videos in our free course. Once you're ready, click create campaign, and you're now live. That's how we create our Google Shopping campaign. In the next video, we're going to be diving deeper into that campaign to learn how to segment our products so we can do our bidding process. 
In this video, you're going to learn how to segment your products in your Google Shopping campaign. If you haven't created your Google Shopping campaign yet, you need to do that first. You also need to create your Google Merchant Center account and your product feed. I have videos showing you how to do every single thing to get up to this point here. I'll leave them down below, so check the description. Why segment our products? Segmenting our products into ad groups and product groups improves our targeting and helps with optimizations later on. Let's go into our Google Shopping campaign and find the ad group that we created. Here under product groups, we see the product group that we created. It contains everything in your feed. We want to subdivide this product group, so we'll mouse over the name of it and Google displays a plus sign. Clicking it brings us here where we can sort through the products based on select information Google has from our feed. Brand will show us all the brands we have entered into the brand fields, for example. Item IDs show us every product because every product must have a unique item ID. Google also shows you the title right after the item ID, which is helpful if you want to use this search function here to find certain products. Condition simply divides products based on how they're new, used, or refurbished. You may remember that product type is an optional field that Google gives us to create our own categories. Here's where that pays off because you can now use that to easily subdivide between your categories here. If it's your first campaign, this is not entirely necessary. That's more for advanced users. Channel is for differentiating between local imagery and online. Channel exclusivity segment products by availability in one of the channels or both. We're not covering local ads in this video or in our free shopping course, but I'll include some links down below if you'd like to explore that more. And finally, we have custom labels. These are of course, are something that you can set up in your product feed and they're a fantastic way to further sort and segment your products. For example, if you're selling t-shirts and you know that certain colors are more in demand than others, you can have a custom label for colors. By subdividing the more popular colors out to their own product groups, you can make sure that they get higher bids. As another example, say you've labeled in your feed which products are high margin and which are low margin. You may want to segment out the low margin products so that you can bid lower on them than the rest of the products. There are a million ways to use these custom labels for smart product segmentation, and you'll need to think of the right way to do it for your products. If you recall, we created this ad group to target wallets. For this campaign here, because we're doing manual bidding on the product level, we're going to select by item ID, select all of the products by clicking this box here, scroll down to make sure that all the products have been selected and then click continue to edit bids. It's now going to show this page here. If you're just setting up your campaign, I recommend keeping the bids at the same level unless there are huge differences between your products. For example, you're selling a product for $5 and also a product for $500. You don't wanna bid the same and you should adjust your bids right now. Once confirmed, click save. We now see that we have our product groups split out for each of our products. If we want, we can now edit the bids individually for each product based on performance. We have a full video showing our complete strategy, including the template we use to actually manage these bids once we get some clicks and some conversions. That is a key part of optimizing and scaling your campaigns to at least 50 to 100 conversions per month. I'll leave a link down below. It's definitely recommended watching for everyone watching this video. Segmenting your products starts at the campaign level, then to the ad group level, then to the product group level, and then to product groups within product groups. There's a reason that Google gives you the ability to set up the structure like this. And that's because you know your catalog better than anybody. You can choose to segment your products according to category, best sellers, profit margins, attributes like color and size, price points, and even down to the individual product level. This organization helps you immensely as you review the data and start making optimizations. Now that we've taken the time to create the structure, take the time to outline how you're going to conduct your product segmentation. Map it out on a piece of paper or in a document. This planning will pay off for you in months to come. So do you feel like you're ready to go live with your campaign? In the next video, we're going to go through our pre-launch checklist and get everything ready to launch. In this video, you're going to learn the things you need to do before launching your Google Shopping campaign, all in our pre-launch checklist. You can access this checklist below this video so you can have it with you as you launch your own campaign. We use this checklist to make sure that our campaigns are ready for maximum profits and to avoid 
wasting money on silly mistakes. Here are the questions you need to ask yourself as part of your pre-launch check. One, do I know what my competitors are doing right now? You should do deep market research into your competitors and other people in your space. You should know how they're advertising, what their pricing is compared to yours, what their product looks like, any promotions they're running, and so on. This helps you make sure your store and whole funnel is as competitive as possible. Shoppers will be comparing your store to your competitors and you wanna make sure that you have the best chance at winning their business. What is my break-even ROAS? Everything hinges on Google Shopping being profitable. Knowing this number will tell you if you're profitable and inform you for upcoming optimizations. If you haven't gone through our video on calculating your profits and your break-even ROAS, go through that right now. I'll leave a link down below. The next thing you need to ask is, is my website compliant? Millions of businesses are banned on Google Ads and Google Merchant Center every single year. Many for simple mistakes that could have easily been prevented. Businesses come to my team all the time after being banned and I'll tell you, they're stressed out. We've helped them get their suspensions removed, but wouldn't it be great to not have this happen in the first place? From your contact pages all the way to your policy pages, make sure you go through everything we cover in our compliance video to make sure you don't get suspended. If you haven't gone through that lesson on making sure your website is compliant, go through it right now. I'll leave a link down below this video. The next question to ask yourself is, have I made a test purchase on my site? In online marketing, I can't think of anything more tragic than spending thousands of dollars on your advertising only to find out that your checkout isn't working. Yes, I've seen this happen. That's why I'm including it right here. Make sure you test out your full funnel from the moment someone sees your product page all the way to the thank you page after the checkout. The next question is, have I set up conversion tracking? Now, this can be an easy thing to miss if you're new to Google Ads. Properly set up conversion tracking will let you see if your campaign is working. It's as simple as that. You should be tracking your orders and your revenue amounts. If you haven't set this up already with Google Ads, go through my full video walkthrough. I'll leave a link down below. The next thing you want to check is are your Google Merchant Center settings set up correctly? This includes everything we've covered, such as your shipping and return settings, your tax settings, your business information settings. We also want to make sure that none of our products have diagnostics issues. And finally, we want to make sure that our feeds are set up and active. You wouldn't have been able to set up your shopping campaign unless your feed was set up and active. But what about any supplementary feeds, any promotional feeds, Feeds. And what about your reviews feeds? These are a bit more advanced and we go through these in our free Google Shopping course in the later lessons. I'll leave a link to those lessons down below so you can check them out if you're interested. And last but not least, do one more pass of your Google Shopping campaign. Does your structure make sense? Are your audiences set up? Are you targeting the right locations? Okay, great. We're now ready to launch. In this video, you're going to learn how we optimize Google Shopping campaigns and turn campaigns like this into campaigns like this. First, we're going to answer some important questions about optimizing and scaling, and then we're going to get into the strategies. Okay, what is optimizing and why do we do it? If you want to get awesome results with your Google Shopping campaigns, they don't just happen overnight. They also don't happen without you doing the work. The optimization process involves regularly looking at your data and making incremental changes to move it in the right direction. Imagine that you're a sculptor that's creating a beautiful masterpiece. We make changes, Step back and look, see how that affected the results and then get back in and make more changes until we make more and more profits from our campaign. This takes time and patience and requires a lot of experience, but you will get better over time. This brings me to my next question. How long does it take to get results? This depends on a number of factors, including the conversion rate of your store, the market, the search volume of the traffic, and the competitors also competing in the market. Usually we see that Google Ads is a long-term game with consistent growth 
over time. The cool thing about Google Shopping campaigns is that as long as you're consistent and working on the right things, we can build what we call a sales generating machine. Imagine if you had a traffic source like this, ticking over every single month, bringing you more sales and more profits for your store. Well, it takes work. It's what we do here and that's what you're going to learn in this Google Shopping course. But in terms of general timeline, here's what you can expect. It takes a few days to get your first impressions and your first clicks to trickle through. You'll usually start to see conversions in the first one to two weeks at least. And usually we break even in one to two months, if not sooner than that. Then it's just consistently balancing the profitability and sales volume as we grow the account. Every account is going to be different, but as long as you keep working on it with profit-driven optimizations, it should move in the right direction. So what are the optimizations we make? We'll go through each optimization here in this video. I'll also leave links to full video guides on how to do each optimization down below this video. We'll also have an optimization checklist and schedule that you can use to follow to know what changes to make and when to make them. Of course, the link for that is down below as well. The first big optimization you want to be making is the campaign bidding strategy. This is the actual bidding setting for your campaign. So many people get this wrong. It's insane. You need to give Google the right goal and direction for your campaign, especially at the start when you have zero conversions. There are different bidding strategies to use depending on the situation. You have manual bidding, enhanced CPC, target ROAS, maximize clicks, and a few others. Each one has a different use case, and if you're going to optimize well, you need to know what the use case is and what suits your account right now. There's a lot to go into in terms of the bidding strategy you choose for your campaign. I have a full video diving into all the different strategies and when to use each one. I'll leave a link to that video down below. Next, we have manual bidding optimizations. Manual bidding optimizations are when you bid on the product level for the products in your Google Shopping campaign. You're not relying on Google to do this for you. You take the reins and control and bid based on the profitability of each individual product. For a new campaign, this is one of the most important things you should be doing to get that campaign off the ground and profitable as soon as possible. At the start, you want to use this strategy to give Google the right direction and to focus on the products that are doing well. This is why we use a manual bidding strategy and we have a full template and video guide to show you how we do this for all the stores we work with. I'll leave a link to that guide down below. It goes super granular into your bidding and shows you how to move the algorithm in the right direction. Next, we have our bidding adjustments like location, time of day, and devices. On top of our regular bidding optimizations, our bidding adjustments allow us to adjust our bids based on other factors. This includes the device the user is using, where they're located, the time of the day, and the day of the week. This allows us to get more granular with our bidding based on what's actually profitable. We could say we want to pay more for someone that's located in Los Angeles at 4 p.m on a Sunday. Why would we do this? Because we can see from the data that a user that matches these characteristics is much more likely to buy from us and is a much more profitable click. By adding a bidding adjustment with these sort of characteristics, we're telling Google, hey, we want more of these clicks, so show us higher in the search results when someone matches those characteristics. Even though our cost is going to increase, the increased volume of sales is going to outweigh this with more profits. This is what we're aiming for and we have a full lesson on how to do this. I'll leave a link to that down below. Next, we have negative keyword mining. Adding negative keywords to your shopping campaign allows you to tell Google what searches you don't want to show for. For example, we might start running our shopping campaign and see that Google keeps showing our products to people that are looking for something entirely different. For example, maybe we're selling power drills, but our campaign keeps showing for people that are searching for power drill toys. Obviously, we don't wanna sell power drills to someone searching for a toy about a power drill. So we can add toy as a negative keyword for that campaign and stop these searches from triggering our shopping ads. We find these searches that we want to add as negative keywords by looking at our search terms report in our shopping campaign. Again, a lot of strategy goes into this and there are various ways that we can find these negative keywords. I'll leave a link to our full guide down below. Next, we have product feed optimizations. Lastly, but definitely not least, 
optimizing your product feed is one of the most useful and highly forgotten ways to optimize your shopping campaigns. This means adjusting your feed based on what people are actually searching for so you can better guide the algorithm in the right direction and show for more profitable searches. Most people set up their feed at the start, they do a mediocre job and they never check it ever again. Having an optimized product feed is the foundation of a well-optimized and profitable Google Shopping campaign. If you're wondering why your campaign isn't doing well, go check out the full lesson on optimizing your product feed I'll leave a link to that down below this video. So now that we know what optimizations we should be making, how often do we do them? And how do we keep track of these optimizations that we're making? Well, we've created a checklist and schedule that you can use for your own account. It shows you what changes to make and when to make them. You need to make these changes regularly, but once you get into a good rhythm, you'll get used to it. I have a full lesson that shows you how to use this checklist and schedule I'll leave a link to that guide down below. All right, guys, that's an overview of how we optimize our Google Shopping campaigns. I'll see you in the next video. In this video, you're going to learn how to set up the recommended metrics and columns for your Google Shopping campaign. We need to do this before we can optimize our Google Shopping campaign so that we can see the metrics that matter right there in our account. Google doesn't show these metrics by default and we need to unhide them. So we're going to add these as custom columns so you can see them for your campaigns, your ad groups, your product groups, and everywhere else in your account. I'll also teach you how to set up custom columns in your account. This allows you to add formulas to play with the metrics and show you exactly how much profit your campaign has generated. To do this, open up your Google Ads account by going to ads.google.com. Make sure you're at the campaign level by going to all campaigns and then campaigns on the left-hand menu. Click columns, click modify columns. Now we can see all the custom column selectors and modify what our columns look like. Let's remove all the current columns already by clicking the X symbols for these metrics on the right. Also deselect this option here, show recommended columns in your tables. Click, turn it off. Now that we are starting from scratch, we can choose the right metrics and have them in the right order. Follow what I do and add in these metrics here to use the same setup that I like to use when using Google Ads for e-commerce. Click on performance. Now we'll click in this exact order. Impressions, clicks, CTR, average CPC, and cost. So now the metrics on the right should look like this. Got it? Okay, let's keep going. Close performance and open up conversions. Now we'll click conversions, conversion value, conversion rate, cost per conversions, conversion value divided by cost. Now your metrics on the right hand side should look like this. Okay, let's now close conversions and open up competitive metrics. Let's now click search impression share search lost is rank and search lost is budget you can now close competitive metrics now double check the metrics on the right and they should list out in this order if you couldn't find some metrics there it's probably because you're not looking at your campaigns on the campaign level you might be seeing them on the product level keyword level but not at the campaign level if this is happening, just click cancel to get out of the column setup, click all campaigns on the left and click campaigns, campaigns. If you didn't have any problems, then just click apply. Now you should see the columns here for your campaigns and view all these metrics. Awesome. The next thing we want to do is show what are called custom columns. These are columns that allow us to use formulas to manipulate the data and get some really useful insights into our campaigns. For example, we'll be able to see how much profit each campaign has generated and even how much profit per conversion. Let's do this right now. Again, click columns and modify columns. Now scroll all the way down to the bottom and click plus custom column. Let's name this one Profit Generated. Click in this box and we'll now build out our formula. Follow what I do and then I'll explain later. Add in an open bracket, then click the plus column, click conversions and scroll down to find conversion value. Add the multiply symbol, 
Then we want to add in, as a decimal point, your net profit margin percentage. If you don't know this exact figure, that's okay, just add an estimate for now. It's usually between 10 to 50% depending on your store. I have a full lesson that shows you how to calculate this yourself, so I'll leave that in a link below. For now, just add in an estimate so we can set up our columns. For this store, they have a 50% profit margin, so I'll write that as 0.5. Add a close bracket. Now add in the subtraction symbol. Now we want to click plus column again and click performance and select cost. Now your formula should look like this. Double check to make sure it does, but with your own profit margin percentage here as a decimal. Click save. Now that we've added in our profit generated, let's now add in average profit per conversion. This metric will tell us on average how much profit we make per sale through Google Ads on our e-commerce store. Let's repeat this process, but with a slightly different formula. Click plus custom column, add the name average profit per conversion. Click the formula creation box. Let's now make two open brackets, click plus column, and we'll repeat what we did in the last formula. Click conversions and scroll down to find conversion value. Add the multiply symbol. Now add in our net profit margin as a decimal, same as before. Add a closing bracket, add the subtraction symbol, cl click the plus column again and click performance and select cost. Now let's add a closing bracket, then add in a divide symbol. Now go to plus column and click conversions and find conversions. Your formula should now look like this, but with your own profit margin, add it as a decimal. This formula calculates the total net profit for a campaign and then divides that by the number of conversions that campaign has achieved. In other words, the average profit per conversion or average profit you generate from each order from this campaign. Pretty cool, huh? Let's now click save. On your list of metrics on the right here, scroll down and make sure that you have profit generated and average profit per conversion at the bottom. If not, just click custom columns and select them. Okay, let's now make sure we can see these in our campaign. Click apply. Now if we scroll all the way to the very right hand side, you should now see profit generated and average profit per conversion there. Some really interesting and useful metrics for our campaign. Now it's taken some work to set these up. How about we save them as a save template so we don't have to repeat this process all over again. Click columns, modify columns, click save column set, and add in a name like campaign columns. Click save and apply and now we're saved. Now, we just did this at the campaign level of our account. When you go down to other levels like ad groups or keyword levels, you'll need to enable the custom columns there too. This is because there are different metrics shown to you on each level of your account. Okay, now we know how to set up recommended columns for our Google Shopping campaign. If you want to learn more about the metrics, what they mean and how you can use them, we have a full video guide going into each metric. I'll leave a link to that guide down below. In this video, you're going to learn about the different bidding strategies you can use for your Google Shopping campaign. We're going to go through each bidding strategy, show you the advantages and disadvantages and when you would use each one in each situation. Firstly, if you're not sure what bidding means or how the Google Ads auction work, Google works on a pay per click model. This means that Google is gonna show your ads, your products to people searching on Google and they're going to charge you for each person that clicks your ad and goes to your store. Your bidding strategy is your way of telling Google how to show your products and how much you're willing to pay per click. Maybe you really care about profits so you can use a target ROAS strategy and tell Google to maintain a ROAS of four on your campaign. Google will aim to do this and show your ads to the people that will try and get you a target ROAS of four on your campaign. Maybe you just care about getting as many people to your website as possible. In that case, you could use a maximize click strategy and Google's going to go out and try and get a huge volume of people looking at your store, regardless of the relevancy of that traffic. Now we're gonna go deeper into these right now, but if you want to learn more about the Google Ads auction and how it works, I have a full video that takes you through this. I'll leave a link to that down below. Looking at the bidding strategies that we can use with Google Shopping, there are two main categories, automated and manual. Automated strategies are when we lean on Google to use their machine learning and mountains of data. This can be good and bad. 
as we'll learn. It can lead to reaching people we would never have otherwise reached, leading to more sales, but it can also cost more as the algorithm doesn't know who our customers are and needs to go through an extensive learning process at the beginning. Generally, we recommend starting with a manual bidding strategy so we can guide the algorithm to focus on what's really working and then later switch to an automated bidding strategy once we have enough data. This does take more time to optimize the campaigns at the start, but it saves you a lot more money can get quicker results and we have a full guide showing you how to do this strategy. I'll leave a link to that down below. Here are all the bidding strategies you can use for Google Shopping. Let's go through each one right now, one by one. First, let's talk about the automated ones and the most automated of the lot, Smart Shopping. Smart Shopping is Google's most automated strategy of all time. It's basically Google's don't think and let us take care of everything strategy. If you're watching this video after July of 2022, feel free to skip past this section about smart shopping campaigns. Google has actually made smart shopping campaigns redundant and have now introduced what are called performance max campaigns. These are quite similar to smart shopping, but with a bit of a different strategy and approach. We're getting some pretty awesome results with these campaigns for our clients and we'll leave some videos below showing how to run and optimize these profitably. Okay, let's keep going. Now I have a full video on smart shopping versus regular shopping. I recommend watching that if you haven't. I'll leave a link to that down below. Smart shopping campaigns are basically Google's black black box bidding strategy where you have almost no control over the campaigns and you receive almost no data from them. You can adjust the budget and provide an optional target ROAS to guide Google. Now, when would we use smart shopping? The rare times that I would recommend smart shopping is when you're an absolute beginner to Google shopping and you don't have the time or the expertise to optimize your campaigns. The other time I'd recommend it is when you've tested out manual and other automated strategies and they've failed. If this is happening, you want to make sure that your store is also optimized for conversions. We have a series of videos that show you what to do if you're not getting impressions or clicks, you're not getting sales, or your campaigns aren't profitable. I recommend going through those. I'll leave a link down below. If you're going to run smart shopping, having a quality store with a high conversion rate is key. Smart shopping campaigns definitely simplify the management but they come at a cost of control and insight. You don't get insight into performance data, search queries, or even performance of individual products. You don't know what's working and what's not working, which is terrible if you want to use all this information to inform the rest of your funnel and marketing efforts, which you do. Attribution also becomes more difficult as it lumps the performance of search, display, and YouTube into one, and there's no way to report on the performance of each separately. Of course, in regular campaigns, we see significant variation between each of these mediums. So we want to measure that and adjust based on performance, which we can't do with smart shopping. We also can't add negative keywords, which is a vital part of optimizing and scaling our campaigns. We also have no control over our products, so we can't focus on those with higher profit margins or with better performance. Everything is lumped into one campaign and Google has no idea about our product goals. As you can see, there are many disadvantages to smart shopping campaigns, particularly if you have the time to spend on properly optimizing a regular campaign. They have their place. We just caution you on using them straight away. Okay, let's now look at the target ROAS bidding strategy. With this method, Google will alter your bids for you to try and achieve a target ROAS that you've set. This is a great strategy if your focus is on profitability and you have existing conversion data in your account. For example, if you know that your breakeven ROAS is 2.5, then you can set the target ROAS as three. This allows you to be profitable while also getting a volume of sales. We love using the target ROAS bidding strategy, but it does require you having existing data in your account. Google needs to know who your past customers are so they can show to the right people to hit this target ROAS goal. Goal. That's why we usually start a new campaign on a manual CPC strategy, get to 50 to 100 conversions per month, and then switch over to a target ROAS bidding strategy. Keep in mind that when you use a target ROAS bidding strategy, it can be quite sensitive to the goal ROAS that you set. Don't make changes before big events like Black Friday, because changing your goal sends Google into a learning phase, which can really tank your conversions leading up to these big days. Target ROAS is a great strategy overall 
all. Just make sure you get conversions first. Otherwise, you'll waste a lot of ad spend as Google shows your products to random people because it doesn't yet know what your products are and who's going to convert. It's much more efficient to start with a manual bidding strategy first and later switch to a target ROAS strategy. Plus, you'll save money too. The next one we have is the infamous maximize clicks. This strategy sets up your bids to get as many clicks as possible within your maximum daily budget. Let that sink in for a second. As many clicks as possible for your daily budget. Maybe you're realizing the problem with this strategy. Google here is going to see your daily budget, say of $50, and stuff it with the cheapest clicks it can possibly get. This is a problem because often the best clicks those that convert into customers are expensive for a reason. And that's because other advertisers know their good clicks and are also bidding on them. This means that with a maximized click strategy, Google's going to avoid these clicks and get you the cheapest clicks, which aren't necessarily going to convert. As you may have figured out, having thousands of people view your website means nothing if they're not potential customers that are going to lead to profits. For example, if I'm selling power drills on my store, I want to show for people searching for power drills. But if Google's going to get me cheap clicks for drill sergeant memes, that's not going to be very helpful for me for getting profits. Now I know this is an extreme example, but this is why we don't use maximize clicks unless in rare cases. That is when we're trying to get as much brand awareness as we possibly can for a store, i.e. we don't care about profitability and we just care about eyeballs. Or when we have a multi-tiered campaign strategy where we want to also target brand queries with one of the campaigns. This is a more advanced strategy and if you're starting out with Google Shopping campaigns, this is not useful for you at all at this time. We only do this once we're generating hundreds to thousands of conversions per month from our campaign and we want more granularity with search query targeting. Just know that for now, I don't recommend using a maximize clicks bidding strategy for your shopping campaign. The next strategy we have is the maximize conversion value bidding strategy. This strategy works by trying to get you as many sales as possible. Not volume of customers, but volume of sales value. This strategy uses your conversion tracking and prior conversion data to try and get you as much sales as possible. It focuses on sales, which is great if that's what you're about. This is a great strategy to test out. Just make sure you have historic conversion data in your account. We recommend at least 50 to 100 conversions. Also make sure your conversion tracking is perfectly set up. This is crucial. If you haven't set up your conversion tracking properly, go and check out our full video on how to do this. I'll leave a link down below. The disadvantage of maximize conversion conversion value is that it doesn't specifically focus on profitability, just volume of conversion value. Ideally, we recommend starting your shopping campaign with manual CPC, then trying out a target ROAS bidding strategy. If that isn't working, then test out maximize conversion value. Okay, now we have our manual CPC bidding strategy. This is where you manually tell Google how much you want to pay per click for your campaign. We can even get more granular and tell Google how much we want to pay per click per individual product. And this is where the secret source is. If you keep going through our free Google Shopping course on our website, you'll see that this is one of the fundamental strategies of building and scaling a profitable Google Shopping campaign. We start with a manual CPC bidding strategy. We focus on the products that are performing well, get cheaper clicks and cheaper sales, and later, once we have the conversion data, we switch to a target ROAS strategy. We do this because we can do it from the start of the campaign as soon as we start getting those initial sales. We can also target products that have higher margins, have more stock, or are performing better with the shopping algorithm. The disadvantage is that it takes time and knowledge to do this. Of course, we teach you absolutely everything in our manual bidding strategy video. After that, you just need to check it regularly, usually once every one to two weeks to make sure it's performing well. The more clicks you get, the more data you're going to have and the quicker you can make optimizations and changes. Now, once we get to 50 to 100 conversions per month, that's when we can switch over and test out a target ROAS bidding strategy. Finally, we have the bidding strategy, enhanced CPC. This is where you use manual bidding, but let Google use a little bit of their machine learning algorithm. 
they'll now marginally increase or decrease your manual bid based on whether Google thinks that click is going to convert or not. It gives you the control of manual bidding while also allowing you to lean on Google's algorithm just a little bit. Google does have a lot of data on its users, so we do like to lean on Google a little bit at the start as we're doing our manual bidding optimizations. Usually we do turn this on as we run our manual bidding strategy just to get a little bit of an edge from Google. There we go guys, they're the different bidding strategies for our shopping campaigns, what they are, when we use them. If this video was helpful, please give it a like and let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching guys, I'll see you in the next video. In this video, you're going to learn how to do manual bidding optimizations for your Google Shopping campaign. This is the exact strategy that we use when we start new Google Shopping campaigns. It allows us to get a good foundation of conversions until we scale them up to this, this, and this. My team and I invented this exact strategy ourselves. You'll find a link down below to the template that we're going to use in this video for this strategy. So how does the strategy actually work? Our manual bidding strategy means that we go into our Google Shopping campaigns and adjust the bids for our products on the product level. So why would we do this? This is because when we start our Google Shopping campaigns, Google has no data about our products who would buy our products and who to show those products to in the search results. By adjusting our bids manually, we can tell Google to focus on specific products. These are products that have higher profit margins, more sales and lower cost per conversion. Or we can even focus on products that we have a lot of stock and we want to get rid of. This means that we can save a lot more money that would otherwise be wasted by Google. Plus we can get results more quickly and focus on what's actually working and generating profits for our store. So what's required to use this strategy? You need four things. One, conversion tracking installed on your website through Google Ads. Two, enough conversions tracked already. Three, know your profit margins for your products or for your entire store. Four, switch over your campaign bidding strategy to manual. Okay, so first you need to make sure that conversion data is set up in your account and conversion values and amounts are being pulled right into your account. If you don't have it installed and it's not pulling in accurate conversion data, including revenue amounts, then go watch our video on how to set this up for Google Ads. We have a full guide, I'll leave a link down below. Go set that up, collect some conversions, and then come back to this video. Next, we need to have some conversions tracked for our campaign. Yes, we can set our bids initially at the start, but this strategy works once we start getting conversions and we can start adjusting our bids based on how profitable each product is. I recommend doing this for products that have at least five to 10 conversions each. So if you've only just started your campaign or you've only just set up conversion tracking, that's okay, keep the campaign running until you get some more conversions. Usually you can start this strategy about one to four weeks after starting your campaign, depending on how many sales you've tracked. If you don't have any conversion data, you can still edit your bids right now. Just go through your campaign, looking at the product level and reduce the bids for products that are spending far too much and still not getting a conversion. What is too much? Often if a product has already spent two to five X more than the actual product price, then I'll reduce the bids by 10 to 20%. I'll also increase the bids for products that aren't getting much traffic to help them rank in the search results and start getting more clicks and hopefully some conversions. For these products here, you can always reduce your bids later once you get that conversion data. Next, you'll need to know the profit margin across your store or for individual products. If you're serious about running your e-commerce store, you should really know your margins. No problem if you're still learning, I have a full video guide taking you through calculating the profitability of your store. I'll leave a link to that guide down below. Lastly, you need to make sure that you set your campaign bidding strategy to manual in your campaign settings. If you've been using an automated bidding strategy, no problem, open up your campaign, go to campaign settings, go down to the bidding strategy and change this to manual. If you've been using a smart shopping campaign, that's unfortunate because we can't use any of that existing data. So you'll have to create a new campaign from scratch, making it a standard shopping campaign. We have a full video walkthrough on how to set up this standard shopping campaign. I'll leave a link down below so you can make sure that you set those settings up properly the first time. So now that we know the four things we need to run this strategy, how does the strategy actually work? We use our template here that uses your conversion rate, your average cost per click, 
and your profit margin per product to tell you how much we should be spending to break even and be profitable with our shopping campaigns. This strategy uses real data from your campaigns and tells Google where to focus its energy based on what's been working so far. This is pure profit-driven marketing and the exact strategy that we've been using for years to scale up shopping campaigns. If you've been running your shopping campaign for some time and had some conversions, you'll have the data you need to use this strategy. First, let's open up the template. Like I said, I'll leave a link to this template below. It's a Google Sheet and we're just going to open it up, go to File, and click make a copy. Pause the video, go grab this now and come back and we're gonna keep going. Next, open up your Google Ads account. Click on the campaign. Once it's open, go to product groups on the second left-hand menu. Here you should see this row that says all products. We're going to split this out. So click on the pencil and scroll down all the way to the bottom so you can see all your products. Click the blue check mark box at the very top to select all of them and click continue to edit bids. Scroll down and click save. This is going to spread out all your products individually so we can edit the products on an individual basis. Now we can actually see the performance of each individual product. Now we just need to unhide the columns that we need for the right metrics for our bidding system. To do this, just click on columns and modify columns. We'll see this window here where we can edit all the columns. On the right hand side, remove all the current columns. Let's start from scratch. Now we want to unhide average CPC, clicks, conversions, and conversion value in that exact order. You should see these exact columns on the right hand side and only these columns. Then click apply and we can see the columns now showing up for each individual product. The next thing we need to do is set the right date period. Click on the date selector at the top here and we want to select a significant enough period. Here are a few caveats. If you installed Google conversion tracking in Google Ads sometime after starting this campaign, do it from the date you properly set up conversion tracking. This is because the data before that day when you didn't have conversion tracking installed is basically useless. The second thing is the more data we have, the better. If you've never done this manual bidding strategy before, change the date to all time. Lastly, if your product is seasonal, do it for say the last three months or the same period for the last season. In general, I use one to three months, sometimes up to six months, as long as I have a lot of clicks. I usually want at least 500 to 1000 clicks if possible. Of course, this is going to depend on how many products you have. For this store, we have a lot of products. So even though we have 5000 clicks, they're spread out over a lot of products. So the top 20 products really only have 50 to 500 clicks, except for the top two. Once you have selected your time period, we're now going to download our data so we can add it to our our template. Click the download button and then click CSV. It's then going to download to our computer. Open it up. If you don't have Microsoft Excel, you can just use a free Gmail account and open up drive.google.com. Here, you can drag it into Google Drive and open it as a Google Sheet. Just right click and go to open with Google Sheets. Once open, we're going to ignore the top two rows here that are just information. We don't need them. We're going to select the data from this row here that has the column headers all the way down to the bottom right. So I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom of all the data, hold shift and select all the data. Then I'm gonna right click and select copy. Now go back to our Google Shopping bidding template sheet. On the very top left hand cell, the campaign, click that and then we're going to paste the data that we just copied. This is very important. Only paste from this cell here, A1. It's then going to fill up the sheet. These formulas are going to automatically calculate based on what's in these columns here. That's why we needed to make sure we unhid the columns in Google Ad in the right order. Now that we have this data, let's expand this sheet and look at the data. Here you can see that it pulls in the data for our products for our Google Shopping campaign. But scrolling across, we can also see that it tells us some more metrics, which helps us how much we should actually pay for our bids. It shows us clicks until conversions, meaning on average, how many clicks do we need between each sale of this product? For example, maybe we have a click this morning and then 24 other clicks happen today and we've got another conversion. For example, if we have 17.9 clicks per conversion, it means we had on average a conversion this morning and then 18 clicks later in the day and then a conversion at night. So every 18 clicks on average, we're getting a conversion. Of course, it's gonna change every time, but over time we'll have an average 
average amount between conversions that we can then use to actually calculate how much we should actually bid. You can see that this is why as you get more data in your campaign, this strategy becomes more and more accurate and more and more effective. It then calculates the average conversion value, which is our average order value. Of course, this can be different from your actual price for this product because people will sometimes buy other products too or more than one product at a time. We then have our profit margin for this product. This is a column you will need to edit yourself right now. It's basically the margin of our products without the ad spend. Here you can edit it for all your products as the same amount. This is if you have an average for your entire store or if you actually know your margin on an individual product level, you can change that here. I do recommend doing it on an individual level if you have a lot of variation between your products in terms of margin. This allows us to know that we can bid much higher for a product with a much higher profit margin and be much more aggressive with our bids and potentially get a lot more sales for a profitable product. We then have our max CPA, meaning maximum cost per acquisition. This uses our profit margin for that product and multiplies it by our average order value. It tells us on average for this product that's clicked in our Google shopping campaigns, what's the maximum we should be willing to pay if we are trying to be profitable on the first sale. Of course, you're only going to see the data for products that have actually got conversions. Next, we then have this column here, new max CPC. This then takes this maximum cost per acquisition and divides it by the average clicks per conversion. Basically, this tells us if we want to be profitable with each product here, how much should we pay per click based on prior data? It basically tells us how much to bid to just break even. I think this is pretty cool. For example, this product here, we could pay up to $2.07 per click based on the past data and still break even. This one here is nowhere near as profitable. We could only spend 42 cents per click. See how there's so much variation? That's because our products perform differently on Google shopping and that's the real secret to this strategy, bidding on the product level. Then we have this column here, which just allows us to filter out and ignore the rows that are not actually products. Then we have this last column here, which actually tells us how much profit did we actually make for each of these products. Now the top row here symbolizes the whole campaign. So this campaign is actually making a loss of $800. That's not good. But we see that there are some products here that are actually profitable. And there are some here that are extremely unprofitable. Obviously the ones that are profitable have a much higher recommended max CPC. Something to keep in mind here, guys, this is incredibly important. Just because there's a high max CPC in this column here, it does not mean you should go into your account and set that exact max CPC. It just tells you the maximum you could put if you are to break even based on historical data. If we take a look at our current max CPC column, it's actually much lower than this. Yes, increasing our bids would increase the volume of clicks leading to more sales. But our job with bidding here is to find the balance between profitability and volume. The more we increase our bids, the more clicks we get leading to more sales, but we end up paying more per click in our bids, meaning our costs go up. This means the average profit per conversion is going to go down. There's always going to be a balance between sales volume and ad costs in your account and you need to use nuance to find that balance. So what do I do? Here, I go through all the products and note a new bid I want to put for each one. First, let's look at the ones that are doing poorly. These are the ones where the new max CPC is significantly lower than what I've been bidding originally. This is the system telling us that we need to lower our bids to be profitable. Often I'll lower my bids straight down to this exact new max CPC or something close to it. Keep in mind that this new max CPC recommendation is just to break even. So obviously for products that are performing very poorly, we just want to start by getting them down to break even. Secondly, we might have products that are close to breaking even, but not yet shown by our new max CPC being just a little bit below our current average CPC. In this case, I'll lower the bid to often between 10 to 20% below the new recommended max CPC. This is because obviously I don't want to run my account just on break even. I actually want to make profit. So I'm going to push the bid a little bit further than the break even. Of course, I don't want to push these bids too far. For example, with this one here of 42 cents, I'd probably decrease this down to 40 cents and watch how it performed in my campaigns. I'm trying to push into profitability for this product without taking a huge 
differentiate on the volume of clicks. Because as you reduce your bid, you're going to reduce your ad rank in your Google Shopping ads. This means you're going to have a lower position in the search results, which is going to lead to a lower volume of clicks. This is because obviously people click the first ads much more often than the ads lower in position. But if that means that we can push this product into profitability, I honestly don't care too much if we lose a lot of volume of sales, as long as we're actually making money, because that's what this is about. Now, before we talk about the profitable products, I wanna talk about all these other products here that don't have any conversions. Now, if you're just starting with your campaigns, you're obviously as well trying to optimize your website and increase your conversion rate. At this point here, you might actually spend a lot of money without getting a conversion. This is when you definitely decrease your bids until you actually get a conversion. You do this to try and save some money so you don't waste a lot of money without getting any conversions. So for a product like this one that's lost $116 so far, I would decrease this bid maybe to 50 to 60 cents. There is no clear rule of how much to decrease it, but I'm just gonna fill this out. But often I'm gonna halve the bid, see if it still gets clicks and go from there. Lastly, if your products are already profitable, meaning the new max CPC, like this one here, $6.14, is well above the actual max CPC or the average CPC that you're actually paying for your ads. Sometimes I will increase my bids. In this case, I have a lot of room to grow from $1 all the way to $6. So I might increase this by 50 to 100% and see if that substantially increases the volume of clicks for this product. If this product is profitable, which it is, it's made me $138. I wanna get more sales. So increasing my bid is going to place me higher in the search results, which is going to lead to higher costs, but more clicks because people are more likely to click the products at the very top of the results. Sometimes I'll even just leave the bids as they are. You don't always have to change your bids, especially if it's chugging along profitably. So this is why it's a little bit of an art where you have to get used to your ads, get used to the bidding process and go from there. Once you decide on what bids you going to change and how you're going to change them, go back to your Google Shopping account and you can edit the bids directly right here. Unfortunately, it's quite a manual process and you do it one by one. You're going to go through, make these changes and then come back and repeat this process in a week or two weeks, depending on how many clicks you get. After you've got the new bids you want to set, you'll now go back to your Google Ads account into your shopping campaign and click each product and adjust the bids. Yes, I know this can be tedious and if you have a lot of products, it can take some time. Once this is complete, don't touch anything else. Let it be, watch the results over the next week or two weeks. I'll often run this strategy on my account at least weekly, sometimes every two weeks, sometimes monthly, depending on how much data I've got and the performance of the campaign. The goal here isn't to use this strategy forever. We want to use this strategy to help get those initial conversions as quick as possible get this campaign profitable, and then start testing out some automated bidding strategies. Usually we'll run this strategy until we're getting about 50 to 100 conversions per month, and then switch over to a target ROAS strategy. This means going into your campaign settings, going down to the bidding strategy and changing this from manual to target ROAS. You'll want to adjust the target ROAS goal to something above your breakeven ROAS, but not too high that Google struggles to even come near it. We usually recommend adjusting this to 20 to 40% above your breakeven ROAS and watch how this performs for about a month. If it's not working correctly after that time, we'll decrease it to about 10% above our breakeven ROAS and watch it go from there. Keep in mind that the actual ROAS you get and the profits you generate from this campaign is going to depend largely not just on the campaign, but also your entire funnel. This means your conversion rate, the profit margin on your products and your repeat purchase rate is going to have a huge impact on the profits you can generate with Google Shopping. A lot of people that struggle to get their campaigns profitable don't have problems with their campaign strategy, but actually have problems with their store, their funnel, and their conversion rate. Now, I have some videos on what to do if your shopping campaign isn't getting any sales or if your shopping campaign isn't getting profits. I'll leave a link to those two videos down below. So that's how we do manual bidding for our Google Shopping campaigns when we start them out. In this video, you're going to learn about bidding adjustments for your Google Shopping campaigns. Maybe your products sell better on Sunday, or maybe mobile users convert higher. Bidding adjustments allow us to tell Google to bid more or less for these variables. This allows us to get more granular with how we pay 
for our traffic. This is a key part of optimizing our campaigns for profits and I'm gonna show you exactly how we do this for the stores that we work with. Now, why would we add a bidding adjustment and how much should we add? Let me illustrate this right now. Let's say you run your shopping campaigns and you get conversions from mobile users, desktop users, and tablet users. We can go into the devices section of our Google Shopping campaign and see how each of these performs. It should look something like this. We can see that for desktop users, we're performing above average for the campaign. Our ROAS is 32.85, even though the campaign average is 31.4. It's a small difference, but I'm going to use this to show you the magic of bidding adjustments. We're getting a lot of sales, which at a 30% profit margin is resulting in 450K in total profits. We then take away our ad costs, which results in 405K in profits for desktop. But I think we can increase these total profits, even though it's going to cost a little bit more to get this too. So let's say we add a bidding adjustment of 10%. That means on average, our average cost per click for desktops will increase by 10%. So now our new cost will be 54,811 because we're now paying more for these clicks. But increasing our bid means we'll place higher in the search results. This means we'll get more clicks for desktops too. So let's say we get 10% more clicks. Of course, this will vary depending on the competitors in the auction and other factors like your quality score, but it's a good estimate. So instead of getting 92,000 clicks, we're now getting 102,000 clicks, which is 10% more. So yes, this means that we'll now have higher costs, which is now $55,000 for this campaign. But as long as we keep the same conversion rate, these new clicks result in more sales. So our total conversion value, i.e. total sales for desktop, increase from 1.5 million to 1.65 million. Using our profit margin, we can now see that even though we're paying more for our clicks and we have a lower ROAS than before, it actually resulted in more profits. Here, our profit after paying for ad spend is now $441,000, which is a 36 $6,000 increase from before. This is a great example demonstrating how ROAS and total volume of sales balance out leading to net profits. There's definitely going to be a point where you could increase your bidding adjustment too much. This is where you get more sales, but the actual cost per sale increases too much that the net profit starts to decrease. You can imagine it kind of like a curve like this, and we're trying to find the sweet spot. As you can see, by making small strategic bidding adjustments, we can focus on what parts of our campaign are performing well and generate more profits. The same can be done in the opposite direction with negative bidding adjustments. This means adding a negative bidding adjustment for the variables that are not performing well to try and move it in the right direction. A question I often get asked is, how big should the bidding adjustment be? Well, it's something that you play by ear, but I generally keep mine to about five to 10%. It depends on how well that dimension is performing compared to the campaign average. Because of the complicated way that the auction works and all the variables at bay, including the market, the search volume, and other competitors, I like to make small incremental changes and watch how this affects the results. Another thing to keep in mind is that every single bidding adjustment you make adds to every other one that you've already made. This is why I keep my bidding adjustments between five to 10%. I don't wanna see huge spikes or dips in my CPCs if a search matches all the variables for my bidding adjustments. For example, say you added a 10% bidding adjustment for Sunday and a 10% bidding adjustment for people in New York and a 10% bidding adjustment for people using their mobile phones. Now, if someone is searching on a Sunday in New York on their mobile phone, you're going to pay 30% more for that click. This may be very well worth it, but you'll see that these bidding adjustments can really add up, especially if some search matches all the different bidding adjustments you've had in place. So what are the different bidding adjustments that we can make for our shopping campaign? Here they are. One, location. You might find that different states, cities, or regions perform differently. For example, if you're selling surfboards, 
people near the coast are probably gonna convert higher than people inland. Now, this doesn't mean that people that aren't on the coast are never gonna buy a surfboard, but we can tell Google that if someone is on the coast, then we want to bid higher to get that click. Next, we have time of day and day of the week. Maybe your customers convert better on a Sunday. We can adjust our bid based on the time of the day, the hour, or the day of the week to tell Google we wanna get that click. Next, we have devices. Maybe your customers are more profitable for you if they're on their desk Desktop as opposed to their mobile or a tablet. We can check this performance and bid more depending on this variable. I'm now going to show you how to open the reports to read the data and then make the bidding adjustments based on what's working. We often make bidding adjustments at least once per month depending on how many conversions the campaign is getting. We do have a full video giving you a schedule of what to optimize in your campaign apart from just doing bidding adjustments. I'll leave a link to that video down below. Let's now make some bidding adjustments. Let's start with location. We're going to open up our Google Ads account by going to ads.google.com, click shopping campaigns on the left, and then click on the shopping campaign we want to analyze. I'm gonna start with this one here. We'll then find the locations menu item on the left. You'll see that right now it's showing the country, which is the whole entire location we're targeting with this campaign. But we want to see how different areas of the country, like states or cities, perform and make adjustments on that level. This is because if one state is generating way more profits, we want to focus in on that state and get more sales there. So click on the country name, here it's the United States, and click on states or regions in the list. If you don't see states, you can just select region or even city. Keep in mind that the more micro you go, as in looking at smaller regions, the more clicks you'll need across the entire campaign. This is because as you drill in smaller and smaller, you still need enough clicks for that area to be statistically significant. If your campaign only has one to 2000 clicks, you want to stick to bigger regions. You're then gonna see this report. It's gonna break down all the states in the country with all the metrics for each one. We also wanna change our date range at the top here. I'm going to put all time because it's the first time I'm optimizing the location data for this campaign. If this isn't the first time you're doing this, I recommend setting the date period to be since the last time you made a location bidding adjustments until now. Now we have these columns here, but we want to see some more data like ROAS and sales. Click on columns and click modify columns. Let's remove all the columns here and start from scratch. Click performance and in this exact order, click the checkboxes next to impressions, clicks, cost, average CPC. Then we'll scroll down and click conversions and in this exact order, click the checkboxes next to conversions, conversion value, and conversion value divided by cost. Click apply and we'll now see the data for each state that we can start analyzing. Next thing we'll do is make sure we select the column clicks with the downward arrow so it sorts by descending order. This allows us to see the states that are generating the most clicks. An important point to note here is that we shouldn't make changes unless we have enough data. If a state only has 10 clicks, it's really not enough to make any informed decisions at all. This is all about averages. If you have a thousand clicks for a state, or in this example, 42 thousand for California, we have more confidence that what has happened so far is much more likely to repeat again in the future. With more data, there's less future variation in general. This is, in essence, the foundation of statistical significance. So take a look at your own data. Ideally, you want to have over 2,000 clicks in your campaign and then focus in on the states that have at least 200 clicks. In this campaign, we have over 300,000 clicks. That's a lot of great data to optimize. So we're gonna scan down, especially looking at the conversion value over cost column, which is the ROAS for that state, and note any states overperforming or underperforming compared to the average for the entire campaign, which can be found here. For example, we can see that Hawaii is killing it with a ROAS of 161, but look at the number of clicks. There are only 45 clicks out of Hawaii for this campaign. I honestly wouldn't trust this and I wouldn't go making any drastic changes to my campaign just for Hawaii. But if we look down and see in Connecticut, it's got a ROAS of 43 with over 4,000 clicks. This is a good 30% increase on the ROAS for the whole campaign. With this in mind, I would add a bidding adjustment to increase our bid for Connecticut to try and get more customers from that state. This is because so far, these customers have been much more profitable than the average for the whole campaign. So even though if I bid more for these customers, I'm gonna pay more to convert them, the increased amount of sales from making this bid adjustment is going to lead to more sales, which means more profits, 
at the end of the month. Likewise, scrolling down and seeing states like Missouri with a ROAS of 16, even though the whole campaign is doing an average of 31, means that it would be a good idea to add a bidding adjustment for Missouri. The bidding adjustment would not be a positive one, it would be negative. What I mean here is that Google will reduce our bids for people in Missouri when they search and trigger our campaign. So how do you actually make bid adjustments? You'll see here that this is just an informational column. It doesn't actually allow us to edit the bids. So what we need to do is click the X at the top and go back to all our targeted locations. Now, we need to add a new location. So we're targeting all of the United States, but we also need to target Missouri. Once we do this, we'll click save. We'll then see a report that looks just like this that allows us to directly edit the bids for that individual state. Once I've made the bidding adjustments I want to make, I'm then going to watch the performance closely over the coming weeks. You'll want to see on average how this change altered the performance of your campaign and then rinse and repeat. Now let's look at time of day and day of the week. You can find these reports here similar to locations on the left hand menu underneath add schedule. Here we see the one broken down for day. This is the exact same process as with locations but we're now looking at days of the week or time of day. Now make sure that you're viewing the right columns again of course go to columns and then modify columns and now we can analyze our data. So so we have the same row as for the campaign of 31, but there is some clear variation between the different days of the week. Sorting by conversion value over cost, we can see that Sunday performs about 10% above the actual average for the whole campaign. It's also getting the most amount of sales and the most profitable sale. So I definitely want to explore putting a bid adjustment for days of the week. And Friday, man, that's not performing well at all. I'll definitely add a negative bid adjustment for Friday too. Now, even though this is just the report, to actually edit your bid adjustments, go to add schedule and then add in the actual days you wanna adjust bids for. You can also do this for hours of the day and also split it up for actual hours of a day in the week. This means that maybe you wanna adjust bids for Sunday at five to 6 p.m. because this is performing so much better than any other hour of the week. Just like with locations, you wanna make these adjustments and then check back in a few weeks. Review how the changes impacted your results and then rinse and repeat. Lastly, let's look at devices. You can find this by going to the devices menu item on the left-hand side. I can see here that there is some variation between all the devices for this campaign. Interestingly, tablets are performing better than computers and mobile phones, but the actual volume of conversions isn't that high. Keep in mind here that this is gonna tell you some more information, not just about mobile users, but also how your website converts on mobile versus computer or tablet. Just because I'm performing under the average for mobile phones, I wouldn't necessarily add a negative bid adjustment. I would look into why are we not converting on mobile phones? Look at the conversion rate. It's less than half of what the conversion rate is for computers. So if I could just increase the conversion rate, that would push this much higher with more profits without increasing the cost, without just focusing on paying less for that traffic. As you can see, you need to attack your data with this strategic mindset, not just following robotic instructions, but thinking about what could actually cause these results. In this case here, I would add a bidding adjustment of plus five to 10% for tablets. I would then look into improving the conversion rate for mobile phones. I don't think it's worth adding a negative bid adjustment for mobile phones because I can clearly see that the conversion rate differs significantly between mobile phones and computers. But if I still can't get that conversion rate to budge, I would then add a small negative bid adjustment to try and bring up that ROAS for mobile phones. That's how we do bidding adjustments for our Google Shopping campaigns. In this video, you're going to learn how to use negative keywords to optimize your Google Shopping campaigns. Negative keywords are the keywords you add to your Google Shopping campaign to tell Google what searches you don't want to show for. For example, you don't want to show for searches such as free, discount, or how to, as these people will be less likely to buy from you. So we go into our campaigns and add these as negative keywords so when someone searches, we won't show our ads for these queries. We're going to cover these topics in this video. Why add negative keywords? How to add them in your account? How to find the right negative keywords to add for your store. Let's first talk about why add negative keywords. When we create our Google Shopping campaign, we don't set keywords to show for like we do with a regular search campaign. The way Google knows who to show our products to is by looking at our product feed and then showing them to some people and watching how people interact with those ads. Google will then try to optimize and show for more and more people looking for our products. Now, negative keywords allow us to guide the algorithm and help this process. Instead of Google showing our 
products to all these random people, we can give the algorithm a hand. By providing negative keywords, we can tell Google to not show for certain searches that would obviously be terrible and not convert. For example, we don't want to show for people searching for Costco. This is because people searching for Costco are more likely to just be searching for that product at their local Costco. Now, this isn't to say that we can't get conversions from these sort of search queries, but when we start our shopping campaigns, we want to focus on what's going to be profitable. Yes, some searches that we don't want could get our sales, but the cost is going to be so high that it's just not profitable. At the start of our campaigns, we want to focus on getting as many conversions as possible for our limited budget. So by adding negative keywords, we can help the algorithm get more profitable searches from more relevant traffic, which is going to be better for our campaign. Now, how do we actually add these negative keywords into our account? It's really easy. Let's do it right now. Just open up your Google Ads account, go to shopping campaigns on the left, make sure you click campaign here, click your shopping campaign and go to keywords and then negative keywords on this menu on the left. You'll then see the negative keywords report. We can then click this plus sign to see this box where we can add our negative keywords one by one. You can also use a list by clicking this button here. And we'll talk about that later in this video when we talk about batch adding negative keywords. You can also add them on the campaign level or the ad group level. It's then in this box here where we add our negative keywords. Once you've added your negative keywords, just click save. I also need to talk about match types. Match types are basically the different ways that you can tell Google how the negative keyword affects the search queries. There are three types of negative match types, broad, phrase, and exact. Broad is when you just add the negative keyword as it is without any symbols. For example, red shoes. If you add red shoes as a negative broad match keyword, any search query with both red and shoes in that query won't trigger your ad. So if someone searches for where to buy shoes that are red online, your ad will not show. To tell Google to add a negative broad match keyword, just leave it as is in the box just like this. Let's now compare this to phrase match negative keywords. With a phrase match negative keyword, it will only stop your ads from triggering if red shoes is an intact phrase in the search query. So your ad could still show for where to buy shoes that are red online, but it won't show for where to buy red shoes online. To tell Google to make your negative keyword a phrase match negative keyword, just add quotes to either side of the phrase. Lastly, we have exact match, which is much more straightforward. An exact match negative keyword will only stop the ad from triggering when the search query is exactly what the negative keyword is. For example, if someone only searches for red red shoes, then our ad won't be triggered. With the prior two examples, our exact match negative keyword of red shoes would still lead to our ad being triggered. To tell Google to use an exact match negative keyword, just enclose it in square brackets like this. We recommend using a mix of these different match types depending on the search query you're trying to stop. For example, let's say we're adding a negative keyword to our product group that only has white shoes. So we want to stop searches for other colors triggering our ad. We would add phrase match negative keywords for all the different colors like red, black, blue, etc. Now let's talk about how we know which negative keywords to add to our shopping campaign. There are three main methods that we use. One, using a master existing negative keyword list that every new shopping campaign should have. Two, regularly checking our search terms report on at least a weekly basis. And three, using some software that consistently analyzes our search terms report and finds the words that consistently lead to a lower chance of conversion. Let's look at one first. For most new campaigns, we'll add a pre-existing list of negative keywords. This is a list of keywords that we know have a very low chance at leading to a conversion. The list looks like this and has a bunch of terms like free, promo and stuff like that. We'll add a link to our own negative keyword list. I'll leave a link to that down below. Just access it and copy the whole list like this. Now go back to your Google Ads account and at the top, go to tools and settings and under shared library, go to negative keyword lists. Click the plus sign to create a new list. Add the list name, master negative keywords, Google Shopping. Then paste the list in the box below. Click save and it's going to create the list of negative keywords. Now we need to apply this to our Google Shopping campaign. Go back to your shopping campaign and on the left, go to keywords, negative keywords. Then click the plus sign and click the radio box that says use negative keyword list. Then select the list we just created and click save. 
The second strategy that we use to find negative keywords is called negative keyword mining. This is where we regularly open up our search terms report and look for irrelevant terms. You can find the search terms report by going to your shopping campaign, going to keywords on the left, and going to search terms. We do this at least on a weekly basis. You can do it more regularly if you have more traffic because you're getting more clicks and more search queries to go through and mine. For big accounts, we'll do this daily. The way it works is that you go through the search terms report bit by bit and look for search queries that have a lower chance of converting. We then add these as negative keywords. It's a skill and it takes a bit of time to get, especially at the start when you don't have a lot of conversion data. You really want to imagine what's going through the mind of the searcher as they search for this query and would they actually click and convert on your ads. For example, someone searching for good gift ideas for mom likely don't know what they actually want to buy and are just looking for ideas. Yes, they could buy from our store, but the probability is going to be much lower as we don't know if their mom is actually one of our target customers. Plus, maybe our product isn't even targeted towards mums, so this search query is going to be absolutely terrible and we definitely want to add it as a negative keyword. You can see that you need to use your own judgment here for your store and your products. The other thing you can do is set your columns in your search terms report to sort descending by total cost. This is where we can see the search queries where we've spent a lot of money on but we haven't got a profitable ROAS. So I like to look at the conversion value over cost column, the ROAS column, and compare the metrics here to my break-even ROAS. Of course, we need to use tact here. Don't go blasting all these search queries as negative keywords because there is a chance that we could improve your campaigns by improving the conversion rate, adding bidding adjustments, and bidding on the product level. Ideally, we want to look out for search queries with a lot of spend, say, 5 to 10x our average order value with a very low ROAS. We then collect all these search queries and add them as negative keywords on our product level or product group level. We want to add negative keywords at the campaign level when they could be applied to all our products. We add negative keywords at the product group level when they could be applied to products in that product group. For example, if we have different colors of our products separated into different product groups, we might want to add negative keywords for each of the colors for each of the opposing groups. The last strategy that we use to find negative keywords is using software. We've been using Karuya for years to mine negative keywords. It's some software that crawls all your search terms reports and pulls out all the recommended negative keywords for those campaigns. Now it doesn't just pull out whole negative keywords, it runs what's called an n-gram script. This is a handy piece of code that goes through all your search queries and looks for specific words that lead to a lower probability of getting a conversion. For example, maybe every single search query that has where somewhere in the search query has a very low chance of converting. Well, Karuya will find this, let you know so that you can add it as a negative. The great thing is that at the time of this video, Karuya is actually free if you're spending less than 10K per month on Google Ads. I'll leave a link down below to go and sign up. To use it, just log into Karuya and click create new reports. It will take about 10 to 20 minutes to go through your entire account and build a report of all the negative keywords you should add. You will receive an email once it's complete. Then you'll refresh and you'll see these tabs here filled out with the data. Must add negatives are negative keywords that are highly recommended to add to your account. Keep in mind that I still don't add these must haves in unless they have a significant amount of clicks or cost. You don't wanna add negative keywords in too early because the next click could be a conversion, which means that some of these keywords could actually be very profitable. This is why it's all about being statistically significant with our data-driven decisions. I'll go through each of these tabs and pull out the negative keywords that have a significant amount of clicks and are clearly great keywords to add. I'll then add them to my campaigns and we're good to go. There we have the three main methods we use for adding negative keywords to our Google Shopping campaigns. I'll leave a link to all videos and resources that I mentioned down below. In this video, you're going to learn how to optimize your product feed. Optimizing your product feed means making changes to your feed to rank better in the Google Shopping results. This means improving your product titles, improving your product descriptions, and improving your product's images. We do this on a regular basis after we launch our campaigns. An important note here, in this video, we're talking about optimizing our feed after we've launched our campaigns, 
not when we set them up. If you don't yet have a product feed set up and you haven't optimized it, go through my video walkthroughs on how to do that. I'll leave a link to our guide down below. You'll learn absolutely everything about product feeds, what they are, how to set them up for your store, and even what product fields are. We have videos on all of these topics in our free Google Shopping course. It's a course that's 100% free with no sign-up required that takes you through everything you need to set up, optimize, and scale your shopping campaigns. I'll leave a link to that down below. As you already know, your product feed is made up of product fields that give the information about your products. Stuff like the product price, the description, the title, even the URL for the product page for that product on your store. Now, there are some fields that are mandatory and some that are optional. This also depends on what you're selling and we go through this in our free course when you set up your product feed. When we optimize our product feed, we're trying to improve the product data so Google has better quality information. Why do we need to do this? Because Google Shopping campaigns don't use keywords, they use your product information to know who to show your products to. This means that if you've never optimized the titles or descriptions in your product feed, it's going to be much harder for Google to show your products to the right people. You could end up wasting hundreds or thousands of dollars on irrelevant clicks as Google tries to show your products to random people to figure out what your products are. Now, there are two parts to optimizing your product feed. The first is when you initially set up your feed. You need to make sure you carefully optimize each field to give Google the best data possible. We go over this in our free Google Shopping course, but we also have a blog post that goes deep into every single product field and how to optimize it for your campaign. The second part of optimizing your product feed is what we're going to cover in this video. This is after we've been running our Google Shopping campaign for some time. We've already collected some data and we know what sort of search queries convert for our products. We then adjust our product feed to better target these converting keywords. So how do we do this? Firstly, we want to open up our Google Ads account. On the left, click Shopping Campaigns and then find the campaign with the feed that we're gonna optimize. Once you're in the campaign, on the left, click on Keywords and then go to Search Terms. If you don't see this menu item here, then you probably have set up a smart shopping campaign instead of a regular shopping campaign. No worries, but you'll just need to set up a regular shopping campaign. To fix this, watch our video that takes you through the full process. I'll leave a link to that full guide below. Next, make sure that your date range is set to the lifetime of your campaign. Now we want to make sure we've unhidden our recommended columns. They should look like this. If you don't have these columns, you can also watch our video on how to set these up. I'll leave a link down below. It's pretty easy. Once we have the columns, we then want to sort by conversions. This is because I wanna see the terms that are converting the most for our products. You'll see here that we'll now have all the top search queries that our customers are using to find and buy our products. Every store will be different, but we want to look at these search queries and then compare them to what we have in our feed, especially in the product title, but also in the description. There are many ways that customers can search for our products. They may use a variety of synonyms depending on their location or what they know about our products. We want to know how our customers actually search for our products and then update the feed to better reflect these searches. These search queries are getting the most conversions, so we want to encourage Google to get more of them. Now that we know what our customers are searching, how do we actually edit our feed? Now to edit your feed, it really depends on the method that you use to set up your feed. You can double check how you have yours set up by going to Google Merchant Center and going to the feed section. If you're using the Google Sheets method for setting up your product feed, just open your Google Sheets feed and then edit the different fields. If you directly uploaded your products to Google Merchant Center, just go to the product section in Google Merchant Center. Then click the products you want to edit and edit the different fields. If you're using the Shopify method, go to your Shopify store dashboard and go to the app section. There you'll be able to find the app that you use to set up your feed click into it and then edit the fields there. Make sure that you always go back to Google Merchant Center, go to your feed section and then refetch the feed and make sure you didn't get any disapprovals. This is a process you want to continuously do for your products. At least monthly, check the search terms report and update your product feed with new optimizations. You don't have to stick just to your product titles. You can also update the descriptions based on what people are searching and be more descriptive. Finally, we've also seen great success by updating the images in our product feed. The images is one of the most prominent parts of your ad in Google Shopping. It takes up the most space and catches your customer's eyes first. We recommend testing out a few different images here, 
putting the most eye-catching image first. To do this, we like to look at the current Google Shopping results for other products related to our product. See how all these other products are quite similar? But look at this one here, it really stands out. I can assure you that this product here is likely getting a higher click-through rate, a higher quality score, and a lower CPC because it's more appealing to customers. Google will reward this product because the data will show that people are more interested in this product. Of course, when you optimize your images, you may need to bend the rules a little bit. Typically, Google doesn't like product images that don't have a basic or a white background, but you can still get away with messing around with this without any serious repercussions. This is why we check our Google Merchant Center account diagnostics report every single day for disapprovals. We like to test out with images that have the potential to get better results even if they get disapproved because then we'll just fix them in our Google Merchant Center account. That's how we optimize our product feed for our campaigns. In this video, you're going to learn how to set up Google Merchant Center promotions for your Google Shopping campaigns. Merchant promotions look like this on your ads. They make your ads stand out from competitors by taking up more space and increasing your click-through rates. It's a quick edge you can get over your competitors and we're gonna learn how to set them up in this video. What type of promotions can you run? There are three main types, free shipping, discounts, and free gifts. If you already have free shipping on your e-commerce store, this is an easy, quick win that you can add to your Google Shopping campaigns. If you're also running discounts on your store, you can also add them in, like 20% off certain products. You can also add in bonuses like free gifts, which is definitely going to help attract more customers to your store. What countries can you run promotions for? If you're selling to the US, Canada, UK, Australia, France, Germany and India, you can set these up. So how do we set them up? First, we need to get approved for promotions. This is an easy process. Just log into your Google Merchant Center dashboard and on the left, go to growth and manage programs. Then scroll down until you find promotions and click enable. We'll then have to fill out this form with our information and wait. Let's do this together really quickly. We're gonna select the first one, I want to enroll in Merchant Promotions. We're gonna put in our contact name, our Google Ads Customer ID, our Merchant Center ID, which you can find by going to your Google Merchant Center account and copying it from the very, very top. Now we need our Merchant Name. That's going to be the same name that's next to our ID in Google Merchant Center. Our Merchant URL, which is the URL of our store, our first name, our last name, our location. And if you have a Google account manager, like a representative from Google, you can put them in here with their email, as well as if you have an agency managing your feed, you can add them here too. Click Submit. We've now applied for the promotions. Usually it takes about 12 to 24 hours to get approved. Once we're approved, we'll then see the promotions menu item on the left of our Merchant Center menu underneath Marketing. Click this menu item and you'll then be able to go to this page here for promotions. Click the plus sign to create a new promotion. It's going to ask you your country, then your language. Make sure this is the same language as where you're selling to. Then you have the destination. This is going to be shopping ads, potentially free listings as well. Here is where we select the promotion type, the category. We have the discount options here. One for an amount off, like $30 off, and one for percentage off, like a 30% discount. We then have the free gift option here and the free shipping option here. To start, let's select free shipping. It will then ask us what type of free shipping promotion we'll be offering. We have free standard shipping, free overnight shipping, and free two-day shipping. Make sure you add what matches your store. Keep in mind that our promotions are used to stand out from competitors and get more clicks. If you offer free overnight shipping, this is going to attract more traffic and be better for your ads. Of course, it has to match your store. Let's just stick with free standard shipping in this example. The next section asks us if there's a minimum customers need to spend in order to activate the free shipping. The first box is the minimum order value, like $50 to activate free shipping. The second box is the minimum quantity of products to activate free shipping. For example, for us, we're applying free shipping across the entire store with no other requirements. So let's just click continue. It then asks us for the promotion title and promotion ID. The title is what customers see on your ads. I recommend something like free shipping. 
The ID, I usually add the same. It's just for us to identify it in the list of promotions on our promotions page of Merchant Center. If you added any requirements, then you can add those notes here too, so you can differentiate this promotion from any other free shipping promotions you've added in Merchant Center. We then choose which products this promotion applies to. You can apply it to promotions with a promotions ID. This is something that you set up in your product feed by adding the promotions ID above into the field in your product feed called promotion ID. You can also apply it to all products or you can set a filter to apply it to specific products. I'm going to select all products in this situation. We then add the promo code for the promotion. If you add the promo code here, you need to make sure you remember to add this in your Shopify or e-commerce store settings. If people can't use the discount code on your store, then the promotion will be rejected and you raise the risk meter to potentially being flagged for a Google Merchant Center suspension. Don't risk it, set it up and test it. Now, if the free shipping applies to all products across your entire store, don't add anything here and it tells Google that the promotion applies automatically. We can then set our start and end dates here. Click create promotion and Google will start the review process. Pretty easy, huh? I'm now going to run through creating a promotion for running a discount code on your store. Going back to promotions, click add promotion, choose our country and then scroll down to the category section. Choose either amount off or percentage off. Let's choose percentage off for this discount because it will be 10% off. It will then show us more options for our promotion, such as whether they get a percentage off right away or if they need to buy other products to activate this discount. I'm going to select buy quantity of products, get a percentage off. This means buy one, get 10% off. Continue. It then asks for the title of the promotion and the ID. The title is what customers are going to see. So make sure you spend time thinking about what you're right here. For example, I'm gonna add buy one, get 10% off. Then we add the promotion ID, which is what allows us to identify this promotion in our settings. I like to add the title, but replacing the spaces. Now we choose which products this promotion applies to. You can apply it to promotions with a promotions ID. This is something you set up in your product feed by adding the promotion ID above into the field called promotion ID. You can apply it to all products, or you can set a filter to apply to specific products too. We then add a promo code for the promotion. If you add the promo code here, you need to make sure to add this into your Shopify or e-com store settings, because if people can't use the discount code on your store, then the promotion will get rejected by Google and you raise your chances of being suspended on your Google Merchant Center account. Don't risk it, set it up and test it. If the discount applies to all products across our entire store, don't add anything here. And it just tells Google that the promo code applies automatically. We can then set our start and end dates here. I'm going to run this one for about five or six months. We then click create promotion and Google will start the review process. This usually takes about 24 hours or so. So make sure to give yourself enough time before a big event like Black Friday or another sale day to be prepared so it can be reviewed before the actual sale date. If you have a lot of products, you can also set up a promotions feed. This allows you to much more easily tell Google which promotions you're running for your products. I'll leave a link below for Google's page on setting up a promotions feed. That's it for setting up our Merchant Center promotions for our Google Shopping campaigns. In this video, you're going to learn to set up reviews on your Google Shopping ads, also known as Google Shopping Ratings. These are the review stars that show up on your Google Shopping ads. They improve your click-through rate, help you stand out compared to competitors, and give you an extra edge for performance. Okay, so how does the process of setting these up actually work? First, we need to get approved for Google Ratings in Merchant Center. Next, we need to create our review speed using an app like JudgeMe, Stamp.io, or one of the many other reviews apps. We then need to add this speed into Merchant Center, and then finally, we need to get it approved. By far, the hardest part of this process is setting up the review speed, but I'm gonna walk you through this step-by-step step in this video. The review speed is basically a database of all the reviews across all your different products for your store. But the first thing we need to do is actually get approved for the Google Ratings Program in Google Merchant Center. You'll know you're not yet approved if you go into Google Merchant Center and look on the left-hand menu. If you don't see product reviews here, it means we're not yet approved. So let's do that right now. To enable, log into Google Merchant Center and go to Growth, Manage Programs and scroll down to find the Product Ratings card. Click Get Started. 
Here we'll see the product ratings interest form. We'll fill it out now. The first question is, do you work with an approved third party reviews aggregator? We have a few options here, so let me break this down. If you already have a third party reviews app installed on your website, I mean an app like Yotpo, JudgeMe, Stamp.io or Ali Reviews. Click this link here and you're going to see a list of approved third party reviews aggregator apps. Check if your app is on the list. If so, you'll click the option yes. If not, then click the option no. It still means we can submit our reviews feed. Then select that we collect reviews for physical and or digital products. Then select that we have more than 50 reviews. If you don't yet have 50 reviews across your store, that's okay. Skip to later in the video where I show you how to set up Judge Me to collect and show your reviews on your store. This will then allow you to start collecting reviews from your customers right away. Then put in your merchant name, then add in your merchant account ID. Your merchant ID can be found at the top of your Google Merchant Center dashboard. Then put in your store homepage URL. It's gonna auto fill in your name and your email. It's then going to ask you if we use a comparison shopping service. This is largely applicable in Europe where this is much more common. You'll know if it's yes or no, if it applies to you. Click submit. After a few days, you'll receive an email from Google letting you know that you're accepted into the reviews program. You should now see product reviews as a menu item in your Google Merchant Center account. Now we're going to learn how to create the reviews feed for our Google Shopping ads. There are two main ways to set up your reviews feed. One is to use Google's free setup process. I do not recommend this for most stores. Only if you're a new store, you have zero existing reviews and you're trying to save as much money as possible. This method involves installing a special Google widget on your website. It doesn't look great and you can't import past reviews, so you're collecting reviews from zero. It's honestly not optimal at all and you might as well use a third-party app like JudgeMe, which is only $15 per month, which is the next method, using a third-party app. This means using a third-party reviews app like Stamp.io, Yotpo, or JudgeMe to create your reviews feed. This app will automatically collect reviews on your store and also create a reviews feed that you can use in your Google Shopping campaigns. If you already have a third-party reviews app installed on your store, there's a good chance they do have a Google Shopping feature. It's often at a higher pricing tier, but if you enable this, you'll automatically have your reviews feed and be able to use it on your Google Shopping ads. If this is you and you already have a reviews app installed on your store, I recommend checking out their support documents to see if they have this Google Shopping Reviews feature. I'll also add links below to all the guides for the popular reviews app so you can see how to do it for your store. If this is you, go through that guide, set it up for your store, and then come back when we wanna add the reviews feed into our Google Merchant Center account. If you don't already have a good reviews widget set up on your store, I recommend using JudgeMe. It's the cheapest, highest quality reviews app that I recommend. It's only $15 per month and it also includes the shopping reviews feed. I'm going to show you how to set up JudgeMe on your store right now and then how to set up the shopping reviews feed with that app. After that, we'll connect our reviews feed into Google Merchant Center so we can get our reviews app approved and then showing on our Google Shopping ads. Okay, now we're going to set up our reviews feed with the Judge Me app. Remember, this is for you guys out there that don't have an existing reviews app installed on your website with reviews that has a Google Shopping Reviews feature. First, let's install Judge Me on our store. To do this, just log into your Shopify dashboard, go to apps on the left, and click on customize your store. It's going to take you to the Shopify app store, and we're going to search for Judge Me. You see here is the first one, Judge Me Product Reviews. It's got over 7,000 reviews, five stars. Go to the app page here. I'll also leave a link to Judge Me down below. Click on Add App. It's going to ask for confirmation. Scroll down and click Install App. Here, it's going to ask us to set up our store with Judge Me. Go through the recommended installation here. Click Start Installation. It's going to ask where you want to apply your reviews across your store. You can select what you'd like here, but I'm gonna leave them all checked. It's going to ask you if you wanna install on your current theme or an unpublished theme. We're gonna put it on our actual website, so make sure you select the left one and click Install Judge Me Now. It's then going to give us a preview. We can see that there's reviews here at the top, and then down here, there's their reviews widget, which shows you some example reviews. Confirm that it looks good and go, yes, looks great. 
Now, Google requires you to have 50 reviews across your store before you can show your reviews on Google Shopping. If you already have reviews, you can import them into JudgeMe by going to Import and Export. Here, you can follow the options to import reviews from other platforms or even import from a CSV file import. Now, if you don't yet have 50 reviews elsewhere, then you just need to collect those first 50 reviews and then come back and complete the next steps to set up your Google Shopping reviews feed. To speed up collecting reviews, I recommend enabling auto reviews collection within JudgeMe by going to settings and then going to review requests. Here, you can set it up so JudgeMe will email your customers to encourage them to leave reviews on your store after purchasing. Once we have 50 or more reviews in JudgeMe across our store, just go to Settings, Advanced, and then Google Product Review Feed. Set the bar to On to enable your review feed. You should then make sure to enable the NPN Identifier Bar and the GTIN Identifier Bar. These are used so that JudgeMe can match the reviews of your products to the GTINs that are shown for the products on the feed. This means you do need to make sure that you add the NPN and the GTIN to the products on their product page information pages within Shopify. Now that we've created our Google Shopping Reviews feed, let's now add it into Google Merchant Center. Sign into your Google Merchant Center account. Click Marketing on the left-hand menu and go to Product Reviews. Click the Product Reviews feeds to open up the feeds page. Click the plus sign to create a new feed. Give your feed a name. I recommend something like reviews app name plus reviews feed. For example, judge me reviews feed XML. Make sure you choose scheduled fetch below. Click continue. Then jump over to the settings in your third party review app where they provided you with your reviews feed name and URL. For judge me, it looks like this and it's located in the Google shopping review section of the settings. Select the fetch frequency to be daily. For fetch time and time zone, you can just leave that as default. Then over in your third party review app, grab the feed URL that looks like this and paste it into the box here. If the URL is password protected, then provide the login information here. Then click create feed. You'll then need to wait until Google manually approves your shopping reviews feed. This can sometimes happen quickly, but can sometimes take up to two to four weeks. Once this review process is complete, you will then receive an email from Google and your shopping reviews will then start showing on your shopping ads. So that's how we set up reviews on our Google shopping ads, also called Google shopping ratings. In this video, you're going to learn what, when, and how to optimize regularly in your Google Shopping campaigns. If we want to scale our shopping campaign, we need to work on it daily, weekly, and monthly. This is how we get results like this. See how the growth is consistent over all these months? That's because we regularly worked on and optimized this shopping campaign. In this video, I'm gonna show you what you need to do daily, weekly, and monthly to see this continuous growth and optimizations towards profits for your Google Shopping campaign. All the optimizations that you're going to learn in this video are taught in our free Google Shopping course on our website. I'll be linking to a lot of videos down below, so make sure to go and check them out, including a link to the actual course. I'll also leave a link to the actual checklist that we're going to use in this video, so check that out too so you can use it for your own account. Keep in mind that all the time periods that I'm going to go through in this video are just a guide. You should be optimizing your account when it needs it. These time periods work for a newer account that's not spending a lot of money. But when you're spending $10,000 a day, you'll be spending a lot more time in your account every single day. So the optimizations get sped up a lot more because you have a lot more data to work with. Okay, let's get into it. Here's what we do on a daily basis in our account. First, we check our Google Merchant Center account. Here we're looking for suspensions and disapprovals. We then check our Google Ads account for any billing issues. We then check our campaign to make sure it's getting impressions and clicks. And lastly, we check for any anomalies in the account. Things like big changes in performance that tell us we need to look deeper. Okay, let's go through each one in more detail. First, we check our Google Merchant Center account. Here we wanna check if it's been suspended. You'll know you've been suspended because you'll see this big red bar at the top of your dashboard. Plus, you'll also receive an email from Google telling you you've been suspended. We want to fix our Google Merchant Center suspension as soon as possible because as long as we're suspended, our shopping campaigns will stop running. This means no more clicks, 
no more sales, which is terrible, especially if you've built up your campaign to be a sales generating machine for your e-com store. Fixing your Google Merchant Center suspension is a tough process and I'll leave some links to some guides below. The next thing we wanna check is the diagnostics report for any product errors or disapprovals. Just head to products, diagnostics in your Google Merchant Center account and see if there are any errors, disapprovals or issues here. Disapprovals look like this and warnings look like this. We fix these as soon as possible because leaving them as they are is going to give us a higher chance of getting a suspension. I'll leave some more resources down below for fixing disapprovals. The next thing we wanna check is our Google Ads account for any issues. We'll especially be looking for any billing issues like if Google tries to charge our credit card and it fails. This will stop our ads. It will look like this at the top. Just go into settings and billing and pay your bill so that you can get your ads running again. We also want to double check that our shopping campaign is getting impressions and clicks. There could be a multitude of things causing no impressions and no clicks for our shopping campaign. So we want to make sure there are no anomalies here. Here's how to do this. In your Google Ads dashboard, go here to Google Shopping in the menu on the left. Now set your data graph at the top here to the past seven days and change the data view to daily. We'll also change the metrics we're looking at to impressions and clicks by doing this. We can now hover our cursor over the graph to make sure that we're getting both on a daily basis. I also like to look at the cost and conversion value on a daily basis to see if there are any anomalies. Anything out of order triggers us to look deeper into it and find a solution. There's always going to be variation in the data, but seeing an unusual break in a pattern can be the early red flag that saves your campaign and your sales. You'll see that most of our daily checks are to check if there are any drastic things happening to our account. We'll now look at weekly optimizations, which are more focused on improvements. We'll often do some of these daily, like negative keyword mining, but weekly is a good minimum. Here's what we do on a weekly basis. Managing our bidding and bidding adjustments. Negative keywords. Search impression share. The first thing we do in our campaign are our manual bidding adjustments. If you're following through our free Google Shopping course right now, you'll know that at the start of a campaign, we actually run a manual bidding strategy, manage the bids on a product level, and later, once we have enough conversions, we'll change to an automated bidding strategy. So here, we'll do our manual bidding adjustments based on performance on a weekly basis. I'll leave a link below to our full process and guide on how we do this. It's quite a long process, but we break it down for you guys and provide the template to manage your bids. The next thing we do is negative keyword mining. This means combing through your search terms report, which can be found by going to your campaign, keywords, and then search terms. See all these irrelevant search terms? These will be much less likely to get us sales, so we don't wanna waste money on more of these search queries. So we add them as negative keywords. This is like pruning a tree over time to make it more beautiful. This is one of the ways that we can scale our campaign by optimizing it to make more and more profits. We have a full guide on doing negative keyword mining I'll leave a link to that down below. The last thing we want to do on a weekly basis is look at our search impression share. This is a metric shown on the campaign level that shows us how many of the available searches did we show for. If our budget is capped and our campaigns are profitable, this shows us that we can potentially increase the budget of our campaign and make more sales profitably. We can find this by going to our shopping campaigns on the campaign level, then unhiding the column to show search impression share by going to columns, modify columns, and scrolling down to find competitive metrics and adding in these three metrics. Search impression share, search lost IS rank, and search lost IS budget. Click apply. We can then see in this column here, search lost IS budget, if our campaign is not showing for people because we have a too small of a budget. Potentially for this campaign here, we could increase our budget by 15 or more percent and still get the same results, but get a higher volume of clicks. It basically shows us, is there room to scale this campaign? Keep in mind that when you start your campaign, Google is still figuring out what your products are, so this metric isn't as useful. This is because it's based on your number of eligible impressions. If Google doesn't know what your products are, it doesn't know what the potential eligible searches would be. So don't get caught up on doing this weekly until your campaign is humming along, it's maxed out the budget, 
and the campaign is profitable. That's when you consider increasing the budget to scale your campaign. Okay, let's now look at what we do on a monthly basis. Product feed optimizations. Device, location, and time of day bidding adjustments. First, the most important thing here is our product feed. As we learn more about our customers and what they use to search Google, we want to be optimizing our product feed. This is quite a technical process and we have a full guide on how to do this. I'll leave a link to that guide down below. We also want to make sure to check if we can make further optimizations by adding other bidding adjustments. This means checking to see if different devices perform better and bidding higher or lower for these different searches. We'll also adjust our bids based on the location of our traffic and the time of day and the day of the week. Now, a lot of good stuff goes into this process and I've got a full video guide showing you how to do it. I'll leave a link to that down below. That's what we do on a monthly basis. Though, when we want to look on a quarterly basis, we go on a more macro level. We want to step back and look at other things that could really help our campaigns. Things that require more data, or changes into other areas to see significant improvements. Here we like to go into our Google Ads account and play around with the different metrics and time periods. We're looking for any trends, any seasonality. We'll also take this into account with the time of year that we're currently in. Also looking at Google Analytics and other data such as conversion rate, bounce rates, and anything else we can pull. You never just want to focus your optimizations on your Google Ads account. You should be continuously testing and optimizing your website to get a higher conversion rate over time. Okay, that's all for the optimizations we'll be doing on a regular basis for our shopping campaigns. There's a lot, a lot of resources that I mentioned here. I'll leave a link to all of them down below. Plus the full optimization schedule and checklist that you can use for your own account. In this video, you're going to learn what to do if your Google Shopping campaign isn't getting any impressions and or not getting any clicks either. Maybe your Google Shopping campaign looks like this or this. There's a variety of reasons why this could happen and we're going to go through each of them in this video. I'm going to be talking about certain metrics like impressions, clicks, and others. If you don't know what these are or you don't know how to view them in your Google Ads account, watch my video on metrics for Google Shopping and my video on showing the recommended columns in your Google Ads account. I'll leave a link to both of those videos down below. First, we're gonna talk about what happens when you're getting no impressions. Then we'll talk about what happens when you do get impressions, but no clicks. Okay, so your campaign looks like this. No impressions and no clicks. Here's how we fix that in order. Firstly, time. How long has it been since you created this campaign? Make sure it's at least three days. It takes time once you launch your campaign for Google to index your feed and start showing it to people. Impressions. If you want to speed things up, you can try increasing your bids to $1.50 to $3. You will spend more money doing this, but it will speed things up. After three to four days, go back and check if you're still not getting impressions. If you're still not getting impressions after three days of starting the campaign, proceed to the next fixes. The next thing you need to do is make sure that your campaign is live. Go to your account, go to shopping campaigns and click on all campaigns. For the campaign that you're worried about, make sure it's set to active. That's when you know it's live. The next thing you wanna check if there are any issues with your Google Ads account, especially in terms of billing. You'll usually see a big red banner at the top of the account identifying a certain issue. If you see this, do what it says and get it fixed. Also check your billing settings by going to tools and settings and under billing, go to billing setup. Make sure that you have a credit card connected and there are no big errors telling you that you have an unpaid bill that needs to be paid. If you do, pay it. Okay, if you've been through our free Google Shopping course, you'll have completed this step anyway, but I'm gonna say it right now. Make sure that your Google Ads account is linked to your Google Merchant Center account. You can check this by going to Tools and Settings at the top of your Google Ads account and going to linked accounts. It should show that Google Merchant Center is linked at the top. We also want to check that it's linked to the right account. So click manage and link, and then confirm that the ID shown is the same as what's in your Merchant Center dashboard. If you see any problems here, 
go back and link it again. Of course, we have a simple walkthrough video showing you how to link your accounts. I'll leave a link to that down below. Next thing you wanna check is that there are no issues in your Google Merchant Center account. Open up your Google Merchant Center account and look for any big glaring issues. They'll usually show at the top of the screen like this. You'll have to go and fix these up. If it's a suspension, you'll have to go and fix this. This takes time and we have some resources to help you do this. One of them is a quick video that takes you through how to fix it. And another one is a full in-depth guide which goes into much more detail. I'll leave links to both of them down below. Also check to see if you have any product disapprovals. You'll find these by going to products on the menu and then going to diagnostics. Scrolling down on that page, you'll be able to see all the errors, warnings and disapprovals for your products. If your product is disapproved, it's not going to show in your Google Shopping ads. So if all your products are disapproved, you won't be showing in the shopping ads and you won't get any impressions. We have a full video lesson on how to fix all these disapprovals. I'll leave a link to that down below. The next thing we wanna check are our Google Shopping campaign settings. You'll have set these up when you created your Google Shopping campaign, but if you didn't do it properly, you'll have issues with your campaign showing. A common example is location targeting. If you set up your location targeting wrong and you're targeting a tiny town in the middle of nowhere, there's no wonder you're not getting impressions because no one is there searching. To fix this, I just recommend going through our full campaign setup video that takes you through every single setting so you can make sure you've got yours set up properly. I'll leave a link to that down below. The next thing to check is your bidding. If you set your bids far too low, then you won't get any impressions because your ad is going to be far too low in the search results to even show. Usually I set the bids for my new campaigns to about $1. I'll then let it run for a few days and watch how many impressions I get. Increasing your bids will tell Google to be more aggressive with showing your products. You'll show for a higher position in the results. That means showing here instead of here. So this will naturally result in more clicks as people generally click the ads closer to the top than at the bottom. Depending on the niche, sometimes I'll also increase my bids from $1 to $1.50 to sometimes even $3 to encourage Google to rank my products higher to start getting impressions and start getting clicks. Yes, this means paying more for these clicks at the start, but when you have a fresh campaign and Google has no idea what your products are, you really wanna kickstart it and start showing your ads so Google can get some data and that's when you can start taking off. It's gonna be worth it because later we'll reduce our bids as we optimize. Next, make sure you haven't added any unnecessary negative keywords. Negative keywords are keywords that you add into your shopping campaign to tell Google what queries you don't wanna show for. For example, let's say you sell desk fans, but let's say you see your search terms report and a lot of people are searching for computer fans and your ad is being triggered. Obviously, people looking for a computer fan are not going to buy a desk fan. So we want to tell Google that this is a bad search query for our products. So we add a negative keyword for computer fans. Now, this is where some people can make a mistake of adding keywords that are actually going to block all the traffic or all the good traffic for their campaign. At the start, when it's a fresh campaign, don't add too many negative keywords. Let Google start out, show for some searches, and then you can start adding negative keywords over time. This is, of course, after you've optimized your product feed, which is something you definitely need to do. And if you haven't, go and check out our videos down below on how to create an optimized product feed. So to fix this problem, go into your campaign, go to keywords and go to negative keywords and see if there are any keywords blocking your traffic. Next, we want to remove any bidding adjustments. Bidding adjustments are edits that you can make to your bids based on variables like the user's device, their time of day, location or day of the week. Even though we have a full video in our free course showing you how to use these to optimize your campaign, you really shouldn't be using these at the very start until you get some conversion data. Adding these too early can restrict or alter the performance of your campaign when it's not actually based on the data. You can find these when you click on your campaign and on the left, go to devices, ad schedule and locations. Also check the audiences tab of your shopping campaign because sometimes you might accidentally add an audience I wouldn't recommend this at the start until you've got more data as it's a bit more of an advanced tactic. So make sure you don't have anything in any of these settings when you're trying to launch your campaign. Lastly, if you're still not getting any impressions after a week, 
I recommend starting a campaign from scratch. There could be some sort of adjustment or campaign setting that's restricting your campaign that you're just missing. We have a full guide on creating your shopping campaign from scratch with the recommended settings. I'll leave a link below. Watch this while you create your new shopping campaign. That's everything that we're gonna look at if you're not getting impressions. Now, what if you are getting impressions but you're not getting any clicks? Maybe your campaign looks like this. The fact that you are getting impressions means that your product feed is connected and pulling the data through. It also shows that your shopping ads are eligible to run, you're just not getting enough clicks. Basically, we want to make sure that nothing is inhibiting our ads from showing, and then we increase our bids to try and increase our ad rank. Just like with impressions, it does take some time for the algorithm to start showing your products to the right people and watching how they interact with your ads. At the same time, we can encourage this algorithm by increasing our bids, which increases our ad rank and our average position in the results, resulting in a higher average amount of clicks. For now, just keep in mind that if you are getting impressions, that's a really good thing. We just need to increase that amount to start getting clicks. For example, if you only have 100 impressions, you can't expect to have 500 clicks. This is because impressions come before clicks. People need to view your ad before they even click it. Next, make sure that your product feed is optimized. Optimizing your product feed is one of the most important foundational things you need to do for a successful Google Shopping campaign. It's also one of the most forgotten things as well. I rarely see anybody with a properly optimized product feed. If you haven't optimized your feed, it's going to be that much more difficult for Google to figure out who your products do and get more impressions leading to more clicks. So if you haven't optimized it yet, go watch my videos below showing you how to optimize your product feed so Google can figure out what your products are and show them to the right people. I'll leave a link down below. The next thing that drives clicks to your campaign is your ad rank. There's a lot to go into here. The best thing you can do is watch our full video on how Google Shopping works. It goes deeper into the algorithm and ad ranking and why bids drive impressions and clicks for your campaign. Go into your campaign settings right now and check what bidding strategy you're currently using. If you have set it to something other than manual CPC, it's going to take a lot longer to get those initial clicks. This is because the other strategies are all automated strategies, which means Google needs to use existing data in your account to optimize. If it's a new campaign with zero clicks, Google doesn't have any data to optimize. So it's going to start showing to a lot more general people to see how they interact with your ads. Do yourself a favor, start with manual bidding, get to 50 convergence, and then test out automated bidding strategies. We have a full video guide showing you how we use manual bidding with a template to calculate your bids. I'll leave a link to that video. Go check it out below. Once you confirm that you're using manual CPC as a bidding strategy, the next thing you need to do is make sure you're bidding enough. Just like if I don't have enough impressions, I'll set my initial bid to about $1. I'll then let it run for a few days and watch how many impressions I get. If I'm still not getting clicks after about three to seven days, I'll then increase my bids to $1.50 to sometimes $3. You'll be giving Google a kick to start showing your products to more people, leading to more impressions and more clicks. Of course, you can always reduce your bids later once we start optimizing. Next, double check your negative keywords. Negative Negative keywords are a tool that allow you to tell Google what not to show your ad for. Just like when you're not getting impressions, adding negative keywords can really restrict your reach. This means you won't get that crucial data that you need when you start running your campaign. At the start, I don't recommend adding any of your own negative keywords. Just let Google try out your products on its network and get some initial data. This is, of course, only once you've optimized your feed so Google does know what you're selling and who to show it to. So to fix this, just remove the negative keywords from your campaign and and let it run without them. Next, I want to talk about audience targeting. This is a rare mistake, but it can happen. Within your Google Shopping campaign, you will find the audience tab. Here, you can add two types of audiences to your campaign. One is an observation audience. This means that Google will track from this audience that you select who's actually interacting with your campaign. It's basically a way of collecting data. Now, the other option, which can really hurt our shopping campaigns, is called the targeting option. This is where you tell Google to only show for the audience that you select. This might be useful if you're running an RLSA campaign and targeting a specific audience with that campaign. For new campaigns, you certainly don't want to do this. You want to make sure that your campaign is showing for as many people as possible and not 
being restricted to one demographic. So make sure there's nothing in this section here as this will severely limit your campaign and the amount of clicks that you can get. Lastly, there can be some issues with your campaign setup. This could be your location setting or any time of the day, day of the week, scheduling restrictions. If you're still having issues with getting enough clicks on your shopping campaign after one to two weeks of running it, I recommend starting a new campaign from scratch. Follow our full guide on creating a Google shopping campaign. I'll leave a link to that down below. That's it guys. That's our full guide on what to do if you're not getting impressions and or clicks. All the resources and videos I mentioned will be linked below this video. In this video, you're going to learn what to do if you're not getting sales for your e-commerce store. There are three areas we're going to be looking at. One, when the quality of traffic that you're sending to your store is low quality and it's not converting. Two, when you're not even getting people adding to cart from your product pages. And three, when you're getting customers adding to cart but they're not completing their checkout i.e. abandoning their cart. Let's start with the low quality traffic. Low quality traffic is when you're getting visitors to your store, but they're just not interested in what you're selling. First, check how many visitors you're getting. If you still have less than 500 visitors to your store, then you need to focus on getting more traffic before you go through the rest of this video. Go and watch our video on what to do if you're not getting impressions and clicks, and then keep optimizing your campaign. I'll leave a link to that video down below. If you are getting a lot of clicks, but no conversions, the next thing we need to do is check the quality of our traffic. For example, if you're selling basketballs, you want to be targeting people that are searching for something like buy basketballs online. You run your Google shopping campaign for the first time and you get 1000 clicks, but not a single person buys. So you check the search terms report of your campaign and you see that most of these clicks are for searches that are not relevant towards your products. For example, basketball bobblehead. No wonder you didn't get any sales. All the people visiting your site wanted a bobblehead. They didn't want a basketball. So how and why did this happen? Sometimes, especially for new campaigns, Google gets it wrong. You see, you don't get to choose what keywords you target with your Google shopping campaign. Google looks at your product feed to try and figure out what you're actually selling. They then show it to a lot of different people and watch how those people interact with your ads. Do they click and do do they convert? Sometimes it takes time for Google to figure out what your products are and who to show them to. Our job is to guide that algorithm to try and get as much relevant traffic as quickly as possible. So how do you know if you're getting quality traffic or not? Check the search terms report of your Google shopping campaign. Go to your Google ads dashboard, click on your shopping campaign, on the left hand side, go to keywords and click on search terms. Make sure you set the date range to a significant amount of time. Then go through your search terms report and notice if there are any search queries that are not particularly relevant. Here, in this case, we're selling basketballs and other sports equipment, but we're getting some searches for bobbleheads and fishing equipment. These people will probably not purchase from us, so we need to add negative keywords as well as improve our product feed to target more search queries about basketballs and sports equipment. This requires optimizing our campaigns and in our free Google Shopping course, we have a full section on how to optimize your campaigns. I'll leave a link to those videos down below. The next problem you might have that's causing no sales is that people are just not adding your products to their cart. You know this is the case by looking at your add to cart ratio. It differs depending on the store, but usually we see a ratio of anywhere from three to 10%. So how do you view your own add to cart ratio? If you're using the old Google Analytics, go to Google Analytics and open up conversions, e-commerce and shopping behavior. Set the date range to at least 30 days. You'll see the product page views here as sessions with product views. You'll see the number of add to carts here as sessions with add to basket. Just divide the second by the first to get the ratio. If you're using the new Google Analytics GA4, then you can just get the same metrics by clicking engagement and then events to see this report. View item is the number of product page views. Add to cart is the number of add to carts. So we can get our add to cart ratio right here. If you are getting anything less than three to 5%, then you have a lot to improve on your product page. Here are the common reasons you're not getting people add to cart. Number one, an easy one. Make sure your add to cart button is working. Make sure that your product isn't actually sold out and people can actually click and add to their cart. Maybe 
maybe there's some sort of design issue with your site or some sort of geographical restriction set up for your store. Make sure that the people that you're targeting in their location with their device and browser can actually open your product page and add to cart. Next, we need to make sure our product page is optimized. You should be constantly testing and improving your product page and store to convert more and more customers. This means having a store that looks fantastic it builds trust and it solves the problems of your searches. A common problem I see with beginners is they spend all their time in the Google Ads account when their product page looks like this. A basic page with just a title, description and product image. Compare that to a product page like this. A product page that's engaging, clearly demonstrates how amazing the product is, explodes with social proof and walks through all the features and benefits in great detail. This type of product page is called a long form product page and it converts way better than a regular simple product page. When we use these for our clients, we generally see conversion rates in the three to 10%. It's insane. Imagine increasing your conversion rate from one to 3%. You're now converting three times as many customers for the same cost with the same traffic. Getting this right is like rocket fuel for your campaigns and allows you to scale like crazy. Now I have a full free course on how to set up these long form product pages. I'll leave a link to that down below. Now you can have the best product pages in the world, but if your product quality and offer is terrible, it's still going to be hard to convert customers. The common mistakes I see people making are pricing their product way too high without demonstrating the value of their product, low quality images, or just a low quality product. If a customer can go to your competitor's store and see a better quality product for a cheaper price, who do you think they're gonna buy from? They might even be happy to pay more for a competitor's product if it means a higher quality product. Of course, this is all about perceived value. At the same time, don't lie or misrepresent your products. The next mistake I see people making is trying to sell a product that people don't actually want. Make sure that the features and benefits that you put on your product page are actually resonating with the people that are searching for them. Your customers are going to be unique and this is where your market research comes in. You need to understand your customers so well that when they see your product page, they feel that this product was made just for them. It speaks directly to their needs and wants and their decision to buy is going to be very, very easy. This is because their perceived value of that product far outweighs the cost that you're charging on your store. Improving your conversion rates is a long and consistent process. Once you've increased the number of people adding your products to their cart, will then look at increasing the number of checkout completions. So if your customers are adding to cart, but they're not completing their checkout, there are a number of things we can do to improve this. One, make sure your cart is actually working. This is the most basic and easiest fix is when your cart isn't actually working and people can't check out on your store. Check to make sure that you can actually put through a transaction yourself. Create a 100% off discount code and go through and try and complete your own checkout and see what the experience is like. Maybe you forgot to add a payment provider or some sort of Shopify setting. The next big thing that we see causing a lack of checkout completions is the shipping price. Honestly, I believe that most customers actually expect to get free shipping. If you're not providing free shipping on your store, you're actually doing a disservice to your customers, let alone your bottom line which is what we really care about here. We've seen so many stores implement free shipping and the increase in sales definitely covers the cost of the extra shipping. At the same time, you can also increase your prices to cover or share the cost of the shipping. At the end of the day, the truth is most customers prefer to know that the shipping is included in the purchase price than be hit with a shipping price later on when they're about to finish the checkout. Try free shipping and see how that goes for your conversion rates. Another cause of abandoned carts are unexpected costs like taxes or currency conversion fees. Of course, we already talked about shipping, but check to see if there are any other unexpected costs that a customer is hit with when they try and complete their checkout. This could be affecting your cart completion rates and stopping you from capturing all those customers that you should. Of course, some things can't be changed like taxes, but just take stock and look so you're aware of what's causing the drop off. The next thing is prices being too high. While a customer may have made a decision to purchase from you when they add to cart, it's not locked in until they pay. For some customers, once they actually have to 
pull out their credit card and enter their details, they suddenly re-question their decision to buy from you. Maybe the perceived value of your product is teetering on the edge of being worth it. And once you ask them to add in their credit card details, it's just not worth it for them. Consider your pricing and value proposition, especially in light of competitors, to make sure that when people add to cart, they've got a real heck yes attitude and they wanna put in their credit card details and pay. Next, maybe your checkout isn't very trustworthy. If you're using a different platform, some of these don't look very trustworthy. A customer might feel that it's gonna steal their credit card details, take it off to who knows where and sell it on the black market. You need to make sure that your checkout makes customers feel comfortable with giving their credit card details and personal information. I personally recommend that all our students use Shopify just because it's so easy to use it's economical and it takes part of a trustworthy checkout for you. If you're using another platform like WooCommerce, get a second opinion about the trustworthiness of your checkout. Here are some things to especially check. Spelling and grammatical mistakes. You shouldn't have this anywhere on your store, especially not in the checkout. Design inconsistencies like Images not loading, unprofessional or inconsistent fonts, and unprofessional color design palettes should all be avoided. If you're not particularly aesthetically minded, get a second opinion on your checkout to make sure it's trustworthy and professional. Next, make sure you check different device and page size differences. Your cart should look great on all devices and page sizes. If you change the page size and the design breaks, it doesn't really inspire much confidence in your customers. Next, is your traffic source being majority mobile. Keep in mind that the traffic that you're sending to your product page and checkout is going to have an effect on your conversion rates. Say that your ads are just targeting people in the research phase of their buying process. For example, maybe one of your customers sees your ad while they're on the treadmill at the gym. They love the product, they add to cart, and they go to enter their credit card details but realize they left their wallet in the locker of the gym. So of course, they're not able to buy it right now, so they abandon cart and try and remind themselves to buy later. Of course, people forget, and this is why cart abandonment notifications really come in handy. If someone doesn't complete their cart, you can still capture their email address and send them a notification later to remind them to complete their cart. Clavio integrates really well with Shopify and allows you to send these email notifications when someone abandons their cart. You can also add these abandoned cart users to a remarketing campaign on Google and Facebook ads. In this way, you can serve these potential potential customers ads for the product that they were trying to check out with and remind them to complete their checkout process. A lot of stores successfully use SMS messaging to also buzz these customers to remind them to finish their checkout. That's it guys, there's a whole bag of strategies there for you to use if your store isn't getting sales. In this video, you're going to learn what to do if your Google Shopping campaigns aren't profitable. We'll cover three main areas that can cause this issue. Your Google Ads account, your product page conversion rate, and your business model. First, let's start with your Google Ads account. Basically, you're likely paying too much for your traffic and we need to reduce your cost. In our free Google Shopping course, we show you how to optimize your Google Shopping campaigns. I'll basically be summarizing this right Right now in this video. But if you haven't joined the course yet, go and check it out. It's 100% free with no sign up required. So here's what we do for the stores that we work with. One, we cap the budgets of our campaigns until they're profitable. We like to keep the budgets of our campaigns to $50 to $100 maximum until they're profitable. Then once we're confident in their profits, we'll start unleashing that budget to scale. If you don't yet know if your campaign is profitable, go watch our video on calculating the profitability for your store. I'll put a link to that video down below. I'll also put a link to a video showing you how to unhide our recommended columns in your Google Ads account. The next thing you'll want to do if you're not profitable is to strategically lower your bids. When a campaign isn't profitable, especially at the start, we like to focus on manual bidding, especially at the product level. We'll adjust our bids based on how profitable each product is in our Google Shopping campaign. For example, if a product has an average CPC of $1.50 and it's below our breakeven ROAS, we'll lower our bids. We'll then watch how it performs and see if it goes up above our break-even rowers, meaning it's now profitable. Of course, by doing this, you're going to reduce your position in the search results, meaning you'll get less clicks and less volume of conversions. But this can then mean that that product then becomes profitable 
even though you're getting a reduced volume of sales. To learn exactly how we do this process and to get our free template giving you the calculations for your bids, check out the link below. We have a full video guide taking you through everything we do there. The next thing we want to do is make sure that we're adding negative keywords into our campaign. Adding negative keywords helps us tell Google which search queries we don't want to show for. This helps us avoid paying for clicks for people that aren't going to convert on our store. Over time, as we add more targeted negative keywords, our campaign performance is going to improve. This means we'll spend less money on wasted clicks that are irrelevant and aren't aren't going to lead to a sale. We have a full guide on adding negative keywords. I'll leave a link to that down below. You also want to improve your product feed. This is huge. Google doesn't use keywords to figure out who to show your products to. Google looks at your product feed, looks at the product information and tries to guess what your products are and who to show them to. If you haven't yet optimized your feed, this is going to really hurt you. Google is going to start your campaign by showing to more general people. This means you'll waste more money as Google tries to figure out what your products are. Do yourself a favor and go through our videos on optimizing your product feed. I'll leave links to that down below. Lastly, for Google ads, we want to add bidding adjustments. This is one of the last things you should be doing to optimize your shopping campaign, but it's still very helpful. Bidding adjustments means telling Google you want to bid differently depending on what device the person is using, their location, and their time of day and day of the week. This allows you to get much more granular with your bidding for your campaign. But honestly, focus on the other optimizations first. They're going to have a bigger impact on your profitability. Too many people rush in and start making these sort of bidding adjustments when their campaign just doesn't have enough data. They're the main things to work on in your Google Ads account if you're not yet profitable. But even with a highly optimized Google Ads account, this means nothing if your store can't convert your customers. So let's look at that right now. Your conversion rate makes all the difference. You're paying for your traffic with Google Shopping. If you can convert more of this traffic without increasing your ad costs, you're going to make more profits. It's simple math. You should be constantly testing and improving your store and your product pages to convert more and more customers. This means making sure your store looks fantastic. It builds trust and solves the problems of your customers. A common mistake I see people making when they start with Google Shopping is they focus all their time on optimizing their account when their product pages look like this. A basic page with just a product title, an image, and a short description. Compare that to a product page like this. A product page that is engaging, clearly demonstrates how amazing this product is, explodes with social proof, and walks through all the features and benefits in great detail. This type of product page is called a long form product page and it converts way more than just a regular simple product page. When we set these up for our clients, we see them getting conversion rates in the three to 10% range. It's absolutely insane. Imagine increasing your conversion rate from 1% to even 3%. You're now converting three times as many customers for the same cost because obviously Obviously, your Google Ads cost doesn't increase, but the number of customers that you're converting does. Getting this right gives your campaigns rocket fuel and allows you to scale like crazy. Now, I have a full free course on how to set up these long form product pages. I'll leave a link to that down below, so go and check that out. Lastly, let's talk about your business model. Yes, you need to have an optimized account. Yes, you need to optimize your product pages for conversions, but if you don't have an optimized business model, it's going to be hard to scale. Let's start with the lack of margins. Your profitability depends on how much you're selling your products for and how much you need to pay to your supplier in cost of goods sold, as well as your expenses. If you sell a product for $50, but all your expenses and cost of goods sold equals $45, then you only have $5 in profit to spend on acquiring your customer. That's almost doomed to fail. Let's break down the math. Say you have an awesome conversion rate of 3%. That means on average, every 33 clicks, you get a sale. Well, with a maximum of $5 in profit per conversion, you can only spend a maximum of $5 every 33 clicks. This means 15 cents per click. If you've ever run any Google Shopping campaigns before, 
you'll know that 15 cents per click is almost unheard of unless you're in a very specific geographical area or have minimal competition. But if you increase your average order value to $100 and keep your expenses at $60 per order, then you now have $40 per conversion to acquire your customer. With the same conversion rate, you can now spend up to $1.21 per click, which is much more reasonable. So what do we learn here? Increase your margins by having higher product prices and lower product costs so you can increase the margin that you can spend to acquire customers and also the profits for yourself. How can you decrease your expenses? Negotiate better deals with suppliers. Cut unnecessary spending and systemize and improve your operations with automation. How can you increase your prices? It's easier said than done, but generally, if you increase your prices, you're generally going to see a decrease in your conversion rate. The key here is to test while at the same time increase the perceived value of your products. If you can show that your products and experience is way better than your competitors, you'll be able to charge more. This goes hand in hand with improving your conversion rates. And with many of the clients we work with, optimizing the product pricing is a whole exercise. I recommend starting by testing out changes to your pricing and see how the market reacts. The last thing I'll say about the business model is that many stores I've worked with weren't profitable because they were focusing on just generating profits from the first order from their customers. They would get their Google shopping traffic, generate sales, but barely break even on that first sale. But once they focused on getting repeat customers, that's when things drastically improved. You've already spent all this money on Google shopping to acquire the customer. If you can get them to come back and purchase again through remarketing, email marketing campaigns, the added cost is marginal compared to the increased revenue and increased profits you're going to generate. This is called focusing on the customer lifetime value. If you're building a brand and a long-term store, I recommend keeping this in mind as it supercharges your ads. If you know that over the next three to six months, you're going to make much more money from your customers, then you can be much more aggressive with your Google shopping campaigns because you know you're going to make that money back. The stores that win with digital marketing are those that can spend more to acquire customers. So that's what you need to do if you're not generating profits from your Google shopping campaigns. In this video, you're going to learn how we fix Google Merchant Center suspensions. This suspension means that Google doesn't think that your store is trustworthy for one reason or another. When you set up your Google Merchant Center account and you try to run Google Shopping ads, Google gives every single advertiser what's called a risk meter. If you have been suspended for misrepresentation of self or product, then Google has seen you as too risky. It's likely that a multitude of things resulted in your suspension. Often I'll look at stores and I'll tell someone the reason for their suspension and they'll say something like, but Sam, I saw that my competitor does this too and they're not suspended. Yes, it's because Google uses a risk meter and many things are going to add up to cause your suspension. For example, if you have a fresh domain name, a fresh non-branded email address, a new store, a new Google Ads account, Account, a new Google Merchant Center account and you make some mistakes, that's going to increase your risk meter and push you over the edge to become suspended. Most of the stores that we audit have a bunch of things causing their suspension, not one single thing. So why does Google suspend stores? Google doesn't want you running Google shopping ads if they think that you're not going to provide a good user experience to the people searching. This is something that we talk about in the compliance video of our free Google Shopping course. I recommend you check out that website and learning how to make your website fully compliant to avoid Google Merchant Center suspensions. I'll leave a link down below. So how do we fix our suspension? First, we need to find out the cause of the suspension. There's a big list of things you need to fix and check on your store and in your Google Merchant Center account. Once we fix these, we then request a review in Google Merchant Center. We then wait and see if we get approved. If not, we go deeper. We scour everything and see if we can fix the cause of the suspension and try again. So what do we need to check and fix? Okay, we'll go through the big list now. You'll find a link to download this checklist down below. First, your product feed. Fix any disapprovals, errors, and warnings. You see this in your Merchant Center dashboard when you go to products, diagnostics. This should be all clear. You shouldn't have any disapprovals, warnings, or errors. Go through our video on how to fix Google Merchant Center disapprovals 
I'll leave a link to that video down below. Next, we want to fix up our business settings. I also have a full video on how to add in your business settings. I'll leave a link to that down below. Let's go through all the things you need to check. First, make sure you add in your company information into the business settings. Make sure this information is accurate and matches the information that's elsewhere on the web. You want to make sure it's consistent with all your social media, your Google My Business account, and any other directory websites. Any inconsistencies here flag with Google as they think you're lying and misrepresenting your business. Make sure you use a real physical address and make sure your phone number is real and when someone calls, they don't get your mum. Make sure you use a company branded domain email address. This means if your store is coolcandles.com, make sure your email is hello at coolcandles.com and not some sort of Gmail address. Also make sure you have an actual branded domain name like coolcandles.com. Don't use a Shopify subdomain like coolcandles.myshopify.com. Also make sure that you claim and verify your domain in Google Merchant Center I have a full video showing you exactly how to do this really easily. I'll leave a link to that down below. Make sure you set the branding colors for your website and brand. And make sure you add both logo sizes in there too. Next, we have our tax settings in Google Merchant Center. Make sure your tax settings are properly set up for your selling location. This is especially true if you're selling to the US as the tax settings do get a bit complicated. I do have a full video on setting up your tax settings in Google Merchant Center. Go and watch that. I'll leave a link down below. Next, we have our shipping settings in Google Merchant Center. Same as your business information settings, make sure this matches what's actually on your store and how you actually ship your products. If Google spots any inconsistencies here, they're going to suspend you. So go through meticulously what's on your shipping page and how you actually charge for shipping on your checkout. I do have a video on showing you how to set up your shipping settings properly. I'll leave a link to that video down below. Okay, now that we've done our Google Merchant Center account, let's now look at our website. When we've fixed suspensions, there's almost always something that we had to fix on the website. Now, a lot of these things aren't going to be the only thing that causes your suspension, but all these things add up to a higher risk meter for your store. And one of these things could be the straw that broke the camel's back. First, check your website's page load speed. Use the Google Page Speeds Insight tool to see how Google grades your site in terms of speed and check multiple pages. I'll leave a link to this tool down below. Also make sure there are no broken links across your site. Make sure there are no English mistakes or grammatical issues across your store as well. Also make sure that you don't have any of this placeholder text or placeholder images. Copying the images that other stores are using can also attribute to your suspension. Google also isn't the biggest fan of dropshippers. If you're selling the same AliExpress product that 10 other dropshippers are also selling with the same title, description, and product images, you are going to have an increased risk of suspension. Google also likes reviews, so if you can get them on your store, that'll be better too. Plus, check the apps and plugins on your store. Only use the apps you actually need. We also like to check the reviews of all the apps we use to see if there are any people talking about getting suspended for using this app. We did have a case where we fixed a suspension where Google didn't like an app the store was using. Google had flagged this app with code as malicious software. We've also seen some apps like upsell apps cause suspensions too as they're not functioning correctly and the pricing is off at the checkout. So make sure that your website functions exactly as it should, including all the apps and plugins and checkout functionality. Next is a big one, your store's contact information. Google really cares about this because it's a huge marker of trust. Here's what I recommend you implement if you are serious about getting your suspension fixed. First, add your store's physical address listed on your website. Then also add in your customer service telephone number, a number that people like Google, could call and get a representative for your business. Make sure that you have a branded email address on your store and not a Gmail address. Then make sure to add the physical address, the phone number, and the email address on your footer and on your Contact Us page. You can also add them to the header of your store, but this is optional. On your Contact Us page, add a contact form. Also add in your business contact hours and an estimated wait time to get a reply from you. Then make sure the contact information on your footer, 
on your Contact Us page matches everything elsewhere on the web, including your Google Merchant Center account and your Google Ads account. Lastly, make sure you set up an SSL certificate on your store. If you're using Shopify, this is set up automatically when you set up your custom domain. Also make sure that the language of your website matches the language of the people that you're targeting. Now that that's done, let's now look at our legal pages. Make sure you have a terms and conditions page and a privacy policy page on your store. Next, make sure they're unique to your website. A lot of people just copy these from other stores and they don't change things like the brand name or the product categories. Make sure that these pages match what you're selling and what you're about. Make sure that the privacy policy page clearly explains how the user's browsing data may be used for your store. Then make sure to add links to these pages in your footer and in your checkout process. Next, let's look at the refunds and returns page. This is huge. Google wants to know what you will do when customers have problems with the products and your store. If you haven't set up a refunds and returns page, go and watch my full video on how to do this. I'll leave a link down below. Here's what your refunds and returns page needs. Clearly indicate the process for requesting a refund or returning an item. Do your customers call you? Do they email you? And how does the refund process work? Make sure you outline the different processes for different circumstances of refunds and returns. Do you offer exchanges? change of mind or faulty product returns and refunds? What about damaged products or the wrong product? What if the product never arrives or what if the customer cancels after ordering? Also include timeframes for each circumstance of refund or return. Clearly outline the time it takes to receive the refund. Also indicate the method of return of the refund. Is it with the same credit card the customer used to purchase? or is it with store credit? Just be clear. Also make it clear what the return period is. For how long after purchasing can a customer return their product? Also make sure the returns and refunds page is in the language of your target customers. Also very importantly, add a link to the returns and refunds page in your footer on your product pages and in your checkout. Next, we have our shipping page. This page tells our customers all about our shipping policies. Make sure it matches what's in your shipping settings in Google Merchant Center. Make sure it matches what the actual shipping process is. Outline the cost of shipping for each geographical location that you ship to. This can even be something like US shipping versus international shipping. That's okay. Also outline the time to ship to each location and the courier service used, like UPS, FedEx, or DHL. Make sure it's also clear how a customer can check the status of their order. Do they receive tracking information or do they have to contact customer service to find out? I also recommend adding a section for missing items. What if a customer receives their order but it's missing some products? What happens then? Once that's done, make sure to add a link in your footer on your product page and in your checkout process too. Next, we have our branding and homepage structure. This is important. Google wants to see that you're a trustworthy brand. Make sure you have an about us page that describes the mission and history of your store. This is something that gives transparency to your website. Make sure to add your about us page and your contact us page links to your header navigation. Also add them to your footer. Make sure to add links to your shipping policy page, your returns and refunds page, your terms and conditions page and your privacy policy page. Make sure to also include contact information in your footer. This includes your email, phone number and physical address. Next, let's take a look at our product pages. First and foremost, don't make misleading claims. I see a lot of suspended stores making bold claims about their products not backed up by evidence. Google hates this. Make sure your product information is relevant and up to date. This includes the title, description, and images. This also includes the availability of your products. Make sure that your product feed matches what's on your store, especially regarding what's in stock and not in stock. This is very important. Make sure your products aren't dangerous. Google is very careful with health-related products because they can make some bold claims and actually hurt the customer. Another thing to watch out is counterfeit products or products that infringe on trademarks. Also make sure that the product condition, whether it's new or used, is accurate and matches what's in your product feed. Also make sure that your pricing is accurate and matches what's in your feed and what will reflect on your checkout. Next, let's look at the checkout process. Throughout the checkout, you want to make sure that your legal pages are visible. I'm talking about linking your refunds and returns page, your shipping policy page, your terms and conditions page, 
and your privacy policy page. Make sure that the links to these pages are the same pages that we just set up before. Don't create double pages. Make sure that your contact information is visible throughout the checkout process. We recommend adding the big three, your physical address, a contact phone number, and a branded email address. Make sure that you also have multiple payment methods available and they're also shown in the footer of your store. Make sure the final pricing in the checkout matches what's in your product feed, what's on your product pages, and there are no hidden charges showing up here on the checkout. Also make sure that the shipping costs shown here on checkout match what's in your Google Merchant Center account and what's on your shipping policy page on your store. Next, we want to make sure that any Merchant Center promotions that you've set up in Google Merchant Center are accurate and reflected on your checkout. Finally, just double check that your SSL certificate is working on your checkout. Okay, let's now look at misleading information. Don't claim to be a certified reseller when you're not. Don't use trust stamps on your website without the proper affiliation. Don't make false statements or claims about who you are, your qualifications, or your products. Once you've fixed up these issues, we then do some final checks before requesting our review. Check that your Google Merchant Center account has a product feed submitted. Google requires that all accounts have a product feed with at least one product in order to review. Without the feed, the request to review button won't be available. So if you do get suspended, don't just delete the feed. Now, once you've fixed all the issues, it's now time to request a review. This is pretty easy. Just log into your Google Merchant Center account, look for the bar that shows the suspension and click request a review. It takes a few days, sometimes up to a week to be reviewed. If you request a review and you get denied, you're going to be put in a waiting period. Use this time to find the cause of your your suspension and fix it. Keep trying. Don't give up. You want to be sure that you fixed every potential cause of your suspension before requesting a review again. Too many denied requests can result in a permanent suspension, which you really don't want. Here are my final tips with dealing with a Google Merchant Center suspension. Don't try to outsmart Google, game the system, or get around Google's policies. You will lose. They'll catch you eventually, and you'll just get a permanent suspension, and you'll never be able to run ads ever again. Never try to create a second Google Merchant Center account. You will get suspended immediately as soon as you try to claim and verify the URL. This isn't Facebook. You can only have one Google Merchant Center account per domain. Don't give up. A lot of people try to fix their suspension and give up after their first attempt. A lot of suspensions that we've fixed Take multiple tries. Keep scouring Google's policies, scouring your store, trying to find the cause, fixing it, and then requesting a review. In this video, you're going to learn how to set up free Google Shopping ads. This allows you to set up your Google Shopping ads for free with the free listings to get clicks and sales for your e-commerce store. This is what they look like and you'll see them on the Google Shopping tab in the search results right here. These are the paid ads and these are the free ads. Here are the sales that these free ads generated for one of our clients. Not bad for free. Now I'm going to show you how to set up these free ads or free shopping listings in this video. Here are the steps. One, set up your Google Merchant Center account. Two, set up your product feed. And three, enable the free listings in Google Merchant Center and confirm that your ads are showing. The first thing you need to do is set up your Google Merchant Center account. This means going to merchants.google.com and creating your account and adding all the required settings. This means you'll need to claim and verify your website, adding your shipping settings and add in your returns and refund settings. It's a pretty quick process and I have videos here showing you how to do every single thing you need to do. All you need to do is go down below and click the link to go through our free Google Shopping course. We've created a whole set showing you how to create and set up your Google Merchant Center account. So go through this right now. After you set up your Google Merchant Center account, you'll then need to set up your product feed. This is our way of telling Google what our products are so they can show them in the search results. It's a feed that shows things such as your product title, your product images, your description, your pricing, and a few other things. Just like your Merchant Center account, you'll also need to set this up and we have videos taking you through the full process. There are three different ways that we show you how to set up your product feed. Of course, I'll add the link below to show you how to set up your feed. Go through that right now. Okay, finally, now that you've set up your Google Merchant Center account and your product feed, we're now ready to enable our free Google Shopping ads. This part is easy. Just go into Google Merchant Center, 
Go to growth on the left and go to manage programs. We can then see this card here that says free product listings. Click get started. It's then going to give you a checklist of the things you need to complete before we enable our free shopping ads. If you've gone through my other videos, most of these will be checked off and approved. If not, go through the videos, set everything up and come back and enable them. We'll then need to check this box showing that we've reviewed Google's policies and I do recommend that you read them. Then we click start final review. Once complete, you can then go to the overview and click activate. Awesome, let's now verify it's working. In Google Merchant Center, on the left-hand menu, go to products and then feeds. We can see here that it shows free listings for the feed. You can then click on the feed name and here you'll see that free listings are checked for this country, for this feed. Okay, we're now live. A question I often get asked is why would I ever pay for Google Shopping when I can just keep running my free listings instead? The answer is sales and scale. For our clients, we often see that free listings only make up one to 3% of the total sales that paid shopping brings in. So let's say you're making 2K per month in sales from your free Google Shopping listings. Well, if you then set up paid Google Shopping ads, you could be making 200 to $600,000 in sales. Of course, you will have to pay for the clicks, but with the right optimization and management, this can be extremely profitable for your business. Check out the rest of the lessons and videos in our free Google Shopping course to learn how to set up paid Google Shopping campaigns and how to optimize them for maximum profits. The next question I get is how do I get better results out of my free Google Shopping listings? There are two ways we can improve our results. Firstly, optimize your product feed. When running free listings, bidding is not a factor in the results. This means how relevant your products are has the biggest impact on the volume of clicks you're going to get. Optimize your product feed so Google better knows what your products are and who to show them to. Next, improve the conversion rate of your website. If you're getting all this free traffic, improving the conversion rate of your store is gonna convert more of this same traffic. You'll get more sales, but it will also impact all the other traffic you're getting outside of free listings. We have a full free course on how to improve the conversion rate of your product pages. I'll leave a link to that course down below. That's how you set up free Google Shopping or Google Shopping listings for your e-commerce store. Hey guys, Sam here. Thanks so much for making it this far through the free Google Shopping course. The key commerce team and I really hope you're finding it valuable and you're already getting results from your Google Shopping campaigns. We're constantly trying to improve the content we make for you guys and we welcome any feedback. We're constantly on the lookout for new ideas for courses, videos and guides so we can help you the best we can. So we want your feedback. Please leave a comment below. How was the course? If it was awesome and helpful, let us know below. And if you'd like us to teach any other content about e-commerce and digital marketing, let us know below as well. The better that we can understand what you're struggling with and what you really want to learn, the faster we can make amazing guides and tutorials. Also, if you found our course particularly helpful, please leave us a review. I'll leave some links below to a few platforms like Trustpilot and Facebook. It will take less than 10 seconds of your time. This helps us get our content in front of more and more people, which allows us to make better and better content for you guys. And if you have 60 seconds to spare, there's also a link to submit a video testimonial sharing your experience about the course. Finally, I want to thank each and every one of you for all the support you've given us. On our YouTube channel, in our emails, and some of of you have even come up to me in public to say hi. We thrive on creating the most helpful content and we love how positive and awesome you guys are. Again, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.